Good morning. Please be seated. Honourable members, the 13th sitting is now in session. We left off debating the motion of the Premier and Leader of Government Business on a motion dealing with the Constitutional Review and the Commission. The floor remains open for contributions. I have a list of members already indicated. We're going to go first with the Premier, followed by the Sorry, Deputy Speaker. We're going to start first with the Deputy Speaker, then we'll go to the member for the fourth, and then we'll go to the member for the second. So at this time, I recognize the Deputy Speaker and Territorial Member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I have to start off with a story. And this is a, a real story, not, not a makeup story, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I went home last night, I went home with nothing on my mind whatsoever after leaving here. But when I fell into my deep sleep, Mr. Speaker, I was awakened. Mr. Speaker, we had some history speaking here yesterday about the Constitution. And we had some heavy hitter names called, like Mr. Faulkner, Mr. Fonseca, and a few others. Last night, about around 4 o'clock, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I woke up because I couldn't sleep. And this is a true story. I couldn't sleep, Mr. Speaker. If you ask me what Mr. Faulkner looked like and what Mr. Fonseca looked like, I could tell you because I saw them as statues. But they were in my sleep last night. And this is, this is a real story. They were in my head last night, Mr. Speaker, speaking to me on this Constitution talking to me about things that we here are talking about now, you know, about history, from whence they came, how they start. Mr. Speaker, I said here yesterday, I took a lot of notes from a lot of the members. And all those notes came in my head last night during, during my sleep, because everybody was speaking and everybody was saying, talk about history, where we were and how we got there. But Mr. Speaker, nobody has not said where we're going. And that's what they did tell me in my sleep last night. We have to stop looking back and start looking forward. They have set a road for us and we need to pick up and go. We are the middle ground. We are the middle ground for what we want to transpire. But they have some young people after us who are official leaders. And that's what we have to start focusing on, Mr. Speaker. The Constitution has been a lot of information. I look at the Constitution as a double-edged sword. It's how you interpret the Constitution and how you use it. It works for you. And we have a governor who does use the Constitution to his advantage. And that's why there's some stuff in the Constitution that we need to look at seriously and change, Mr. Speaker. For example, Section 103, the withdrawal of money from the consolidated funds. That needs to be taken away from the Constitution. Because, Mr. Speaker, we cannot have people just moving funds to where they want to see it, but not where the people of the Virgin Islands want to see it. That's something that's very serious that we need to look at. We also have to look at Section 81, the governor's resolve power. Those powers should be in the hands of a Virgin Islander, of we, the people, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we talk about, we also talk about the, 
I must say the honorable member, I, I want to refer to what the honorable member said. Uh, honorable Calvin Malone mentioned that. I have to refer to my notes, Mr. Speaker. Permission granted. Where he said, confidence of our, confidence of our people, lack of confidence in ourselves. Mr. Speaker, that's a serious statement. And again, in my, in my sleep, that's the next thing they say to me. We have to have confidence in ourselves and respect each other. Our problem that we have is that we don't respect each other. We don't respect one another. So when it is we have people trying to make laws and try to put things in place, they have some same people on the back end criticizing them. If we don't work together, we can always be where we are today, no matter what changes and amendments we made in the Constitution. Because the Constitution is the people. Is what the Constitution is. It's the people, Mr. Speaker. Do we have confidence in ourselves? There's a question we have to ask each other. Do we have confidence in ourselves? Do we have confidence in our people? And that's what we have to make sure we do with this Constitution. We have, the, we have confidence in each other. Cannot look across the aisle and criticize when the member of the fourth says something, we can't criticize him. We have to listen to each other because all of us come here with one intention. That's to better the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, my honorable member for the third, honorable Fraser, also made some statements. He said, even if you look as you should read the Constitution, it's hard to understand. Because when you read one page up on top, you have to go down to the bottom and come back up to the left to try to understand what it is saying. So it's harder for people to understand what the Constitution is saying. So it's difficult for a young person to understand the Constitution. I myself had issues trying to understand the Constitution. Because when you read one part, you think you have it, and you go on the other page, and the next page, you're contradicting yourself. Mr. Speaker, he also said, think outside the box. And that's something we need to do. Because that's what our forefathers did. They thought outside the box when they start. That's why they could have done what they have done where we are today. Because they think outside the box. And that's what we need, to, we need to do. Think outside the box. Are we happy with the definition of virgin, virgin islanders? Are we happy with it? Things like that we have to start asking ourselves. Those are questions we need to ask ourselves. We need to look at the Constitution and pick out the things that we know that we could turn around and make better. You know why we can make it better? Because we know our history. Only we know our history. No governor cannot come here and tell us from whence we came. He does not. Mr. Speaker, and with that note, I want to quote something that my daughter, Bria Smith, said that we have to realize. It's a true fact. She said, tell me where you're going if you don't know where you're from. That's a true statement, and a real statement. Because if you don't know, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you're from. And that's the history we had yesterday. That's the history we were taught yesterday. Listening to the House yesterday, we got history. But Mr. Speaker, but we have a lot of work to do still. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution of the Virgin Islands is something that it should be in every household. Every household, Mr. Speaker. It should be like your phone book. Take it up and you make a dial. You want to find a number, you dial it, you call it, you speak. That's when things we talking, beginning the Constitution into the homes, into the people's lives. 
we have to make it more accessible for the people. It has to be in the schools, starting from stage one. Just show pictures or something, but it has to be in the schools. But Mr. Speaker, we also have to create a constitutional desk. Even if we cannot do an office, we need to do a constitutional desk where somebody there sitting on getting this information out daily in the media, pictures, whatever, getting it out there to the public. The more you see it, the more you'll know about it and the more you'll understand it. Mr. Speaker, we are not in a fight with the UK. We are not in a fight. We are in a fight to make our country stronger, better, self-governed. Mr. Speaker, the youth are the one that we have to focus on in these times. The young people are the ones that we need to focus on now. We are not going to be here in the next 10 years, 15 years. Some of us have done gone. And Honorable Fraser say that also. We might be here living, but we mightn't be in here. Mr. Speaker, I'm not a long winder in terms of speaking, but man, this constitution is something that this is not a one day, a two day, a three day, a four day, something that we have to work on this. This is an every day something that we need to be in. I look at this constitution as something that, like I said, depends on how you use it, it's enslaving ourselves. It's enslaving us. Part of this constitution is enslaving us. It's like saying, you put Massa, you remember, you remember Massa was the, the black slave who today looking at the other slave. And that's how we're operating through this constitution because when we put Let's say we put Mr. Raymond in charge or something. I can't Mr. Raymond don't like Mr. Fraser. He's going to keep Mr. Fraser down. This is how this is being operated. This is how it's being used against us. It's the system. And I keep on saying it. It's the system. We have a problem with the system. We need to fix it. And who's going to fix it? Trust me. Every the young people is a key to this. The young people is the key for us to get this hair fixed, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have, we have some problems. You start about young people. I also look at a good example. We have people who just live in here for years, belong to us. Father who just, a father here, mother from somewhere else, a child born here. And that child still don't have a home here. We have to recognize, we have to find a common ground to get this fixed too. Those are the future. These young people who this we have in the barn, they only know hair. The grandparents born here, live here, the children born here, they only born here. Then sometimes we need to look at also. We have to be careful what we're doing. We have to keep Virgin Island alive. Mr. Speaker. We have a lot of members spoke about different sections of the country. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go all over but what is was sp spoken already because it's there. But what I want to focus on, Mr. Speaker, is our youth, Mr. Speaker. We are always talking about empowering our youth, Mr. Speaker. If we do not simplify the Constitution that the common people could understand it, we are not getting any place. We have to find a way that we could simplify the Constitution, that we could read it and understand it. The Constitution has a lot of stuff in it. We need to find somehow, some way to simplify it that we could understand it, or that a common person could understand it. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one of the things I also realize in the Constitution with the, with the, with the National Security Council. There's only the police, I think the police commissioner, the AG, the premier, and the deputy premier. 
But Mr. Speaker, I'm kind of confused because immigration and custom plays a very integral part in our security of the Virgin Islands. So those are the things that we need to look at. How can we integrate those things that we could protect our border even more? Because immigration and custom is our border control. The police is internal. So these are the things that we need to start focusing on when we look at this constitution, Mr. Speaker. And we also have to focus on our youth parliament, Mr. Speaker. Sometime back we had a session at the youth parliament where we had a young lady by the name of Miss, I don't want to get confused. Um, let's go find through my notes, Mr. Speaker. Ms. Joan Roberts, she gave a stellar of a presentation and she break it down, Mr. Speaker. She break it down so that everybody who was there could understand the Constitution. Those are the kind of things that we need to see happening. That's when the Constitution is going to work. The Constitution cannot work sitting on a table. It cannot work just being put on a table and going cobweb. They have to be taught in school. They have to be out there, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, like I said, the young people must play a vital part in this constitutional review. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to close now, but I'm going to close and leave some words with you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are embarking on a historical, a historic constitution review. This time, this time so, we have to get the roadmap towards being self-reliance correct, Mr. Speaker. This constitution that we are working to upgrade may not be the one that gets us there, but this one has to be the one that will take us there, Mr. Speaker. Who are the person that would be around during the next constitution review after this? The person that we need to get more involved now, <coughs> sir, now, Mr. Speaker, are the youth. Those are the ones that we need to get involved, Mr. Speaker. The youth are the ones we need to get involved. Hence, I propose <coughs> that in addition to what we, are, we have already, we approve a youth subcommittee with representatives from all main islands, Anigada, Jasmine Dyke, Virgin Garda, and Tatola. This youth subcommittee must report their views and findings from among the youths to the main <coughs> committee for consideration with all the other findings as part of this review exercise. After all, the con this constitutional review as well as the next, will have the greatest impact of our lives on the lives of our present youth. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to repeat that. After all, this constitution review, as well as the next, will have the greatest impact on the lives of our present youth. Mr. Speaker, therefore, we need to give them a greater role to play in from now. I strongly recommend this as a course of action to be taken now during this exercise. If we are serious about you, <clears throat> if we are serious about our young people, which I know this government is, then we will get this done. They are the men and women of tomorrow. So let them help shape their tomorrows from today with God's help and guidance they will do a terrific job. Mr. Speaker, I close with that. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Speaker and Territorial Member for his contributions. At this time, I recognize the member for the 4th District, the Honorable Mark H. Vanterpool.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, for allowing me the privilege and uh, Mr. Speaker, the opportunity to be on the floor before I get into the debate here a little bit. Allow me to just let the people there outside there know that I am here and I'm not in quarantine. There's a rumor, as the Premier said about himself, that it's going around about me being in quarantine because I was on Just Van Dyke or something. A lovely, a lovely <laughs> island that I love so much, but just wanted to know that I'm here. I have not been quarantined. In fact, I took the Minister of Health's advice and I tried to stay at home as much as possible. My office is operating. I have a secretary there in my office, but I only go in now and again. Um, uh, the Minister of uh, Health advised me that, what do you call that, I'm in that um, vulnerable, vulnerable category, considering my age. So he doesn't have to remind me. But for my good people out there, you know I'm here strong and healthy. Thank the Lord for that. And while I say it, though, I just want to make sure we don't uh, stigmatize anyone who is in quarantine. It's for good reason, always. And let's encourage us to keep working as we sit together to fight this COVID-19. Um, so with that cleared from the air, Mr. Speaker, I am somewhat nostalgic, like the member for the third <coughs> and others, to know that this is definitely perhaps my last opportunity in the House of Assembly to address a matter of such importance to the territory of the Virgin Islands. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I want to really take my time and give my views on the matter, and hopefully my views will represent a good cross-section of the territory, although in these kind of discussions, we know everyone don't agree on everything. But like the last speaker said, we must agree to disagree on some of those things. But let us work together for the upliftment of the territory of the Virgin Islands. From stage to stage, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have to commend the Premier for his presentation yesterday morning to set the stage, followed by the senior member who has been involved in the last constitutional review, and also the good Minister of Health who was, who was on that committee at the time, on that commission. I tried to learn from these good gentlemen, and I think their presentations on such an important matter yesterday were very pertinent as well as all the other presentations. It shows me, Mr. Speaker, that as the entire House, as all members sitting in the House, have taken this matter very seriously and have made their presentations very well, uh, hoping to set the stage for the broader discussion in the community. For as the Minister of Health said yesterday, uh, this is a matter for the people of the territory. And while we may give our own views, our own opinions, while we may instigate and encourage discussion and debate on the matter, um, it is not something to be taken lightly, and we must hear from the people as to what they want for the territory of the Virgin Islands. Even if you differ from each other, it is useful to hear from those people. And uh, the Minister of Health, sent out something I saw yesterday, I don't know, it was probably around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I was surprised in the evening when he read out all those responses from people out there who are listening and who are concerned about the territory of the Virgin Islands. So I am, I am pleased that people are engaged because this is very important, Mr. Speaker.
Mr. Speaker, I will do my best not to get too emotional or too um, passionate, like the Premier said yesterday, but some of it may come out every now and again because it's a passionate subject. It's about the people of the Virgin Islands. But I must, as we said, as some speakers said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I must go back a little in time before I come forward, or before we can go forward. I don't recall what year it was. It could have been 2002 or somewhere there, Mr. Speaker, when, because through the privilege of the House of Assembly, we were afforded, at the time it was Honorable Christopher, uh, uh, Alvin Christopher and myself, and I think others were on a similar trip to Africa at the time and different places. However, Honorable Christopher and I were privileged to be, host, to be guests of the House of Parliament in Ghana, AG, I think in 2002. And it was a very enlightening trip for me. Um, I wouldn't say I was a young, the youngest man then, but I was younger. And it was an enlightening trip for me, Mr. Speaker. Because I was, I considered myself in, in school a small, a little bit of a scholar of history, especially history of African slavery, of slavery. And we had read all these books. We had good teachers. My last very good teacher on, in history was, and I never forget him in, in his passionate way of teaching us about it, Mr. Alfred Christopher who we all know, a good friend of us. But he spoke to our class um, on the history, what do we call it, the, the triangle or something that we learned about. And he, he taught us about when the slaves were caught in Africa, put in the prisons near the near the, uh, the ports and then shipped out, packed like sardines on ships on the Atlantic um, voyage. And Mr. Speaker, those classes were very emotional because he was very graphic in how he described and how we read the books about how our ancestors were treated in slavery, in, in, in those voyages across the Atlantic. Many, many of us, Mr. Speaker, shed tears in those classes. And sometimes we don't like to talk about it, Mr. Speaker, but we have to remember <clears throat> our history. We don't need to dwell on it, but we have to remember it. And Mr. Speaker, we shed tears in class, almost all of us in those classes, in those afternoons when we met for history class. But it became real to me, Mr. Speaker, when I went to Ghana. Besides the fact that, I don't know why, but the Ghanaians, and that's why I believe we, we are connected in history to that part of the world. Because I was surprised when I was invited for lunch that they cooked, we learned from them probably, they cook a fish soup just like we do. Then when they invited me for snapper, well I'd never seen a snapper so big in my life, but they had it on a big platter. And the snapper tasted just like our cooking. I don't remember if they had dumpling and corn, corn meal there, but 
I, I brought it up because the culture was similar to what we have here. And it's obvious that it came down from those generations and from our ancestors. Obvious. But what struck me more than anything else, Mr. Speaker, was that they asked us and invited us to visit the dungeons where the slaves were kept until the ships come to pick them up for many months. I don't know if it was my imagination, Mr. Speaker. Um, Honorable Christopher and I went down into the dungeons down there where you could see the governors or whatever they were on top. The governors lived on top over the dungeons and the, the guards were, were set to keep an eye on the slaves who were down there packed like sardines. And the description we got from the tour guide was that you didn't have many places to go aside, as we say. So the aside was right there. I don't know if it's my imagination or what, Mr. Speaker, but I think the stench was still there. And it, it was a sudden pang on my stomach and my heart and my, and my emotions. And while we are men, sometimes when we try to pray brave and stand up, there's nothing stopped us from shedding tears at that, in, that, in those dungeons. Nothing stopped us. To see that our forefathers and ancestors were kept in those conditions. Some people would not like us to talk about it anymore or remember it, but we must remember our past. Mr. Speaker, and you know, Mr. Speaker, and I'm raising these points because I'm going to come back to them later in terms of what we're experiencing now. But you know, Mr. Speaker, we, get, we probably got angry at the Europeans or whomever, but it was our own people, our own ancestors who sold out our ancestors, who put them in those prisons, Mr. Speaker. I learned that it wasn't like a British army or a European army would go into uh, Sierra Leone or into uh, Ghana and round up people and they were being negotiated with our own people to have these slaves traded for whether ammunition or whatever else they may have traded for. And our own people deliver them to the slave masters. It's a lesson in that, Mr. Speaker, in terms of some of our mentality that may still exist today. In a different way, but still in the same way, if I may be so presumptuous to sound ambiguous, Mr. Speaker. I couldn't understand why they were explaining to me that in those dungeons, which was in the place where the governor lived or presided over on those portions in Ghana that you had someone appointed to oversee that, those conditions. And those conditions really existed. And they existed, Mr. Speaker, not because the Europeans were bad people or anything like that. They existed because of economic reasons. The West needed to be cultivated and developed and plundered for economic reasons to the Europeans and they needed labor that could handle that kind of work 
in this part of the world, similar to the conditions were that were in Africa, and therefore people were herded up like sheep and sheep and goats and animals and whatever it might have been, and were brought over to the Caribbean to be our ancestors, and that's who we are now. So I want us to remember where we came from. Mr. Speaker, no matter along the way, Mr. Speaker, that when our ancestors were back there, because of the temperature and the conditions that they were born with this kind of pigmentation, and the today Europeans or the today Americans, Caucasian, Americans or Europeans, if they were born in those conditions back there, meaning the temperature and the, and, and the, the climate back there, they would have been of the same pigmentation. Nothing different inside here. Nothing different with the color of our blood. All of our blood the same color. Nothing different to those things. But the conditions that we were born in gave us this color. But I wanted to say that nothing different because during that la the last 400 years or so that some of us were mixed and got a little different, a little higher color, whatever we call it, from others. And although it is not so, so much anymore, in the past 50, 60 years or so in the, in, in the colonies in the Caribbean, if your color were a little higher, than another you thought you were more important. I know, Mr. Speaker. I have, a, I have some background in that, in my family. A lot of it had to do because of the cross pigmentation as a result of the house slaves and all those things like that. I mean, know the history of that. I wouldn't go into that too much. I'll go into the talk. But, Mr. Speaker, it lends to some of what I have to say today about some people be believing that they are more important than others and undermining each other in favor of massa. That's how it was on the slave plantations. And there is still some essence of that today. So, Mr. Speaker, we must remember from whence we came. And, Mr. Speaker, the difficulty that we experience today also, in the same vein, in one vein, we round up and capture each other and deliver each other today the master. In the second vein, because of cross, I said pigmentation, but I can, I can say fertilization too, right? I'm trying to keep my words well rounded and parliamentarian there, Mr. Speaker, because I know you will reprimand me. But I think I'm doing well so far. Pigmentation and fertilization. Because of cross pigmentation and fertilization, that's number two, Number two, strike against us, Mr. Speaker. We believe that we are special and different. Mr. Speaker. And the third one, Mr. Speaker, is what do we call it? They said we have suffered as a people because there have been persons who have been able to make us be divided so that we can be conquered divide and conquer. 
We've heard that terminology so many times, Mr. Speaker. So we as a people, we have a problem. But Mr. Speaker, the solution to a problem But, Mr. Speaker, the problem is not the problem. The solution to the problem is what we have to resolve. We have to find a solution to the problem. And the important thing in reaching to that point of solving the problem, Mr. Speaker, is recognition of the problem. So we are at a point in the Virgin Islands where we must realize and remember that we have given up ourselves to ourselves or to others, Mr. Speaker. That we have been fooled to believe that one is better than the other, Mr. Speaker. And thirdly, Mr. Speaker, we have been taught to be divided among ourselves so that others can conquer us. Mr. Speaker, so the person who was living in the house with the master, having a little privilege of being quietly in their own area and getting their own little breakfast and so on, would tell the master what the field slaves are planning and what they're doing. And therefore, they were divided like that to be conquered. I, Mr. Speaker, I, I have no, I'm not, I have no anti, I, I have no racial, no racism in my bones. I have friends from all categories of life and all races, from all over the world. I had a gentleman who used to stay at my house whenever he came from Florida. I could call his name, he's my very special friend. He sets up good basketball games for me and so on when I go to Miami. His name was... Salvatore Valenziano. He had some kind of background. He's, he, he was, he was my, my, my two sons call him their white uncle. Sal, he calls anytime. His son is getting married next year. Hopefully this COVID thing is over. I have to be in, which is that a Jupiter somewhere in Florida? Not Jupiter, but somewhere else. To his wedding. He called me up and said there's a good basketball game between the, the, the um, Miami Heat and some of the team. And he has some special tickets, and I go. That's my, that's my kid's white uncle because he lived in my house. He sleeps in my house. I don't have any racism in me. But it doesn't mean that I forget the history of the people of the Caribbean and the Virgin Islands. And one last strike we have, Mr. Speaker, the fourth strike, is that we are so caught up. We are so caught up in our own little islands that we divide ourselves from the other islands of the Caribbean. We are divided. I had, I had a premier doing his best to start connecting and start working with premiers and prime ministers of the other Caribbean islands and working together for one Caribbean. But yet each island, not, it's not just the Virgin Islands, but yet each island believes that they are more important than the other island and that their people are more important than the other people of the other island. I'm not just talking about Virgin Islanders, I'm talking about all the islands of the Caribbean. I went to Barbados, I, just, I lived there for two years. Mr. Speaker, I lived there for two years, working for Barclays Bank International. I thought I was, a, as we said, bigger. I went there to be trained to be a, um, a, a senior person in the bank. Hopefully come back and be the vice president or the president of the bank here. I went through my training. But at every step of the way, they would tell me, even I walk in the, in the, room, in the halls with my, my co-workers, very wonderful people, the Barbadians, and they're my friends, and I, in fact, some of them feel like family as we lived there together for two years. But they remind me every time, every step of the way, man, you are smaller than man, man. They gave me the, they gave me the perception that I am a small island, and I must think small. That's how it is in a lot of the Caribbean islands among us. And we here have a similar attitude. You're from the island. Well, I, I'm speaking to them, Mr. Speaker, because I got to tell you, 
I am going to be here today on this constitution to represent the Iron Man. Because I'm the only one in here, I think, who is not born in the BBI. So I'm going to represent the island people, which is a crazy concept, but it is there. And that's, it. that's our history. But Mr. Speaker, we cannot go forward as a people in the Caribbean or in the Virgin Islands or anywhere if we are so divided among ourselves, Mr. Speaker. And I'm going to come back to that. The division of ourselves as, as a people. And yes, I don't have any problems with us because, in fact, I support the idea, and I'll come to that also, that indigenous people of any country need to be protected, and need to be um, specially guarded and taken care of. But we we got to be careful that it doesn't reach to the extent where we divide ourselves so much that we can't live among each other. Because ultimately we have no choice but to live among each other. But how we live among each other, how we love each other, how we operate with each other, how we speak to each other, how we deliberate among each other, how we, how we debate among each other, how we respect each other as a people is important. And I use the word as a people not loosely because we are a people. We might be a people, some indigenous, some not indigenous, some just becoming belongers, some whatever, some just being born, but we are still a people. A people in the constitutional term here, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm going to interpret it the way I see it. A people in the terms of the constitution here are the people of the Virgin Islands who are protected by the constitution of the Virgin Islands. A people. That's us. All encompassing. Yes, it's important to protect the first people of the Virgin Islands, which are the indigenous people. But there are some other people who came along later who must be protected under the constitution and have a human right to be protected under the constitution. A people. That's who we are. We are a people, Mr. Speaker. A people. All of us. We live here, we work here, we go to church together, we go to school together, we, 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 we work together, we live together. Mr. Speaker. We are a people. And I will come to that. Whereas the people of the territory of the Virgin Islands, I'll come back to that. But I wanted to establish, Mr. Speaker, those four dividing pointers that make us and put us and keep us and are suppressing us in many ways where we are today. Those four that I, I mentioned earlier. And I will summarize them at the end because I want us to remember them. Because you must remember where we came from and where we're going because where we came from has some bearing on where we are and has some bearing on where we are going. If we don't think and change our mentality, we won't get any further. Mr. Speaker. So let me calm down, Mr. Speaker, and become a little more professorial now. If I move from history to definitions. Mr. Speaker, I heard in the debate yesterday and all through the Constitution the two words that I'm going to ask in my own mind. I'm not even going to go to, I, I, I went to definitions and went to Google and went to different things. And there's there, some I might refer to in, the, in those definitions. What, 
Mr. Speaker, what is the colonization? This is a terminology that we hear all the time. I think Premier went to the, a big term of the United Nations Conference on the Decolonization of the Territories. And you know who normally is at that, at that at conference too, I think? Correct me if I'm wrong, in Puerto Rico. They're a colony of the United States. The U.S. Virgin Islands. Some of the other Guam and all those. So it's not just British territories or European territories. The D, let me say slowly, the D, D-E, I swear I said, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be a little professorial for a minute. Try to be at least. The D-E, decolonization. Um, the Deputy Speaker wanted us to break these things down for the young people. So bear with me. D means coming from. Am I right, A.G.? You're not an English scholar, but you're a legal scholar. Removing. D, movement from, coming from. The decolonization. And there's a, there's a commission set up by the United Nations to make sure that countries are decolonized. No. If you have to de something, you've got to find out what the something is, or was, or should be was. So if you're going to D, you have to find out what you're, what you say is you're moving from, right? Taken away from. Colonization is the word, Mr. Speaker, that I need us to focus on. Colonization. It seems, Mr. Speaker, the years have passed so long, and we have gotten so caught up in the nice things that everybody's talking about these days, about what they call, I think, partnership. Uh, what do you call it? Um, modern partnership. What is it? Modern partnership or modern colonization? I, I mix up with the words now. Modern partnerships, and come to that because a partnership is a partnership. Partners have to agree. Partners can be one more dominant than the other. That's what partnership is. Most partnerships fail. Most business partnerships fail. Because one always wants to be more dominant than the other. And they can't agree. So I don't know what it is we're trying to say about modern partnership. When there's some other things which are making it not a modern partnership. Which are prevailing, Mr. Speaker. But decolonization means that there was something called colonization at some point in our history. And who knows, the definition in terms of where we are right now may still entitle us to be a colony. We go about bragging, but yeah, we're not a colony anymore. We're now a territory of the Virgin Islands. Stop it. Mr. Speaker, I said stop it. We are a colony of the United Kingdom. These nice fancy terms that have given us be a territory, you're no, you're no longer going to have a chief minister, you have no premier, and whatever you're going to have in the, the definition of these things. My name is Mr. Speaker, who are we answering to? Who does our budget have to go to still for approval? Approval to the partnership? I, gotta, I have to, Mr. Speech, Mr. Speaker, I have to couch this again because people misinterpret these things when you start talking about them. There's not a bone in me, Mr. Speaker, that is anti-British. No, I'm not, and I have no, nothing against the British because they have, they have done a lot of things. They have done wrong things in the past. Hopefully they are repenting and will do right things in the present and the future. Because anyone who enslaved anyone, the way we were enslaved in the past, 
can be forgiven, but, but, but it must not be forgotten. Let me say that again, Mr. Speaker. Anyone who committed those acts in the past, Europe, United States of America, all over the world, who have committed slavery in the past, can be forgiven, but must not be forgotten. We are our people, Mr. Speaker, that we have to teach our young people where our history came from and where we want to go. And that is the basis, Mr. Speaker, that I will be putting forward today that we cannot continue to have a slavery mentality where we don't believe that we can govern ourselves. That is a slavery mentality. Emancipate yourself, my people of the Virgin Islands. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery, as Brother Bob Marley would say. Let's free your minds of this mentality that we don't believe that we can control our own destiny, that we are less than anybody else, that we, are, that, that we don't have the, the mental capacity, the brain. This brain in here in Virgin Islanders, we have that mentality that is not as good a brain as the United Kingdom people or European people. Let's get rid of that mentality. We have the same brain. Mr. Speaker, it is just how we exercise it is what's important. Very crucial in our thinking, Mr. Speaker, going forward with this constitutional review. Very crucial. And Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate because I, I hope that as uh, the, the Deputy Speaker uh, suggested and, and I hope that we can bring along our young people to understand that they can take matters in their own hands and lead their country. Mr. Speaker, we have to let them know that. Mr. Speaker, we have to let them know that there is nothing more in Bill Gates' head than their head. Nothing more in, what's the man name there for um, Facebook, um, Zuckerberg or whatever his name is. He, has, he doesn't have anything better than you. There's nothing more. We just have to use our brain, use our innovations, use our thinking, use our education, use whatever is at our disposal. And the good thing, Mr. Speaker, is that everything that is at their disposal now is almost at our disposal through social media and through the internet. Google, bloop, bloop. I, I couldn't even read all the things on decolonization I went to research on in Google the um, uh, last couple of weeks, last couple of days, Mr. Speaker. Decolonization. Mr. Speaker. So, so the young people are going to go here, and they can do it too. What is the meaning of decolonization? A couple, there's a lot of it. Google. The action or process of a state withdrawing from a former colony, leaving it independent. What do I mean by decolonization, people would ask? It is the undoing, the undoing of colonialism. Mr. Speaker, it looks like the undoing of colonialism have been put on hold in some places. The undoing, undoing, write it down. Do we have some colonialism here in the Virgin Islands that needs undoing? Undoing. The undoing of colonialism. The latter being the process whereby a nation establishes and maintains its domination 
on overseas territories. You understand what I'm talking about, Mr. Speaker? Le I read it again. Decolonization is the undoing of colonialism. Mr. Speaker, colonialism of many years, many years, where the big nations, we all know it, we don't have to hide from it. The big countries came to the small territories like ourselves and colonized us, ruled over us, didn't allow us to have a say. The, 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 the Premier spoke it yesterday. There were times in our history here when you couldn't vote, you couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't own land, you couldn't do a lot of things. And in order to vote or run for office, in order to vote or run for office, you had to own a certain amount of land and you had to be a certain color and from a certain place and you could not run for office as a people in your own territory. A people. That won't come up again. You couldn't. The Premier Bill looked yesterday, he read all the, the acts and when this federation agreed on that and when the parliament passed that and when it all happened, our people could not vote in their own country until there were no more use to the bigger countries. And although there were no more use and are still no more use in certain senses, Mr. Speaker, we are still not decolonized. And there's a word in there, Mr. Speaker, that I want us to read. The latter, decolonization is the undoing of colonialism. The latter, the latter meaning the word colonialism, being the process whereby a nation establishes, put down on you, hold you down, keep you down, establish on you, establishes and maintains. They put it on you, bam, and they hold you down there on the repeat. They ain't gonna let you go. Don't fool yourself, but this, they call it a, partner, a, a, a partnership, establishes and maintains dominance. That's the word in here. I, mean, I didn't just say it. Establish and maintains its domination on overseas territories. Did you hear something in there? Did you? Mr. Speaker, are you relating anything there to, to, to the Virgin Islands and its constitution? Honorable Fraser points out. Honorable Premier yesterday, chapter 3, Domination established and being maintained. And every time you go to get some upgrade, you got to go bow down before somebody to get, to get a will for your own people. Every time, imagine, you know, it's, it's so, it's so, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's so funny. You know what we have to do? We have to go and get the people's will and then go to UK and bow down before our colonial masters and beg them. We call it, it's not even an insurance parliament, it's a what? An order, an order in council. Mr. Speaker, we have to go and get an order in council to so be able to get our own constitution, to be able to govern ourselves, we have to go and beg somebody to give us permission to, be, to govern ourselves. Something isn't inherently wrong in that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, hundreds of years later that we thought colonization was over, we still have to go to the colony master to beg him to give us, to allow us to rule ourselves and have our own will. And you are telling me that you are a modern nation and you are saying to me at the United Nations which is seeking to decolonize all territories that you are telling me that I have to still come before you, bow down and beg, well give me this part here. I, okay, I know I can't get a part there. I know you don't need me to do that. So I ain't going to ask you for that. But let me do this one over here for now. Next 10 years I'll come back and beg it. Mr. Speaker, that is the fact. That is where we are. You hear the premier and everybody dance around certain little things. Because we know we can't beg for this and we can't beg for that because they ain't give it to you. 
There was something I raised the other day, and they say, ah, team makes me raise that because bomb. You don't have it, but you know they ain't give it to you. Mr. Speaker, that is colonization at its best. Can you imagine that you are going, your people say you want to be to do certain things in certain ways? You could give it to Bermuda for whatever reason because maybe I don't know more Bermudians are a certain type and other, but, but you can tell them they can run their civil service on their own through an elected body who may appoint a cabinet secretary to run the civil service, but in the Virgin Islands, no, 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 you can't have that, you can't have that. <laughs> and today, the Cayman Islands can't have this and can't have that, and must have this and must have that, whether it's their will or not. Mr. Speaker, colonization at its best. In the 21st century, in a world that is proposing and, 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 and propagating and, and, and all the peace and promising that democracy must reign, but the people of a democratic community can't have their own rules and their own laws and their own, their, their, their own will, their own will to govern themselves. But sadly enough, Mr. Speaker, it is propagated like that because some of our own people and it's their will. Some of our own people don't believe that we can govern ourselves. I don't know. I, I try keep trying to remember to, to recognize why is it that we believe we can't do it? I, I, have, I have baffled over that for many years, Mr. Speaker. I baffled over it. I went and, with my fastness, in 2013, I think it was, Honorable Leader Opposition. And I thought that Emmanuel was the place where I would sit, where in 1834, the Declaration of Slavery, abolishment of slavery was announced. 200 and, I don't know how much it was that day when I spoke, 275 years later or so. I went my fastness to say that we need to, we need to be believing ourselves that we can run our own country and we can manage ourselves. I went my fastness. I was surprised the next day I get so much call and so much cost. Cuts out. That's a, a loud, right? Someone cuts out. Mr. Speaker, I went my shelf for a little while. I, I, I'm barely coming out now. Because our people believe that we can't determine and manage ourselves. This word independence have a stigma and have, have some kind of stain on it that everybody gets afraid. Ah! Independence, boy? What? You're going to put us in, in bondage? You're going to put us. And in here we are dodging around it again. <laughs> we talk about all kinds of things, self-determination. Uh, <laughs> it's just because independence is no longer what people thought of independence before. There's no country that's independent anymore. We must all depend on ourselves. We have, we have, we have, we have uh, all kinds of treaties, all kinds of agreements set up to, to work together. There's no more independence. What independence? Even the great United States of America. Who thought they were independent and might be trying to go away from certain treaties? They're going to find themselves right back in them. Because no nation is independent. You hear all the treaties, the NAFTA, maybe it took, even the turn from being NAFTA to some of the AFTA and some of the TA. And the European people have to make agreements with other nations. Mr. Speaker. But you know, Mr. Speaker, what is baffling to me about colonialism is that the great United Kingdom felt that they were in a, under a burden. Hmm. So I don't know how they don't understand how we feel. They were under a burden of something called the European Union. And they fought and battled to get out from under it. 
they call it Brexit, nice names, to get out. But when we raise our head to try to get out from what we are under, we are villains. When we raise our heads to say, no, 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 I want a minister, I know, no, 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 um, European parliamentarian over there telling me what I should do in Britain. But when we raise our heads and say we don't want nobody in the, in the foreign and common office tell us how much money we should spend and how much money we should borrow and how much road we should build and where we should go. When we raise our head and say that we are demons. But the United Kingdom can go to Europe and say we don't want your rule on us. Don't tell us about our customs and our, our, our things. Don't tell us about our trade, our trade agreements. Don't and that's their right. But what about our rights, Mr. Speaker? Why the Premier of the Virgin Islands, the Minister of Finance, has to go to the United Kingdom to bow down and beg for a, a, the, the approval of a budget for this territory that 13 members of the House of Assembly agrees on? Why well, yes, to go there? And then you're telling us we have a modern partnership? What's the matter about that? What's partnership about that? And if you say no, it's no. Mr. Speaker, I don't want people to misunderstand me because there's always that misunderstanding. Van der Poel down on the government, Van der Poel down on the British. People, come on, grow up. Let's be mature. There's nothing about being down on the governor or individual are not only being, but about being down on, on, on the United Kingdom. It's about, as the Premier said yesterday, it's not what we are fighting against. We have to fight for what is right for ourselves. So let's focus on that. <coughs> Governors have come. Governors have gone, Mr. Speaker. I work with, in, in, in my time in here, <coughs> in the, in now the fourth term, <coughs> I have worked, Mr. Speaker, with, I have worked, Mr. Speaker, with, uh, My, my colleagues are harassing me, yes, Mr. Speaker. It's my fifth term. I nearly wasn't in the fifth one, so I, I still have the mentality. So forgive me, I'm here, yeah. I'm here for purpose. Maybe this is a purpose. Mr. Speaker, in the fifth, in, the, in the, this, the four plus this one term that I'm here, I have worked with, I don't know, one, two, maybe four or five governors. So it's not about the governor, not about the individual. It's about the governorship. It's about the colonialism that we see that is being established and dominance that is being placed on us that we should be getting away from. We should be decolonizing. We should be moving away from it, Mr. Speaker, as a people. And if we don't want to do that, it's our will. If we don't want to do it, we don't want to do it. So who's Mark Vanderpool? And who just house our assembly here to say we, we, we must do it? The people must decide. But at least it's my obligation, I believe, after the five, the four plus this one term coming and I'm through here, at least it's my, my, my responsibility to try to say what I think and, and, and explain what I believe should be. And people will make their decisions as a people. So, Mr. Speaker. That brings me to the beginning. <laughs> that was just a preamble, Mr. Speaker, so forgive me. <laughs> In fact, Mr. Speaker, before I come out of the preamble, I am going to take my time today. I'm not going to rush. This is my last hurrah on this important matter. So I'm like the member for the third. One other professorial point, Mr. Speaker. What is self-determination? What it means? 
You know, you, sometimes you just say these things, you don't stop and try to. What does it mean? What is it saying? Self determination. Two words hyphenated. Self. In my context, Mr. Speaker, self there means the people of the Virgin Islands, right? Self. Determination may have several syllables, but I think we can break it down and let the young people know that it comes from determined. Asian is just a thing I don't let me make it sound fancy. Determination. But self and determine. How, we, how do we determine or make our own road or determine our own space or cut our own path? Determine. Self, determine. In other words, uh, I can see clearly I don't, want, I don't need you to hold my hand to determine the path. So that's why it's self-determined. I can do it myself. What are you holding my hand for? You understand what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker? In other words, I'm going down there to that door, and I'm not blind. So I don't need you to hold my hand to carry me down there. I can self-determine my path. I have the, the vision, the eyes to see, and that relates to vision. I have some vision. The people of the Virgin Islands must have a vision or the people will perish. Our vision, not the vision of the United Kingdom, not the vision of Europe, not the vision of the European Union, not the vision of anybody else. It is our vision, our self-determination, our self-vision, what we see is best for ourselves. We look over there and we see it. It's ahead of us. It's beyond us. Honorable Shari De Castro talked last night. Y'all think I was, I was ready to listen. And she said something about resolve. It's what's resolved in us, it's our self. It's what's in us. What's in our resolves? Self determination. So why do I need somebody to hold my hand? Mr. Speaker. Why I, why I went to the polls? Why we had a, a, a campaign all over the country. Some people come out, some didn't come out, some listen on the radio, some listen on social media. They listen and they, they voted. They self-determined that they were going to have a premier named Andrew Foy. And they self-determined that they had to have a government of the Virgin Islands Party. And they self-determined that... How much other parties over here? Three parties. We'll be over here. They self-determined that. The people of the Virgin Islands made that determination on February, what was it again, 25? 2019. So we have made that determination, self-determination. So this constitution here says at the end of the preamble, and I'm a member of the third point of yesterday, noting that the United Kingdom the, administ the administering power. Come on, let me write that over. Let me write that over. The administering power. Stop it. Call it what it is. The colonial power. And don't think I'm, I don't have any dislike or hatred. I'm just stating the facts as they are. The colonial power. What? If you're administering us, what I mean? We're not administering ourselves. We don't, we don't run things. We do not run things in this constitution. We don't. The United Kingdom run things, the administering power. And why are you show a quote net for and placating me to say the administering power for the time being? Don't placate me. You are the administering power. You are it now. For the time being. I don't know what that means. Has articulated. Hmm. In other words, they have put forward, they've, they've said they would, they, 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 they said they would. Has articulated 
a desire to enter into a modern partnership. <laughs> you know, I, I listened to Honorable Dr. Pickering as I was in the, on the government side, who have gone to these UN decolonization, many of them, decolonization conferences, and the Premier went to one last year, or early this year, and every time Dr. Pickering comes back, he would say the United Nations are insisting that the territories need to be they must self-determine their destiny. And they must take charge. And in those sessions, it is not just the Virgin Islands that are there and other countries, other territories, the United Kingdom. The colonial powers are there in those sessions. And they hear what is being recommended. A modern partnership with the Virgin Islands based on the principles of mutual respect and self-determination. Well, how are you going to tell me I must self-determine and you respect me and you will still tell me what to do? You're going to still tell me what my budget should say? You're going to still tell me where I have to go? And if you go to this constitution and use the word self-determination against and respect against many of the things that are said in here, we are not self-determined and we are not respected. We're not respected. We're not self-determined. Nothing. You're putting, you're putting that the premier, you're putting that, 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 that you're going to get your own cabinet. You're going to get your own cabinet. I wouldn't even go to the inside of it because I'm going to just go to the back here because people must realize, um, Deputy Speaker, that this constitution is only 56 pages long. And a lot of the pages only have pages. They put an explanatory note at the end of it. Mr. Speaker, this order established a new constitution of the Virgin Islands to replace the constitution of 1976. I'm glad we didn't wait so long because from 1976 to 2007, there was an upgrade between there, but that was the, the last substantial one. The new constitution includes for the first time a chapter setting out the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual and provisions for the enforcement. It provides for a form. I want you to listen to me here now, Mr. Speaker. Premier, I want you to hear me. It provides for a, a governor as a majesty's representatives, representative as a majesty's representatives in the islands. Uh, I, guess, I, I think it means no, not an S there, but representative. And then it has a comma there. So a, a governor to be the ma a majesty's representative, AG. And for a premier and the ministers who form a cabinet together with the Attorney General. Now what this tells me is that the cabinet is, according to this, is only made up of the Premier and the ministers who form a cabinet. And I don't know why they put together with the Attorney General, but they're letting you know that the Attorney General should be there to advise the cabinet. You know, he didn't say hey, that comma before, that comma that comes after Her Majesty's representative in the islands. Does it, it doesn't say that the, the governor is, is, a cap, is part of the cabinet. Although inside here, we see where the governor chairs the cabinet. But we know he's not a, it's, it's an anomaly. That's what I'm telling you, it's an anomaly. How can you have a man who is not a member of the cabinet, can't vote in the cabinet, but is chairman of the cabinet? Mr. Speaker, that's why I go back to, to what I said before. Stop it. It is not a modern partnership. Mr. Speaker, it is no mutual respect in that. You don't respect the Premier, this Constitution. If you're going to tell me that the Premier and his ministers are the Cabinet. And this Explaining note behind there says the Premier and his ministers formed the cabinet. There was a comma before Her Majesty's representative, so he was out. They didn't put in the line where even the AG is in there. But yet they're going to tell me, and that's why I said, you, 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 you. 
That's why I said, Mr. Speaker, you, 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 you're not only disrespecting me or the people of the Virgin Islands, but you are estimating our wisdom and, and understanding and our knowledge and our will to be self-determining. You're, you're misunderstanding. You're, 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 You're not a member of the cabinet, but yet you're telling me that you have to chair the cabinet. <clears throat> and Mr. Speaker, I've seen it, many governors, I'm not, I'm not talking about this governor or any particular governor, but many governors. <clears throat> people, the people must know, Mr. Speaker, you know, that, you know Mr. Speaker, that, that they, 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 there's some kind of steering committee of the cabinet. Before the cabinet happens, there's a steering committee that must happen. And there are many governors in the past who have used the steering committee to dictate what policy and what should go on the cabinet's agenda. Now, what is that? That's respect. The people have elected a premier and four ministers to form the cabinet, and the cabinet will be determined by somebody else. Where is that? Respect and self thought. Where is self respect? Where is respect and self determination in that, Mr. Speaker? You understand me, Mr. Speaker? That's what it says. So, what kind of cabinet is that? Well, we must go and bow down and ask them to change that, and we can't decide ourselves. They must agree. Mr. Speaker, something is wrong. Something is wrong not only with, 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 with other people, but with us. <clears throat> so, I think, Mr. Speaker, I've established what do you call it, AG cause or foundation? Foundation is the point of reason. I've established foundation and I, I, I've established some history and I've established some definition, and now I've established a foundation for us going forward. History, definition of self, of uh, decolonization and self-determination. And then I've set the foundation that the last constitution said that we should, that the British government, the UK government, the United Kingdom, the administrating power for the time being has articulated a desire to enter into a modern partnership with the Virgin Islands based on the principle of mutual respect and self-determination. I, I kept, you know, I've been trying to follow over the years, Mr. Speaker, the last 10, 13 years, what is this modern partnership? I hear about some, something what they write up, some white paper in 2012 or whenever it was, I had my notes here, a white paper, UK 1999 white paper, 2012 white paper, and then the protocols and so on for financial management. I'll come back to financial management in a bit, Mr. Speaker. I have a lot of things to say, Mr. Speaker, so please bear with me because I have to say a few things. So what is this modern partnership stated in there? They've attempted to talk about this modern partnership by writing up these white papers and all kinds of things. None of them white papers have Mr. Speaker in there. That we must run things ourselves. None of them white papers. I thought we were moving towards that. That's what they're saying. But I can't, I remember all them white papers. I read them, I read them. None of them say that we must run our own terms. In fact, the last white paper and in the 2011, 2012 protocols and all them things there, you gotta go put together a budget, put together some notes, and go up to the United Kingdom and say, this is what we want to do over the next three years. Please allow us to do it. That's where we, we, we've gone backwards instead of forwards. Forward, we, we've gone backwards. Or backward instead of forward. Mr. Speaker, I must use my proper English. Not a mockery, I'm just saying I put an S on there, I shouldn't. My English teachers are listening to me, Jenny Wheatley and 
well, one that was in my house a little too much, Julie Vanderpool. So I can't put on the S's where I'm not supposed to. But, Mr. Speaker, none of established that foundation that, that we, we, we are supposed to be moving to a modern partnership. Let's find out what this modern partnership is in this new constitution going forward. Let's, uh, let's test the waters. Honorable Premier and Leader of the Opposition, let's test the waters. And when you go up there, don't go up there like you're bowing down. You ain't bowing down to nobody. Do not go up to the United Kingdom like we always, that in fact, a lot of people, I used to think so too. You guys go up there and bow down. You got to say, no, y'all joking. Y'all think I'm joking. Y'all think I'm joking. You go up there and the expectation is that they're coming to. Nothing is wrong with asking, but something is wrong with begging. Mr. Speaker, I speak from experience. I speak from experience. You know, Mr. Speaker, respect and self-determination. And the people must understand what goes on behind closed doors sometimes. The United Kingdom is governed and run by a parliament with a cabinet that is elected, that is led by a prime minister. Am I right, Mr. Eiji? Absolutely, I like that word, that is absolute. The prime minister with his cabinet is the executive. The parliament, which consists of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, Mr. Fraser will be soon put on the House of Lords. I haven't been around so long. The Parliament and the House of Lords, and they determine <clears throat> what happens in the United Kingdom. I look at the picture, I um, can't remember what it is, but I know Mr. Churchill shows that every, once a week he goes before Her Majesty. I don't know if it's once a week now, that's when she was young. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, then they were going through the World War II and so on, and he, once a week he'll go and tell her what he's doing. He didn't really go to ask permission, he was just keeping her abreast. Mr. Speaker, I forget the name of the, of the picture. But that is what happens in the United Kingdom. But here in the Virgin Islands, we are supposed to be reporting to the United Kingdom through a minister responsible for overseas territories. Uh, uh, Mr. Premier, am I right? And the Prime Minister appoints that minister. They change him from different times. During the um, disaster we had with hurricanes, one minister came down here, a lady, and by the time he got up there to meet with the same minister again, another minister was appointed. One was fired, and another was hired. The lady was fired, and the gentleman was hired. And there's another one again now, I think. But the point I'm making, Mr. Speaker, is that a minister is appointed to be over the territories. So we, we can't self-determine. We have to... Bow down to the minister. I know I'm talking about Mr. 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 Speaker. I went there, I had to go bow down. You think I'm joking? So, but that is not the worst case, Mr. Speaker. You think there's this minister you bow down to? When you finish all the talk in front of the minister, the premier is there playing key, the minister got good religion, whatever it might be. When you finish all the talk, and then a man steps in, he's the director of the Foreign and Comrade Office. I don't know if that's his title. I don't think that's it. He probably is director in charge of overseas territories. And he's public, so I must mention his name. Because he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's just like one of us. His name is a Ben Merrick. No, let's don't, don't think I'm getting personal here. All I'm saying is that the point I'm making to the speaker is that we are elected by the people. But we are directed by an appointed executive. 
Where is the respect in that? Where is the self-determination in that? And what Mr. Ben Merrick says stands. And the governor of the territory reports to Mr. Ben Merrick. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, where is your respect and where is the self-determination? I hope you understand that we have to get away from those things. The premier of this country who we elected through an election process should not have to go down, go up and bow down to anybody to get his budget approved or to get other things done in the territory of the Virgin Islands or to be able to borrow money or whatever you may want to do. That should not be the case in the Virgin Islands. And I hope that this constitution changes that. The elected officials of a country need to run the country or don't elect them. Tell them go sit down. Tell us all go sit down. We want the governor to run things here. We don't want all you, you all are set up whatever it is, and let the governor run things. Something has to happen. You either elect us to run the country or... So we got to bring our people along to understand that, I encourage them along to understand that. And there's some things we got to put in place to make sure that they're comfortable with that. And hopefully we can, we can keep building those institutions and keep doing the right things and be, 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 be accountable to the people of the Virgin Islands that if we don't do the right thing, we should be punished, like any other country. That is it, Mr. Speaker. Whereas the people of the territory of the Virgin Islands have over centuries evolved Nineteen forty nine. This says over centuries, you know. Let's not go back as far over all the centuries. But nineteen forty nine the people evolved and said we want to run our own affairs. We want to be we want to have representation. No administrator alone here in and say what can happen here. The country evolved, the people evolved. We have We've grown up, we, 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 we've learned how to do things with a distinct cultural identity. Distinct cultural identity. We are a people, we are not, we are not, we are not Brits, we are not Europeans, we are not whatever it is, we are Virgin Islanders. We are people of the Virgin Islands with a cultural identity which is the essence of a Virgin Islander. which is the essence of a Virgin Islander. Now, I, 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 I am coming to that because there is a definition of Virgin Islander, and that is fine with me. But when it comes to the people of the territory, I am one of them. Because I am a, I, I am, I belong to the Virgin Islands. 62 and a half years in the Virgin Islands, and I am something else. Somebody tell me different. If I ain't pick up the culture by then, if I don't have the identity by then, I don't have a problem between my neighbors string him in buried here. That's true. So that's a distinction between myself and a true Virgin Islander, uh, 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 um, indigenous Virgin Islander, as, you, as we say. That's a distinction. And that distinction needs to be protected by true Virgin Islanders and, Virgin Islanders and by, by indigenous Virgin Islanders. But I have a distinct cultural identity, and others also. Acknowledging that the society of the Virgin Islands is based upon certain moral, spiritual, and democratic values, including belief in God, the dignity of the human person, the freedom of the individual, and the respect for fundamental rights and freedoms, and the rule of law. That's who we are. Mindful that the people of the Virgin Islands have expressed, and I'm reading this, um, Deputy Speaker, because I want the young people to keep hearing it because the member for the third read it quite a bit yesterday, and I want to make sure we keep reading it. And mindful that the people of the Virgin Islands have expressed a desire for their constitution to reflect who they are as a people and a country, and their quest for social justice, 
economic empowerment, and political advancement. Social justice, economic empowerment, and political advancement. I say it again. Social justice, economic empowerment, and political advancement. Mr. Trump said he passed the um, thing. I, I passed it to What do you call that thing that Tesla gave him? I said him in honor, right, A.G.? Mr. Trump said he passed that test that they gave him, some test for um, something. I just passed it to Honorable Malone because cognitive, whatever it is. So when we are do, going to book of business, we have to be careful because in the Constitution, we said we want to give ourselves, as we just noted, Social justice. We have our rights, and in here there's the human rights chapter. We want to give ourselves economic empowerment. We want to empower our own people. It ain't just a matter of a promise by a, a political party in, a, in an election. It ain't just a matter of, 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 of a meeting in a cabinet and fighting our people who want to not give your own people economic empowerment. It's a matter that's enshrined in the Constitution. Economic empowerment. So when we go all over the place and bring our kind of people from all over the place to do some economic things, let's be careful because we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are going that into the Constitution. And I, I'm not going to bring any politics here now. We're going to talk about the other business because some economic empowerment needs to happen in the Virgin Islands. There was some happened recently I heard about that city and the locals involved. There ain't economic empowerment. But I will leave that for another time. That ain't for here. That is not for here. Because under this one here, we're not fighting one another. We're going to work together. Economic empowerment and political advancement. Yeah. You know, how come we have to be here begging so hard for political advancement, buddy? What, what, what? We are different people than anybody else in the world, buddy. Why we can't get our own political advancement? Why we can't run our own show? Why we, do, why we need a governor in charge of us? Why, why the people of the territory must still continue to think that the governor must be in charge? And we can't have our own political advancement. And I'm, I'm asking this question because maybe the people are right. Why they can't trust us? What have we done so wrong? What I tell people all the time when they say, well, you know, I have politicians, this and that, and they may be right. But every country has the same issues. And, I, and, and, and I'm sure the leader of opposition others will say it, but I will mention in here now, it's probably an appropriate time to say that we need to have some term limits so that the people can believe and trust us a little more and not see us here forever, and especially the, 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 the premiership or the leadership of the country. Even in Russia, they have them. Mr. What his name is? Uh, Mr. Putin decided to put up after his first term limit was over. Not any event by the constitution. He decided to put up a man to be the leader for uh, what the four, five or uh, something years. I forget what the man name now. And after that, he said, "Okay, my term limit was over. Then it's you got your turn. Now it's my turn again." I don't know, nothing's wrong with that. I think the same thing is being tried in, in uh, Guyana. And I don't know, maybe in the UK, in the US it might happen one day. So, you know, but this is constitution. But, but at least it gives a, a chance for after two terms or whatever terms you give for Premier to be leading the country that he takes a break and if he's long enough and want to come back again, he comes back again later. Nothing wrong with that. But let the people decide. That's the, that's the people's decision. So, economic empowerment and political advancement. That's what we're fighting for in this constitution. That's, the, that's the, the, the crux of the matter here, Mr. Speaker. I'll point out one last sentence in this here. I wouldn't go over all of it because I want to make sure that the people are willing 
to support us under certain principles, accepting that the Virgin Islands should be governed based on adherence to well-established democratic principles, well-established democratic principles and institutions. So we need those institutions. The House of Assembly, we, we saw some of them in the back of the Constitution that they mentioned there. But I want to, and I know we are, the Premier is working on, on the one on Minister's Code of Conduct, Mr. Speaker. And all those, we, we, the, 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 we are under the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court the provisions made for a public service commission, a teaching service commission, a judicial and legal services commission, a police service commission uh, to provide advice on appointments to offices in these services. A new national security council we have now, uh, director of public prosecutions, uh, public finance, complaints commissioner, and a register of interest. Those are the things that we have established under this present constitution. I know we are now going moving towards the minister's code of conduct and other things like those, which gives the people the confidence that we have to abide by certain laws and rules to govern ourselves. And we must build institutions to govern ourselves. The House of Assembly institution, we need to keep strengthening. Uh, uh, the, the, the judiciary, Mr. Speaker, as an independent, as an, an, an independent branch of government, and, 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 and so on and so on. Those are what are some things we need to see strengthening the new constitution, Mr. Speaker, as we go forward. I won't go into the details a very bit of it, but I, I want to just mention them that it's, it's, it's our duty in this new constitution to strengthen the institutions, as is mentioned there in the preamble, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, this, this constitution, I, I will speak a little bit on the subject of, 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 uh, of protecting the people, and especially protecting the, the, the indigenous people, <clears throat> and I, but I will also speak, Mr. Speaker, on the fact that we must also be careful not to discriminate against a certain people of a territory. Be careful, because this constitution hinges on that in certain ways, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I quite appreciate and I quite understand. In fact, I, I, will, I will suggest that we look at a chapter in this constitution which speaks to the protection of the indigenous people of the Virgin Islands. Because all over the world you have that issue and that, that problem. The Americans went into the US, into the United States and run out the, the indigenous people and they're marginalized now and they're, they're, they're considered, um, they have their little, um, what do you call them things? Little colonies or whatever they are, all over the United States. But they're marginalized. So we gotta make sure that doesn't happen in a, in a, a small place like the Virgin Islands. We have, we have, we have other countries where they have been, they've been literally run out. And the great United States boasts about it, but they, 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 have, they, they are immigrants, and they're still talking about immigrants coming in, and they are the biggest, the biggest immigrants. They met some people there. You run them across the border, and another one come back over, and you're trying to stop them. I don't know, Mr. Speaker. That's not for me to, to deal with. So I, I do have a full appreciation for making sure that we, we, we empower, we protect, and we make sure that the indigenous peoples of the Virgin Islands, which I am not, are well protected. But this constitution says, suggests, Mr. Speaker, that another certain people in the Virgin Islands, which is discrimination. We're talking about fighting against the fact that the black people can't vote and couldn't vote and are now able to vote. Mr. Lewis, uh, who just died, who had to march uh, on the bridge of Selma and got his head busted up, just passed away. And he said, if you see something, if you see something, say something. Talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. I see something, and I'm going to talk about it. I was grandfathered in, Mr. Speaker. I was grandfathered in. If I wasn't on the voters list before 2007, I couldn't run for office. I 
And I recognize that. But is that right? Are those category of persons going forward since 2007 who may not have been grandfathered in but live here and belong here, are they going to be excluded from running for office? That is not right. This is what this constitution has in it right now. They can't run. They can vote, but they can't run. They are belongers of a territory. They belong to the Virgin Islands. Though they're not indigenous, they belong to the Virgin Islands. They contribute. They live here. They will go to school here. They grew up here. They pay taxes here. But they can't represent under this new constitution if they were not grandfathered in like me. That is discrimination. And let's be careful because it can come back to haunt us. We might not see it now. We might be under the guise that we are protecting indigenous, which is good. But be careful, it's discrimination. You're going to tell me that somebody, because they didn't get on the vote, as listed before 2007, but they belong us, can't run for office. The democratic, what do they call it here? Uh, uh, kinship, where is it about democratic thing? Here? Democratic principles, uphold democratic principles. That's what starts a problem in many countries. It can go either way when you start discriminating. We hear about white supremacy and this supremacy and that supremacy. It's discrimination. So if a person belongs and they can't run for office, something is wrong. I know my, I have a problem with this because, I, as, as um, John Lewis said, the, the, the late John Lewis, see something, speak up about what I know. I know I'm going to get beat up for it, but I'm saying it because I'm here to represent those people. It's, it's discrimination that you can vote but you can't run for office. Something is wrong there. I don't know how it can be fixed, but it needs to be fixed because it's going to be a problem. Mr. Speaker, I am married to a Virgin Islander. But if I wasn't married to the Virgin Islander, my two children, if they weren't registered before 2021, before 2007, couldn't run for office. You understand that, Mr. Speaker? That is discrimination. My two boys would not have been able to run for office if I was married to somebody else from another country. I went through the Constitution. I didn't even recognize it before until some time back. And I recognized Mr. Speaker. I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that there are certain offices in here that you got in other words. When I retire soon, Mr. Speaker, I can't be the deputy governor. There's a reason for that, I'm sure, but I'm a belonger. But I can't be the deputy governor. Discrimination. There are different forms of it. This constitution has a human rights chapter in it. Discrimination. I'm a belonger. I have the rights of belongership. Yes, you're telling me in the constitution you're putting in there that you're protecting certain rights for indigenous peoples. <laughs> but be careful. One day a minority might be running a the majority. These are the facts. And no representation for the majority will be in the House of Assembly. If this, if this, if this appertains and continues. Hmm. These are the facts. How are we going to deal with them?
ignore them, bury your heads. Say, take that, go back Angola, whatever you want to say, that's all right. But I'm just stating the facts. Belongers, we make you belongers, but we discriminate against them. It's not right. That's not right. But I'll leave that there to ponder. I'll leave it there to ponder because the Constitution isn't just what we say here. We have to go out and hear what the people say. The people who want it, that's the people. That's all right. But I will go to one last major factor, two of them, in fact, and then I will try to wrap up because I, I, there are other things I want to discuss, but I'll leave them because there's a lot more chance for discussion on these matters. Because, Mr. Speaker, for those out there who are listening, this Constitution will have 10 chapters. 10 chapters. Chapter 1. After the preamble, it speaks of the interpretation of a number of things in, the, in here. Interpretation, including who can run for office and who can vote and who can't vote. Chapter 2 has a very important chapter, the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual. Fundamental rights. I just spoke with some about one of them. And freedoms of the individual. Mr. Speaker. Chapter 2. Quite a long chapter. A lot of interpretations. And fundamental rights and freedoms of the people. Chapter 3. It has a chapter, Mr. Speaker, for the governor. And you know, Mr. Speaker, in many other countries, even independent countries, some of them call him a governor general. Some people call them different things. <laughs> I, I am trying to remember, Mr. Premier, when last I heard about the governor general of St. Kitts. Did you know there was one? There's a governor general of St. Kitts, an independent country. There's a governor general of Antigua, they're governor generals. But they're governor generals there to deal with matters that the political, the electorate doesn't have to deal with, such as management of an election. It would be biased if the premier is running an election. He shouldn't be running the election, right? The election is handled by the governor general. That's when the governor comes in. But during the four years that the, minister, the Premier is running the country as he's elected to do, where is the Governor General of St. Kitts? I think the last time I heard about him was when, what do I, when they were appointing the, when the Chief Justice had resigned or whatever his name was, uh, what was the name? Justice, um, huh? It wasn't Rollins. He was from St. Kitts, actually. Rollins. I went to St. Kitts to, to uh, I think the, 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 the premier at the time had a, a function. And, you know, there were people there and so on. And I see a gentleman in a, a, a kind of brown suit. You know those khaki things that they, eh? And they told me that's the governor general. I never heard him made a speech. And I never heard him involved in, in, the, in the local politics and activities. I never heard him having to defend himself about what he does and what he doesn't do. That is the role of the premier. And I'm not, uh, people, last time I spoke about this, I get calls saying, oh, why are you troubling the governor? But I'm not troubling the governor. I'm troubling, I am troubling the self-determination of a country that when you elect a body to run the country, let the body run the country. According to the Constitution. I don't know if it, it passed yet. The Disaster Preparedness Act, it will never be passed. 
Now that, I end up in my room, I can talk, you, you don't have to talk. It will never be passed. Because I learned my lesson last time there was a hurricane. And I know you all know I don't, I'm not afraid to speak. I learned my lesson the last time there was a hurricane. Under our constitution or whatever it is, there's an emergency act. I don't know why we feel that the premier can run an emergency in the country. That a governor has to click in and take over the country. I'm not talking about the, the issue of whoever this governor is, this governor or whichever one. But that is going backward. Who know the people more of the country? Who know what the needs are more? Who know what, how to deal with situations more than the, the premier of the country and, his, and his, his ministers and the members of the house who we are mingling with every day? Why well, you have to get somebody coming in to check to see what happened in Just One Dyke? The member for Just One Dyke need to, it should be on the ground knowing exactly what's happening. I don't need anybody going in the Lambush to tell me what happened in the Lambush. Which governor was in by swear, or I mean by, by my people then? Who know them more than me? Mr. Speaker, this thing about an emergency and when a hurricane hit, who run the, the country after and the, the premier got to be up now, tip towing behind the governor as if. That is not right. That is not respect, and that is not a mutual partnership, and that is not self determination according to this preamble in this constitution. It's not. Uphold your words. So I hope that we can get that change fast because me signing on to the Disaster Preparedness Act that says somebody outside of the Premier should be in charge after emergency. The Premier should be in charge. He has the force, he has the confidence of people who elected him, and he should be in charge. I hope that last one will be the last one. And I hope that there's something, God forbid, that we get another disaster, that there's something that will leave the premier run the thing. It's wrong. It makes us feel like we are less than anybody else. Cooperate with us, work with us. If you need some British ships out there, help us to get them. But you don't have to run the show, run the country. The premier was elected to run the country. I, I'm not going to back up on that, even who called me and who said all kind of things. Including even my own people. I don't have a problem with that. But I am, I, I go by a conviction. I am no less than anybody else, Mr. Speaker. I might not be better, but I am no less. I have the ability to run what I think I can run, and I have the brain to do what I think I can do, just like anybody else. It is when you underestimate yourself and you devalue yourself that you don't get anything done. But if you believe, if you believe that you can fly, if you believe you can touch the sky. But there's, there are those who want you not to believe you can. You have to believe in yourself, my people. You have to believe. You have to believe in yourself. You're no different. A man who was here running for office for 20 years Honorable Dr. D. Orlando Smith was no less capable than anyone else who just came here to run the, office, run, run the country after the disaster. Have no idea where the A is or B is or C is in the country and come and run anything. That can't be. And I hope it's not going to be in the next disaster. God forbid. Who can go down, who can tell me there's a, there's a, a that carrot, they get washed out, and carrot, they get some big surges and all kinds of things happen, and the governor knows better about what's happening down there than the premier, or up east end, 
by the red, oh yeah, red rock. Red rock, yeah, all these things happen, and anybody can tell me what's, what's better than the leader opposition, what to do there. Having known the history of Red Rock and what happened there, I ain't got a clue. Okay? You know, Minister the Cameo, there in Red Rock, over, where they see some, some, where they are, there's some, some boats out there and things, and it was shallow. But I don't know what happened when the, when the storm soldiers come up. The member for the aid had to know. So, why is it that we in here can't run the, and manage this emergency and some others have to? That disaster preparedness act, Mr. Premier, leave it alone. I don't want to see it. You have to run the country when it's a disaster. I, 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 who, was, who has been more capable than the Minister of Health to run this, what do you call it, pandemic thing? We prove ourselves. People, our people, believe in yourselves. Believe in your people. Believe in your elected representatives. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. Yes, we do wrong at times. Who doesn't? We're not perfect. So we must be able to give us a certain chance. But you know, I am one who believes that I don't want to depend on anybody else, even in financial matters, Mr. Premier. I did make a proposal the last time to the last government, and I still have a proposal in my back pocket. You see, I came up with a different perspective on the reserves, Deputy Speaker. You see a thing called the reserves? You all think that's a joke, but that's our savior. That's our way out. And it don't need to be halted. We don't need anybody to tell us how to do it. We need to build it even more. Build it even more. So you don't have to depend on no one else. And unfortunately, we didn't use it properly when we had the excess many years ago, between 1999, Mr. Speaker, and, 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 and 20, even 2018. You, you see how much money we collected in 2018, even after the hurricane? We proved that we can handle ourselves after disaster. But we need to put aside some serious money every year. We need to be more prudent in managing our recurrent expenditure. It's too high. We keep saying it, but we need to take some action and put aside some money. I will tell you how I believe, but that's just me. Everybody don't believe like me, Mr. Speaker. I will build my reserves and borrow against it and keep borrowing against it. And I keep building it. Every time I have excess, I put in a reserve, and then I go and borrow. When I can't pay back, I pay back from the reserves. But I will have a reserve there that nobody can tell me what to do because that's my reserve. I ain't going to you could to ask them if I can touch that reserve. That's my reserve. Build it. I want to one day, Mr. Sp Mr. Mr. Pr Premier, I, I don't know if you'll be at the helm. I want one day when you tell me it's a quarter billion, a quarter billion dollars sitting in there. Put aside 10, 15, 20, 25 every year. Sacrifice some things. Get the water and sewage thing under control and stop subsidizing for 25 million dollars a year. Get this under control. Get it under control. And put some money in the reserves and borrow against it to do the infrastructure. But make sure you have the reserves always there to back you up. So you don't have to depend on anybody else. And in, in times of rain and storms, you can use it, but you can borrow against it. You don't have to go and borrow and, and, and get permission from all kinds of people to borrow any money. Use your reserves, build it. And I have a full program I presented, I, I, I would present to anyone on how you can do that. Your reserves is your power. It's the empowerment of yourself. You don't have to depend on anybody. You might say, we ain't got a money to save. Yeah? You start working at it, you'll see how well you'll save. How come you get, uh, how much you got, 85 million dollars in there now? Even after disaster. Keep building it. Don't be afraid every year to put in a certain amount. You, you might not buy tell you how much you put in. Put in some money in there, build it up. It's called economic empowerment. Nobody going to tell you what to do. Build your reserves. I don't have a problem, Mr. Speaker, one day if I have $250 million in the reserves and I'm borrowing $250 million. 
You know what I mean? I owe a soul. If I can't pay it back, I have my resolve to pay it back in. That's the strength. That's what's backing my borrowing. And when we start putting together all the statutory bodies and all them things there together, leaving all the social security board because that's not all, that's not your fund. When you start putting together, you can build your resorts. Build it in all them areas. It's the Port Authority, build it in there. Build it in the, in the Electricity Corporation. Build it in the, in, in the other areas. Build it by saving money in the water and sewage department that, is, that, that, that needs to be statutorized and managed properly and, 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 and let people pay their water bills. Build it in there. Build the resorts in there. One day you'll wake up and you have $250 million in resolve in the next five years and somebody will say, wait a minute. I don't need, I don't need no, no, no UK approval for it. It's my, it's my resolve. It's the British, the people of the Virgin Islands money. A little bit at a time. How do you think the Social Security Board was $700 or $800 million? It didn't happen overnight. But they put aside and they build it as it went along from people's contributions. We can do that with our own resolves too. One day, one day, not in my time, but in Honorable Kyrie, my Sam, and others, they'll wake up and have a billion dollars in the reserve. That sounds crazy. Everybody said that to talk big figures. But you'll be surprised. One day you'll have a half a, million, half a billion dollars or a billion dollars in reserves, and you're going to ask a solo thing about how to run your country. You'll be definitely self determining then. So my colleague here told me, came and have a half a billion to put aside. We can put aside our soup a little bit every year. Build it up. Run your country more in a, in a more prudent manner. Empower your people. Put them into businesses. Let them run their own show. Let them hire people. Let them go, go and, and get more villas and build more businesses and get into their own businesses and empower them. And give them the, 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 the guarantee to be empowered. They don't always have to come every day to the civil service office. Let them go and be empowered themselves. Give them a push off. Give them a, a little push off into the ocean and butcher them until they're able to stand their own two feet. But give them insurance that if they don't make it, they can still survive. There are ways of doing it, Mr. Speaker. We need to... We need to in this constitution, come up with some way that we build our own resolves. And that resolve can't be touched unless the, the House of Assembly says yes or no. Build it. That's our guarantee and our strength, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this constitution, I would like to really encourage as many, as many persons as possible listening, to get engaged in it. Young people, our seniors, working people, school children. And I like the, the concept that we must bring in the UN at some point to do an education campaign as to what self-determination and decolonization, decolonization means to a territory so that we can move towards that. I like the concept, Mr. Speaker, that we must put a time frame, a time limit on when we can have our own self of complete self-determination. Ten years from now, in two years from now, we have we reach this milestone. Another two and a half years, we reach another milestone. Another two years, and at the end of that ten years, before the next constitution, we know that we are running our own show here. We can do it. We just need to put the time frame and put the, the benchmarks to it and walk towards those. Whether it's education, whether it's financial, whether it's institutional, whether, whatever it is we need to do over the next 10 years, let's be the House of Assembly that set that benchmark that in 10 years' time we're not still talking about down the road, we're coming, we're coming, we're coming. Soon come, I heard a minute, the, the Premier saying, how long, not long. But let's put a time frame to it. Let's challenge ourselves. Let's tell our, our, our what, you call, what do they call themselves? Let's, call, let's tell our United Kingdom powers that what? Let's tell our United Kingdom uh, 
the, uh, the administering power. Let's tell them that in 10 years' time, we are going to be the administering power. And set the benchmark. And don't wait till the 10 years. Every two years, you reach a certain milestone. The Premier will pass, pass his legislation towards that. We have legislation every year moving towards it. And we reach the milestone where in year 10, at the, at, at the next, at the election of that period, it is the people voting for or against it. But you have to prepare the people for it. And let's go towards that. And let the people determine. But we, ha we have to help to move it along, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I spoke for a few minutes there, but I would like to thank my, my good colleagues for bearing me so well, because I know it's just difficult to sit, to sit down, no matter what you're saying. Boring or not boring, to sit down on here. But we had to make, I had to make some presentations there. I, I, I left a few things out because I wanted to touch on a few things in the, in the, in the, in the 10, not in the, all the chapters, but especially a few of the chapters, including the, legislative cha the, the, the chapter on legislature, and I talk about the governor, and I wouldn't even get into the nuances about this deputy governor thing and when is whatever deputy governor, governor's deputy and all kind of thing. Them things, we will sort those out. But I want us to, to be understanding. I made the point about public term limits, and I let others expound on that a little bit more. And uh, I, am, I, am, I am in support, Mr. Speaker, that we have to prepare and plan for better representation in the sister islands. So I am supportive of our legislature that represents at least 15 members that has representation and therefore Andy Gadden just went Don't say how small the numbers are. Andy Gadden is a country that, a, a, an island that has great potential. Just when like is showing its growth. Don't say because they're small and they have small population they can't be represented by themselves. They can represent themselves. So maybe the time is coming when we should have a representative and the guy that I want for Just Van Dyke. Just like we have one for Borgian Garda. We, the time might be coming in this constitution, there's nothing wrong with that. And maybe that representative would help to grow and develop and Gada. And Just Van Dyke. Representation is the most important thing. Don't, don't come and tell me about the cost and that kind of thing right now. The representation is important. Somebody in Anigada needs to be looking out for Anigada. And not wait till the, 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 the member from, from Bojangada run over to Anigada every week or, or every now and again. He needs to be there to represent Anigada. And somebody on Justin Knight needs to be over Justin Knight representing Justin Knight. I'm not saying that to get political um, because I don't need any right now. I'm on my way out. But I just want to leave it there that we should, look, we should get Justin Knight people represented by a Justin Knightian and Anigada people represented by some Anigadian. And let them be in the house. Maybe, it's, maybe it should be in, in, in a testament to Mr. Faulkner that 70 years later, he has a member in the house from Anigada. It's something to be considered. Don't, don't, let's not measure it by the number of people living there or by the number of, amount of development there. Maybe we need to get somebody there to move it to the next stage. Move those, those islands to the next stage and empower the people over there. And, and in just one day. That's what we may need. Remember for the second district, have enough run around to go to just, I mean, uh, Bruce Bay and King Gadman and Lock Hill and what call them Hill up there? Mayors and all them places there. Get a representative, representative of just one day. Get one for Anigara. Anigara has great potential. Put somebody over there and let them be thinking of what they want to do. Let them come into the house here and let them speak for themselves, Mr. Speaker. So I, I propose that this coming, this next, this, next, uh, this next constitution, let's get 15 members. And out of that, let's get a sixth minister, Mr. Speaker. Let's make it happen. We can determine our own things and make, our, make things happen for ourselves. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate everything that you have allowed me to, to speak on a debate here. I'm trying to avoid looking at my nose because I'm saying more things. But, uh, but I, I, want to, I want to summarize by just finalizing what I said, that we've come from history. And I talk about the four things in history where we, 
we still fight against ourselves. We are still delivering ourselves up to the up to the up to the the colonizers. We're still doing it. Every minute somebody down to run down for the governor with some story about the premier, I bet you. I, thought, I know I was just a minister. Every minute I had some story going down to the premier to the governor. Even them right around you, you got a civil service who's supposed to be working to help the country, build the country. And while most of them are there working very hard to make it happen, they they're beholden to the governor. They're beholden to him. It had something called, what was again? Uh, the top, top manager group or something that used to meet. And the premier, you know, thing will happen. And he's the top manager. But he wasn't in the meeting. But the governor was there. Or the deputy governor. I don't know what that is. Can you imagine a premier can't say who has key people around him to execute his policy? He can't get a word of saying that. Yes, they're saying that he must, he must agree, but then who select them? Self-determination and respect, that's what they call it, according to the preamble. No, man. So I'm saying, let's stop delivering ourselves up to somebody else. Let's start working together as a people and do what's right for this country. Let's stop beholding and bowing down and, and, and believing that we are beholden to somebody from foreign, according to the, somebody from foreign. Let's stop doing that. And people, please don't come and tell me nothing about I'm against the governor. I'm against the governor. I'm not against it. I'm against, I'm against the fact that we don't believe in ourselves that we can do what we have to do for ourselves. I'm not against the governor. He has his role. The Constitution says what his job is. And I, I, I uphold that. I uphold that. You can, you can accomplish your, your goal as a governor without, without press conferences and we're all being seen and without defending and as if you know, we are running for ourselves. You don't need that. And I'm not afraid to say it. And I, I'm not afraid to say people don't believe, but I'm not afraid to say that govern, the governor, the present governor is my friend. He has a very good family, respectful. And I respect him, respect him as a friend. I want to make sure you understand that. And he can call me up any day, which he does sometimes. I can call him anytime. We call each other on first names. There's no problem with that. And I respect him. I respect his job. But we have to fight. For ourselves, we have to fight to move forward. We can't remain stagnant. Stagnant water doesn't smell good, no matter how fresh it was when you put it in the tub. You leave it there for a week. Fresh, all the tap. Leave it there for a week and put the nose nearby it. Leave it for a month. Stagnant water, stagnant nations, stagnant people. It is not good for you. It doesn't, it, does, it smells. So let's move forward, Mr. Speaker, and let's work together on this constitution over the next year, whatever long it takes to, to get it there. And Mr. Mr. Leader of the delegation, who we're going to go, when you are going, I ain't going to be there. I, I, I'm not going to be there to represent the island people. So I've got to make sure I put some words in your ears to represent the island people, uh, as, I, as I am. I mean, I get from, I, I hear it every day. I don't have a problem with it. That's a people's view, view. That's all right. But I'm saying there are belongers that need representing who, can, who may be discriminated, who are discriminated against in this constitution. I ain't coaching it. So I ought to be, I wouldn't be up there to represent, but my good leader of opposition and my good premier, when you all go there, I want you to keep an eye on the ball because these are things that are going to hurt us in the future as it's happening everywhere in the world, in the United States, everywhere. They're fighting against discrimination. And we're here putting discriminatory things in our, in our constitution. That's not right. So let's fight. Let's, let's make sure that doesn't happen. You might not see it now, and people might say, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we, yes, and I agree. In fact, I will, I, will, I will recommend some protective things for indigenous people to go in the constitution. 
and I feel like there should be a specific chapter in there for it. But I, I am saying don't, don't discriminate. Very dangerous. Mr. Speaker, let us be masters of our own selves and not servants of others. That should be the theme of our constituent going forward. Masters of ourselves and not servants of others. I thank you for giving me the opportunity for taking more time than I probably should. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the 4th District for his contribution. We'll now move on to the member for the 2nd District, the Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to ensure that, again, as I stand on the Privileges Committee, because the member for the fourth and the Deputy Speaker went before, so I want to make sure that I go to State Niagara for once you say she's good, then she's good, because I'm going to take my time today, Mr. Speaker. So I just want to ensure that everybody is good to go, because we're going to go again. Well, I, I'm guided by members. If we want to break now for lunch or we want to no, continue. No, not, not for lunch. I okay. just want to make sure she could stretch her fingers. Okay. But I, anyway, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for she, giving my time. I will, I will. Okay. She has indicated she's okay. She's okay. So you're recognized, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Oh, you want a break? Oh, okay. I'm being advised that the Hanson officer requires a break. Yes. So we'll do a five-minute recess. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This house is in recess.
Please be seated. This sitting now resumes. Honorable members, we took that recess because the hands-on officer needed a recess. So I'm not, I'm hoping that there was no miscommunication by anyone and that the, the decorum of this house will continue to be respected. With that said, I recognize the member for the second district, the Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is my privilege to rise to give my contribution on the resolution regarding the constitutional review, which as many members before me stated that is 13 years out since the last constitutional review. And Mr. Speaker, I want to take some time, as I said before, to ensure that I, as best as possible, go through some thoughts and ideas that I believe are relevant to this conversation and the need for the constitutional review at this time, or at least to continue to get the public to understand why it is necessary. And as members before me stated, Mr. Speaker, I believe this is imperative and absolutely important for the people of the Virgin Islands to get a full understanding of why we are here, why we are having this discussion, and some of the thoughts, hopes, and beliefs that we wish to, that we want to achieve as we move and continue to build this territory of ours called the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to crave your indulgence from time to time as I'm going to refer to my notes and when I need to read something specific, I'm going to ask that I be given that permission to do so. Permission is granted. Thank General. you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the word self-determination, as the member for the fort just said, it seems like he was in my notes, but I know that this is not about who said what and what side. I think, Mr. Speaker, it is important for us to all, and for me to reiterate, that this is about us as leaders of this territory and us on the pathway to understanding and forging a way, creating a pathway for where we want to go and where we need to be to lead this country. Mr. Speaker, by definition, self-determination, the process by which a group of people usually possessing certain, a certain degree of national consciousness from their own state and choose their own government as a political principle, the idea of self-determination evolved at first by for as a byproduct of the doctrine of nationalism to which early French, to which the early expression was given by French and American revolutions in World War I, and allies accepted self-determination as a peace aim. So if I understand, Mr. Speaker, and I take away 
and abbreviate and summarize this definition, I would just take the first line. Self-determination is the process by which a group of people possessing a degree of national consciousness from their own state choose their own government. Mr. Speaker, the question is usually asked, and I heard, I heard one of the speakers before ask the question, and it was such an important question. The question was asked, where are we going? And Mr. Speaker, not to take away anything from the particular speaker's or member's contribution, my position, however, is in order to understand where we are going, we first must understand where we came from. And then when we understand and appreciate where we came from, then we will understand where we are. So here it is, Mr. Speaker, in 2020. We are having a conversation, we are having a discussion and a debate in this country surrounding issues about the future governance, the future leadership, the future rights, privileges, and obligations of this territory of the Virgin Islands. And Mr. Speaker, this conversation is one that has been ongoing. But now, again, we are presented with an opportunity to make certain decisions as leaders and obviously with the input, consultation and advice of the people. Mr. Speaker, the document that I hold in my hand is the Virgin Islands Constitution of 1976. And out of this document that is just about 65 pages long. I think Honorable Vanderpool went there, but I have to do it because this is my presentation. The last page says, explanatory note, in brackets. This note is not part of the order. But in 1976, it says that this order makes new provision for the government of the Virgin Islands. In particular, it provides for a governor appointed by Her Majesty, comma, an executive council, and a legislative council. The executive council will include a chief minister and two other ministers appointed on his advice. The chief minister will be, elected, will be the elected member of the Legislative Council, recommended by a majority of the elected members of that majority political party. Or, if there is no majority political party, the elected member best able to command the support of the majority of the elected members. The Legislative Council will consist of a speaker, nine elected members, and one official, the Attorney General. Whoever the present Legislative Council will remain, however, sorry, the present Legislative Council will remain in existence until the next dissolution of the Council through the financial, or though the financial secretary will cease to be a member. Mr. Speaker, this was in 1976. So at that time, 
these were the things that were put in our Constitution. And then we move to 2007. And in the explanatory notes, again, which in brackets, this is not part of the order. 2007 reads, this order establishes a new constitution for the Virgin Islands to replace the constitution of 1976. The new constitution includes, for the first time, a chapter setting out the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individuals and provisions of their, for their enforcement. It provides for a governor as Her Majesty's representative in the islands and for a premier and ministers who form a cabinet together with the Attorney General. It provides for an elected House of Assembly which together with Her Majesty forms the legislature. The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court continues to have jurisdiction in these islands. Provision is made for a public service commission, a teaching service commission, a judicial and legal service commission, and a police service commission to provide advice on appointments of officers in these services. A new national security is established, as is the office of the director of public prosecutions Provision is also made for public finance, a compla complaints commissioner, and a register of interest. Mr. Speaker, then we see that we have, from 1976 to 2007, had some additions some improvements, if you want to call it that, in terms of things that have been or items through bodies and through certain powers and departments that have been granted to the people of the Virgin Islands. And then if I move to the beginning of the 2007 Constitutional Order for the Virgin Islands, it says, whereas the people of the territory of the Virgin Islands have over centuries evolved with a distinct cultural identity, which is the essence of a Virgin Island. That is the first line in the preamble. Acknowledge that a society of the Virgin Islands is based upon certain moral, spiritual, and democratic values, including a belief in God, the dignity of human person, the freedom of the individual and the respect for fundamental rights and freedoms and the rule of law. Mindful that the people of the Virgin Islands have expressed a desire for the Constitution to reflect who they are as a people and a country and their quest for social justice, economic empowerment and political advancement. Recognizing that the people of the Virgin Islands have a free and independent spirit and have developed themselves and their country based on qualities of honesty, integrity, mutual respect, self-reliance, and ownership of the land engendering a strong sense of belonging to and kinship with these islands. Recalling that because of historical, economic, and other reasons, many of the people of the Virgin Islands reside elsewhere, but have and continue to have an ancestral connection and bond with those islands. Accepting that the Virgin Islands should be governed based on 
adherence to well-established democratic principles and institutions, affirming that the people of the Virgin Islands have generally expressed their desire to become self -go a self-governing people and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of their country at this stage of its development and noting that the United Kingdom, the, the administering power for the time being, has articulated a desire to enter into a modern partnership with the Virgin Islands based on the principles of mutual respect and self-determination. Now, therefore, the following provisions have effect in the Constitution of the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, self-determination is the process by which a group of people usually possessing a certain degree of national consciousness form their own state and choose their government. Mr. Speaker, it is now 2020 and we have come a long way. And Mr. Speaker, I wish to share some information of a young young male who was born in this territory, Mr. Speaker, to parents of this territory whose parents on both sides were and are from this territory. A young male who, Mr. Speaker, did not see himself as much. But what was instilled in him is principles and beliefs. He was raised to respect his elders, to honor God, and have love for his fellow men. At the age of 13, this young man had a decision to make or one would be made for him. He was failing out of high school and his mother said to him the decision is you either go to walk the ground with your grandfather or you go live with your aunt who at that time lived in Framingham, Massachusetts Mr. Speaker, the young boy at that time made a decision to go live with his aunt. But from the age that he could remember to 13 and a half when he left this territory, there is nothing about the territory of the Virgin Islands about his upbringing and the way in which he was raised and the people in which he encountered and had a part to play 
in his life that he ever forgot. Because as much as you could take someone from some place, you can't take what's inside of them out of them. Having graduated high school in Framingham, the young man moved to Miami, Florida to take a go at college, having a very bad attitude. He was accepted to college on a scholarship, on a track scholarship, but didn't run one day a track. Because the school that he came from in Framingham, Massachusetts, which was a predominantly white school, they had a track. And when he got to Miami, the coach told him to run on the road. And this conceited little fellow decided he wasn't running on the road because he cost him to run on the track. That young man lost his scholarship, Mr. Speaker and was forced for the first time in his life to pay attention to academics. Graduated from college, having the opportunity to work with Rider Systems Inc. Then with American International Group, which at the time was an $800 billion company. At 21, made more money than he could have ever imagined. At 23, becoming an associate manager with a staff of 16 who were all older than him. And then in 2005, he returned to his homeland of the Virgin Islands. And Mr. Speaker, that young man had a career where he worked for eight and a half years dealing with pensions and investments and money management, serving on boards and mentoring young people, sitting with the magistrates to determine alternative sentencing for young people who had come in problems with the law and whose job it was to help to de determine sentences that would not be custodial, which simply means, Mr. Speaker, not having our young men and young women with records on their names which would prohibit their advancement for the future. It was in 2013 that a question arrived, and for the first time, he understood what the difference between worth and value was. He asked his then boss, what am I worth to you? And then after he received the answer, he asked, what is my value to you? And Mr. Speaker, I think that is one of the biggest issues that we face in this territory. As a people, as a nation, not understanding the difference between your worth and value. Mr. Speaker, I would just use the definitions.
The word value is used to use in a sense of importance. On the other hand, the word worth is used to in a sense of cost of production. So in many ways, Mr. Speaker, your worth is what people pay you. What they feel that you deserve to earn for work performed. But Mr. Speaker, your value is something that nobody, no man, no woman, no boy or girl could put a price on. And in 2013, I understood what my value was. And at that time, I resigned from a job that was having a young family. Having a young family, Mr. Speaker. I think my daughter was three years old, making four at that time. And I resigned because I, my value, Mr. Speaker, didn't equate to how I was being treated. And I left that job to mentor young men and young women full time in a project called Project Lionheart. Not knowing where the money was coming from. Mr. Speaker, I want you to understand that at that time, my professional background was in finance and money management. I was going against all the principles of good and sound financial management and my teaching to go out and do something that my heart was leading me to do. But Mr. Speaker, more and above and beyond just my heart, it was something that I know as faith, which is having a belief not in a thing, not in an entity, having a belief, Mr. Speaker, in the God above that he would be able to take care of me once I was taking care of what he set for me to do. Two years after that, Mr. Speaker, I realized that Persons were calling on me because they were seeing works that were being done with young people and impacts that were being had with transforming the lives of young people and understanding their, their mindset, Mr. Speaker, because what I didn't tell you about this young man who is now revealed as me is in the time of that 2013 to 2005, this young man lived a life that most people don't know about. And I had experience with other young people in one of the toughest cities in Miami called Overtown, where crime and gang violence was on the rise. So the things that we were seeing here, Mr. Speaker, in 2005 going down to 2013, I had seen them prior from my time in Miami. But Mr. Speaker, one of the things that troubled me over that time, even while I was working with this firm, is that the mentality of our people, for the most part then, was one that was programmed 
to only go a certain way. Go to school, graduate, go to work, graduate, find a job that is going to pay you as least as possible and just be thankful that you have a job. Or go away to college, come back, wait on government. If they can't find a job for you, take whatever you can find. Or go and get your master's degree and all this additional training, but come back to work in the private sector and you still have to train persons to do their job and they still have the position over you. Mr. Speaker, the mentality of our people needs to be shifted. It needs to be broken so that we can have a sense of appreciation that where we started some 70 plus years ago to where we are now, there needs to be a greater appreciation. There needs to be a greater celebration for those giants, Mr. Speaker, on which shoulders we stand that came before us and paved the way for us. Because, Mr. Speaker, it wasn't anybody else that did it for us. It was a Virgin Island people with the help and dependency of God that started to trod that road that was never trod before. It was the determination of the Virgin Islands people, Mr. Speaker, that forged ahead to the unknown with the same faith that not only they deserve better, but they believe that they could be better. Mr. Speaker, I want to take from a paper that was done in 1998. And I want to start here. And the words say, Mr. Speaker, a BVI lander, a pragmatic, individualistic, and opportunistic people. These words were according to now Dr. Robert McTavius. He says, BBI Islanders are pragmatic, individualistic, and opportunistic people. Colonialism was an economic system. Colonialism was and still is an economic system. It was set up to benefit the metropole and not to benefit the colonies or the people of the colonies. That is an invariable system which we have inherited. What you will find, however, is that the British Virgin Islands always been pragmatic, opportunistic, and individualistic. We have always been able to take negative situations we have been given and work them to our own advantage. That has been the many history of our people of the BVI, and I think that the struggles and things can happen in the future. So you will find that our people have survived different systems, 
survived slavery, survived different oppressions. So our local history is characterized by a relationship with a met metropolitan government that can be characterized at best as benign neglect or as worst as passive indifference. What has happened, Mr. Speaker, is that the Virgin Islands have developed largely as a result of its people and their initiative and their ability to turn bad situations to good ones. For example, not too long, these islands were described at least valuable of Her Majesty's possessions overseas. Worse than that, Mr. Speaker, in 1959, early 1960, an economist advising the economy of the BVI concluded that the further, that the future was so bleak that it is best for the islands to be abandoned and left as a bird sanctuaries. And the people, to take the people and to put them elsewhere where they can better serve and have economic opportunities for them. So even in the face of ridicule, our people have been able to turn these situations around. And the results that we have a thriving economy, which is the much envy of the people. Ironically, a lot of this was developed because our people were pragmatic. Mr. Speaker, where were we? We were left. But the fortitude and the belief of our people forged ahead. To believe, Mr. Speaker, to trust and to hope and to build that we in these Virgin Islands could be better than where we were. Mr. Speaker, another part of a piece of information that I need us to understand as I as preachers will say, as I set this thing up, Mr. Speaker, the good Deacon, Deacon Vanderpool was, was on his path, Mr. Speaker, so now I'm on mine. I'm going back to the report that was submitted to the Constitutional Review Commission in 1993 by the League of British Virgin Islanders. And it reads, Mr. Speaker, our constitution, which, and these words will sound familiar, our constitution, which may be the last one before our people declare themselves ready to assume the benefits and burdens of a pre-advanced status should, if only as preparation for that status, according to them, the widest measure of self-government possible, returning to London, only basic oversights and responsibility. Mr. Speaker, this was in 1993. We do not wish for our Constitution to be a bloodless, lifeless, merely legislative document. It should be produced by a preamble expressing our ethics, hopes, and aspirations, reciting our history of slavery, servitude, deprivation, and neglect, and the divine intervention which delivers from those states of degradation, deprivation, and inhumanity. The Constitution should acknowledge the steadfast faith and persistence of our forefathers that enable them to survive and record our thanks to Almighty God for having given them and us the fortitude to life, to live life ourselves by our own bootstraps and present the state of prosperity and well-being. The Constitution should acknowledge 
that the sources of all government is the people to whom the government owes its existence and for whom it exists. Mr. Speaker, let me read that again. The Constitution should acknowledge that the source of all government is the people to whom the government owes its existence and for whom it exists and to whom it has the right to know at all times that they are being governed and all bases and decisions taken on their behalf. That they may be blessed by God with the bountiful natural resources, including our people, which are the source of our present prosperity, our environment, our land, our beaches, sea, air, which has no right to be abused, but which ha we have a duty as trustees thereof to conserve and preserve the enjoyment for the well-being of our children and children's children in perpetuity. The Constitution, Mr. Speaker, should also provide the preamble as well as provisions dealing with the environment, official integrity, and the conservation of our natural resources and culture to be interpreted by every branch of government, legislation, executive, and especially the judicial in light of the principle therein delivered. Mr. Speaker, Constitution Commission Notes of 1993. In 1993, coming out from 1976, and then to 2007, Mr. Speaker, I read the preamble of 2007. And I want to highlight why those things are of so much, such importance. in this discussion. Because, Mr. Speaker, while we as leaders have our role to play, The people, Mr. Speaker, continue to relinquish their power. And we, Mr. Speaker, as leaders, seem to forget that our power that we think we have is that of servitude to the people. But if we use our power Collectively, Mr. Speaker, if we use the power harnessed to the resources of our people and we go along with them, not just for this agenda or that agenda, but for the sole objective of the development and future development of this country, and the people and their children for future generations, Mr. Speaker, then the dreams and the visions that were cast by our forefathers and leaders before us will continue to be realigned. And new visions, Mr. Speaker, new dreams, new ideas will continue to be developed. So Mr. Speaker, we have been trained. And I grew up in an era, Mr. Speaker, I went to a historically black college and university, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things that you appreciate is not about having a sense of power or control over 
another race, but it helps you to appreciate and respect the power of who you are as a black person. It gives you the knowledge, Mr. Speaker, of where you came from, of the struggles that your forefathers went through, of the fights and the deaths and the bloods and the sweat and the tears and the rapes and the murders that your people endured so that you can have and we can have, Mr. Speaker, and exercise these freedoms and liberties that we have now that for a lot of us, Mr. Speaker, and for a lot of times, we take for granted. It's no different there in the United States than here in the Caribbean, Mr. Speaker. But here's the thing. We have not been teaching our people our heritage, our history, For the 13 years that I spent here, Mr. Speaker, before I was shipped off, I hear everything about Columbus. And when I heard it the first time, I didn't believe it. And I still don't believe it. And I believe the song now, Columbus lie, he so lie, he so lie, he so lie. Because you can't discover what done there. If you got people there, you ain't discover, you come there. But the Willie Lynch, Mr. Speaker, mentality is one that exists. And a particular part in that in that speech talks about how to break the Negro. So, Mr. Speaker, colonialism and it's a pretty word, isn't it? a pretty word with deadly meaning, because colonialism was a system intended to suppress, hold back, and restrict the growth, the prosperity, and anything positive coming out of a black people. A mechanism used to control, get productivity out of, earn money from, but the persons who were doing the work were never paid. Their reward, Mr. Speaker, were hangings and lynchings and drownings and beatings and rapes. Continuously, Mr. Speaker, but our people enjoyed that. Our forefathers enjoyed that. Mr. Speaker, I remember that story that was brought in this honorable house in the last house, Mr. Speaker, by the late Dolores Christopher who spoke about Arthur Hodge, a mango. A life was taken, Mr. Speaker, for a mango. But if we think that is so far removed from where we are in this present age, look again. Same crimes, Different methods, but who's the victim? Who continues to be the victim, Mr. Speaker? We are. We are being suppressed, Mr. Speaker. But we are being suppressed, and we have a part to play in it. And our part, Mr. Speaker, has everything to do with the acceptance and appreciation, the development and the knowledge and the learning and education 
for who we are and where we came from. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say this without apology. 70 years this year. This body, the legislative body, was formed in this territory. From a desire from men who felt the need that they were ready to control and be in charge of their own governance. Be responsible, Mr. Speaker, for their own well-being. And 70 years later, Mr. Speaker, I'm not talking about this edifice here in Save the Seed, but I'm talking about what do we have as an institution of the House of Assembly that will pay tribute to that 70 years, to those sacrifices. What do we have to show, Mr. Speaker, that we are appreciated, that we celebrate and we understand and we respect the sacrifices who were made then? Mr. Speaker, we have our part to play. Because things are good for everybody else except us. Because we, Mr. Speaker, as leaders, we subject and we subscribe to the notions that are cast on us. Well, some of us do. They call us crook, they call us thief, they call us all kind of thing. We call us scamp, whatever case may be. And we, Mr. Speaker, lose the will to do anything. to continue to build institutions and to continue to build up our people for fear of being categorized as this, that, or the other. But Mr. Speaker, did anybody come before us with a briefcase? As Honorable Vantable said, said, yeah. We don't, we, don't, we don't necessarily bow but it's like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anything they say is yes, because it's good. Mr. Speaker, we have to get back. And we have to continue that fight that our people, Mr. Speaker, that this territory, Mr. Speaker, I've said it to the past premier, I've said it to this premier, I've said it to any member, any governor, anywhere, any police commissioner, whomever, Mr. Speaker, or any key justice, anything or anyone that gets in the way of the people of the Virgin Islands or the territory of Virgin Islands is a problem for me. And once it's a problem for me, I come in after you. That's, it's just that simple for me, Mr. Speaker. Because in 2015, when I made the decision to seek political office to represent the people of this territory, and especially the second district, Mr. Speaker, I came with the intention to make a difference. Honorable Fraser always tell me, don't say it, but I'm going to say it now. And I gave myself, Mr. Speaker, a time limit. I give myself a time limit. I don't bend up tell me don't say it neither because he's been saying it and he can't go yet. But I told them, if I can't make a difference in this honorable house, in this country, from someone who came from this country, who've been given opportunities, who've been given sacrifices by my parents and all those who gave in and plugged into my life, if I can't make a difference in this country in 12 years, if the people have me for 12 years, I would have wasted my time in this. Because here's what, Mitch never wanted to be a politician. Never, ever. But I have a love for people. Servitude, Mr. Speaker, is in my blood. That's in my DNA. You look at my father from my grandfather. They say he used to have a store by Force Bank, Mento. They say he used to just give away clothes. Just give them away. 
You go on, my other grandfather said, my, my, my grandmother, Blanche, she used to cook for everybody. The premier, no, he used to be by a house. My mother and father, Mr. Speaker, that's what they do. They serve my brother, my wife, all of, we serve people. But what I don't intend to do, is be here and not making a difference, Mr. Speaker. I don't care about how long we've been doing it this way. If it ain't working, let me change it. And Mr. Speaker, one of the things that needs to change is our mentality. But how do you change a mentality? Why is it, Mr. Speaker, till this day and age, when you are in a setting, in a, sit, in a session for, for, for a government or official function, why is it, Mr. Speaker, that to this day in 2020, the premier of the country arrives, everybody sit down. The governor arrives, everybody got to get Why? No? I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it, Mr. Speaker. Nothing against the office or the individual in the seat of the governor, Mr. Speaker, but it's high time. Education of our history, yes, put the constitution in school, but yes, take out that foolishness, man, yeah, it's part of our history, but in the history, the Caribbean and the Iraq, that's part of it, but it's not it. Black people were kings and queens, and we still are. But we continue to let people subject us to being criminals and crooks. Mr. Speaker, nobody ain't gonna let you. You can call me when you want, but it's what you answer to. You could call me where you want, you could label me how you want. But why I answer to? I know who I am. I know my value, Mr. Speaker. And each and every Virgin Islander in this country should know their value and walk around with their heads high, Mr. Speaker. One of the things when I was training young people, I still try to do it sometimes. When you're talking to them, Mr. Speaker, even in high school, especially high school, you talk to a young man, a young lady, they, they bow their head and they talk to you under the breath. We have to start teaching our children to have confidence. Say what your name is. Say what you want to be. Don't, don't second guess yourself. Because what you want to be is what you want to be. Don't let another, no other person to deter you from what you want to be, Mr. Speaker. And there is no reason. Because in this document, Mr. Speaker, in this research paper, in 1998, there were 250,000 IBCs. Now we brag of over 600,000 in the financial companies. From 1998 to now, Mr. Speaker, that's progress. That's progress done by us without any or little or no, and I will go lean more to the no, help from anybody else. So, Mr. Speaker, what we talk about Reviewing the Constitution, we need to review the foundation. And not the foundation needs, not that the foundation needs to be rewritten. Mr. Speaker, it just needs to be put in plain sight. It needs to be instilled. It needs to be promoted. It needs to be projected. I take time, Mr. Speaker, and I love when Facebook pops up memories because I love to reflect on my daughter when she was young. And about two weeks ago, a memory came up. I was teaching her to ride a bike with training wheels. 
And the excitement in her face was one that she just wanted to pedal. She just wanted to go. And I said, baby girl, turn the wheel. It wasn't 10 seconds later, Mr. Speaker, that that little girl pedaled that bike and she started to sing, turn the wheel, turn the wheel, turn the wheel, turn the wheel, and then she hit into a rock, she said, oops. That was significant for me because even when she hit a rock, she knew her father was there. She knew that somebody was there to help her, Mr. Speaker. And that's where this constitutional review comes in. Because we've been helping ourselves, because we've been doing it ourselves, all this time, Mr. Speaker, the strength, the power is in it when we stand together and continue to do it ourselves. I don't have nothing against the UK, I don't have nothing against the governor, I don't have nothing against nobody, Mr. Speaker. But what I have a problem with is that every step of the way, and I can focus on financial services because that's my background. Well, finances. We didn't have nothing. The economic, the economic opportunities was for about century. We appreciated at that time tourism. Had the guts to go into the IBC's international business companies. That started to work and it's been working for over 30 plus years. When everyone else thought it was the bad decision. When everyone else thought it was the wrong decision. And it wouldn't work because we were too small. Mr. Speaker, now the Virgin Islands is the envy. Not of some countries. Of the world. And here's the thing. Here's the kicker for me. This is why I pray so, so much on the RDA. Let me go there now. Because I'm going to talk. How is it that the UK, Mr. Speaker, whom we are still not independent from, after this whole country, five of our people whom lost their lives in the storm, and a few hundred after we have not received grant aid of any sort historian help me 1970 I think the, the, the year was Idiot. And we are quote unquote on our back. 1970. We are quote unquote on our backs after the devastations of 2017, the floods, Alma Maria. After sending this big ship with body bag. After criticizing a hundred million dollar hospital. But before that, let me go back a little bit further. Because I said the other day, Mr. Speaker, long ago, I gotta say young long ago, relatively sitting next to Honorable Freezer because you gonna say I just come. <laughs> but long ago in my 40 years of living, Mr. Speaker, 
I remember when people would come to this country and visit. And, hey, this is a good place to come back to. I'd like to visit again. Then they start, hey, how do you get a piece of land? And then they get a piece of land. And then they put up the privacy sign. And then you can't go to the beach in your own country. But these, Mr. Speaker, I remember how it stumbled. That's a family member of mine. Twenty seventeen, we went through the worst. Before twenty seventeen, there were attacks from the French, from the Dutch, from the whomever you can talk about on financial services. Black list here, black list there, gray list there, purple list there, everywhere. Because they wanted us. We were doing too well. How is it that this little nation? continues to do so well. It must be corruption. It must be this. It must be that. Mr. Speaker, in 2015, the past premier, Dr. D. Orlando Speak, gave me the opportunity to go to the UK with him. I, I will say this for a longer in his house. Gave me the opportunity to go with him to the Joint Ministerial Conference. Zimit, you got some knowledge in finance. I want you to see how this thing works. Now I, I was excited. I'm going to the UK. But Mr. Speaker, one of the things I never dealt with well, and one of the things I don't deal with well, is disrespect. Because I am a man. I am a man who knows who I am, a man who knows my value, and know where I come from. We go into this meeting, Mr. Speaker, with the leaders from other overseas territories to sit down to have a discussion on things agreed on by those leaders. Mr. Speaker, the first thing that happened, and I'm not going to call a country's name, two of them, but from an agreement that was made by the leaders, these are the things that their people sent them to do and they agreed upon it. By the time the meeting started, two of them jumped out said they may not agree with it, what the rest of them are agreeing with. So they went pulling for their own thing. And Mr. Speaker, that was the first sign for me that that meeting over those 10 days that we were in the UK was not going to go well. In my ignorance, the governor who sits here, Mr. Speaker, in the BVI, to represent Her Majesty the Queen here in this territory, I was expecting that. I didn't know how the thing was. I expecting that I behind the premier. Um, the premier had his form and the secretary, some other people with some legal people, some consultants. So I expect the governor to come in. He gonna sit down with me? No. He sat with his counterparts. And when our premier at that time, Mr. Speaker, made inferences to things that we were pushing for as a territory of the Virgin Islands, the government didn't bat an eye. But the thing that broke it for me, Mr. Speaker, the incident that broke it for me, we were sitting before a minister of the UK Parliament. I wasn't at the table, I was in the back. I was fresh. But I was paying attention. And a question came up that the overseas territories wanted this and they had this position. And a little back and forth happened because that's part of it, Mr. Speaker. A little back and forth started to ensue. Mr. Speaker, less than five minutes, the UK minister get up and say he's not entertaining anything else and walk out and told us to talk to his staff. Well, not us, but I was there, so us. And Mr. Speaker, Honorable Vanterpool is he's doing his best. 
for the time he has left. Trying to teach me how to be uh, diplomatic. That's why I don't tolerate foolishness. You disrespect my premier. You disrespect the country and the people of Virginia. I have a problem with you. I have a problem with you because this is a meeting schedule. We were, come, we, we were invited there to come and make our, our, our representation, Mr. Speaker. And if this premier don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But I understand, Mr. Speaker, that in 2020, we have come too far as a people. We have come too far as a territory. We have developed too much. We have educated and we have propelled, Mr. Speaker, this nation from nothing to where it is now with the help of God and our people. And we don't have a right. We don't deserve the disrespect from anybody. I don't care where they come from and who they think they are. Because while some of them are appointed, Mr. Speaker, we went through the process of being elected by the people. And when this premier or any other premier, Mr. Speaker, leaves this territory to represent the Virgin Islands, he or she or whomever it is should stand straight up with their head high and their back erect and speak on behalf of the people. And if we get it with disrespect, tell the people. I don't care who it is. Twenty sixteen, Mr. Speaker. I was invited again by the then premier. But I said to him, I said, Premier, um, what I don't want to do this time around is going to the meeting with you and the same thing happened because they know you, they don't know me. And I'm going to tell them something. He said, Mitch, there's certain things you have, yes, I'm like Mac, I'm a preventable, sorry. Certain things you have to understand, you know, I have to give and take and you can mash up my foot once. If you mash it again, I know you mean it. And we have a right to represent the concerns of our people. We have a right to also let our people know when the things that we are trying to advance on their behalf is being shut down. Because what I don't understand, Mr. Speaker, come back to 2017, is that the financial services industry which we have, which is part of our twin pillar, Mr. Speaker, that helps us to move from strength to strength. How is it that that was the very thing in 2017 that you come and say, take out this $300 million or $300 million pound loan, not a grant, and then we're going to be responsible for paying it back. But they have oversight on who supposed to be where. And I suppose I agree with that. Me. Mr. Speaker, what's that wrong? Can and right. Because you were telling me at that time, To cripple the very thing that was driving and sustaining me for a loan that you ain't helping me pay, and then quantify contributions to this territory in resources and support. And listen to me. I will burn, I think my mother said I will burn in a night. But I don't think it will last me. Mr. Speaker, on one hand, you're telling me you're supporting me. But you're waiting for me to fall. So you could cripple me. I don't care who interpreted what way. Mr. Speaker, that's the way I cite. That's the way I see it. Because 
the, we, we went from the hurricanes, we went to this bus because here was another system. And Mr. Speaker, one thing, one more thing I forget, 2016, in one of the meetings that I did go to, that's where the whole search register and um, what's the other one for status? What was what that one called? Beneficial ownership and there's other one where we have to hire all these people. Substance, economic substance. That one was coming up, Mr. Speaker, because I was reviewing it and they gave us this rate sheet. It had about 11 items that they wanted us to comply with, which was industry standard on the international stage, Mr. Speaker. And me, and I have to call his name on this one, Mr. Benito Whitley, a brilliant young man, Mr. Speaker, one who I respect. I respect his brother too. But in this instance, Mr. Whitley, they're my friend. Classmate. Mr. Speaker, there were 11 items. I will never forget it. You guys still have it in the office. There were 11 categories of areas of compliance that the international standards regulators were looking for territories to have in relation to beneficial ownership and economic substance so that we are not blacklisted, grey listed, purple listed, green listed, whoever list. Mr. Speaker, I gone looking now to see the paper was about it was a little thick paper, so I go into these countries and these territories. I get to the BVI, I see check, 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 skip one, skip two, check, check, check. That's eight out of eleven. So some says stupid Mitch, go to the UK now. Eleven BVI check eight out of the eleven requirements. UK had four. And we, Mr. Speaker, were being targeted and continue to be targeted on every front. You talk about a can kicking on the road? No, this ain't a can. The goalpost. And the goalposts keep moving. And moving, Mr. Speaker. And this constitution that we agree to now, I, I, I am not in any way, Mr. Speaker, criticizing the members that participated in the last constitutional review that got us to 2007. What I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, is that the things therein that lie in the 2007 constitution seem that we can only point out what elected members, ministers, and the premier are not doing according to the Constitution. But what we have not done well is highlighted the things in the Constitution that the UK and their representatives are not adhering to. And Mr. Speaker, those are items that I believe are important to our development. Mr. Speaker, I ask my honorable colleague to let me know when I reach a certain point. Oh, he hasn't indicated yet, so I will, I will keep going. Look like he forgot. That's good, that's good either way. Mr. Speaker, Les Brown said this. Les Brown said, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless without it, worthless without it, if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose your terror, of the 
of the opposition for it, if you simply go after it, that thing that you want, with all your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence, and stern personality, for tenacity, if neither cold, poverty, famine, nor gout, sickness, nor pain, or body or brain can keep you away from that thing that you want. If dog and grim you beseech and beset it with the help of God, you will get it. Mr. Speaker, we have to want better for ourselves. And we have to not just want it, Mr. Speaker, we have to demand it. And in demanded, Mr. Speaker, we have to bring the people along with us to help lead the charge of where we need to see this country go. Yes, there are preferences, Mr. Speaker, but I don't ever believe you might have a preference, Mr. Speaker, and I have one too. But preference never overrides principle. And the principle, the number one principle, is to represent to the best of our abilities the thoughts, needs, ideas, and ideals of what we would want this Virgin Islands to look like. Mr. Speaker, in this territory, you look at the past budgets, from then to now, if you pay attention to, Mr. Speaker, the accomplishments that have been achieved in this territory by our people, in the industries of banking and finance. Our people are owners of businesses, Mr. Speaker, property, land, schools, in the marine field, pilots. Some of them even own planes, medical and dental facilities, construction, concrete carpeting, beauty supply, barbershops, bars, restaurants, creative and innovative businesses, laundromats, ferries, hotels, farming and fishing industry, real estate, Mr. Speaker, the technology, clothing, boating, churches, security. We have developed a pair pack, a hospital, gas stations, car rentals. Mr. Speaker, why? If all these things have been accomplished every single time, that we have reviewed and renewed our Constitution, that we can't see, Mr. Speaker, and appreciate that our country and its people continue to advance. Not just politically, Mr. Speaker, but our people move forward. And Mr. Speaker, the word self-determination, if I go back there, is important because we have already been determining where our destiny needs to be. What now needs to change, Mr. Speaker, is the historical foundation for which we seek to accomplish whatever our destiny would be. I believe, Mr. Speaker, in the thoughts of the Honorable Fraser and Honorable Vanderpool, that we just not talk about it. But you put a timeline, you set a target to it. Because without the target, Mr. Speaker, 13 years will elapse. And all the things in this world that are happening, Mr. Speaker, it is difficult if we don't use the power of now, the urgency, Mr. Speaker, of now. then we would have failed and missed a grand opportunity. And I don't believe, Mr. Speaker, that any of the 13 of us, including yourself and the Honorable AG, Mr. Speaker, are willing 
to make that mistake. I think all of us, Mr. Speaker, and I believe wholeheartedly that all of us are here to advance this territory. Mr. Speaker, when you look at the education and the cultural aspect, because the preamble in the 2007 Constitution talks about the culture. And my late honorable colleague and mentor and friend and auntie, Diaz Acada, and then I have another sweet lady who just made 90 this past since, who are cultural icons, Mr. Speaker. Why is it that we are not promoting, continuing to preserve our culture? And if I may say so, Mr. Speaker, not forcing people to accept our culture, Mr. Speaker, but forcing them to respect our culture. Because while it is okay to be embracing and embracing and appreciate those persons from other countries and island states that came to live among us and help to build this territory to what it is, Mr. Speaker, we can't continue to change who we are to be embracing, then we lose the very fabric. People like Elmo Stout, teacher Jenny Whitley, and some old men and old women in my district and throughout the East End and throughout this territory, Mr. Speaker, that we harness the culture of what it means to be a Virgin Islander. Mr. Speaker, I embrace and I love all people. I love all persons that have come to this territory, have came to this territory to help to develop and to build it where it is. But Mr. Speaker, there is a vast difference that if you continue to accept and transform who you are to coincide with those that have come among you, not promoting or preserving your own culture, Mr. Speaker, you will lose it. So your culture and our culture is the way that we live. Mr. Speaker, I asked in 2015, I remember it was a caucus meeting, the room went silent. I asked the then premier because he was chairing the meeting the ministers and other members who were there at that time, a very significant question, and I ask it to the Honorable Premier since he has been elected as Premier with his government. The question was, Mr. Speaker, what are we going to do as lawmakers, as leaders, to preserve, promote, and set aside for the indigenous Virgin Islander. And Mr. Speaker, I asked that question then without apology, and I'm asking it again now. It's okay to say that something needs to be done, but while we continue to say that something needs to be done, Mr. Speaker, we continue to make laws and continue to expand The privileges given to other persons. And Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that a privilege should ever be confused with a right.
being a Virgin Islander, specifically an indigenous Virgin Islander, is a right. There are rights that should be and must be afforded to Virgin Islanders. The privilege that you have is the things that you would get to endure, like your belongership and the other things that come, your ability to own land, Mr. Speaker. But I believe the preservation, Mr. Speaker, of who we are as a people should not be mistaken from a right to a privilege. We should consider carefully, Mr. Speaker, that in their wisdom, Our forefathers and those honorable men and women that came before us decided to set out, if I look at this constitution, this 55 or 56 page document, if we include one of the attached pages, Mr. Speaker, the only one thing that I see in there for the indigenous Virgin Elena is our ability to hold this office. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I would not make any apologies for it. I accept. I accept those who have come to live among us. I accept those who continue to build this country, Mr. Speaker, but the preservation. And that's the one thing, Mr. Speaker. But there are so many other things that we can do and we should do, Mr. Speaker. Right now, land is, is being sold. Dime a dozen. Everybody's selling land. But go back, Mr. Speaker, to the foundation of it. Our forefathers, our grand, my grandparents and, and great-grandparents, they had no heap of money. They had no physical cash, Mr. Speaker. But what they had was land. And we are selling our land and giving away our land. While it is important for development, Mr. Speaker, it's also important that we preserve what we have. To keep it for generations, because yes, Mr. Speaker, it is important that we afford those benefits and privileges to those who have come to live among us. The ability to vote, the ability to own land, the ability to not have to pay certain fees, Mr. Speaker, and have the rights and privileges as any other Virgin Islander, Mr. Speaker, but what is significant is that we not just give it all away to be accepting. Because if you keep building up one side and only talking about what you're going to do for the preservation of your culture and your people, your indigenous people, eventually you're going to look out and realize that the things that we held as principles, because I went back to the 1976 and the 2007 Mr. Speaker Constitution and I read them for a reason. One of the things that we seeming to lose sight of is that faith that was talked about in 1976. That faith and that belief 
in God that was talked in, about in that paper that I wrote from the 1993 um, committee and even in our very constitution which talks about our faith. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Every right, one has a right to their own beliefs. And I'm reminded of this old story that a man who never went to church, he asked a church goer, like Honorable Vanterpool, you know, what do you believe? The man said, I believe what my pastor believe. He said, what does your pastor believe? He says, my pastor believes what the bishop believes. He said, what does your bishop believe? My bishop believes what the, con the convention believes. What the convention believes? He says, I don't know, I haven't been. Our principles, Mr. Speaker. We have to know who we are. And once you know who you are, once you understand where you came from, no one can take that from you. But it can't be washed down. It can't be sidelined. It can't be watered down to be accepting because you don't want to seem offensive. This is because that's what gets us to where we are. It went before financial services, before tourism, before everything else. There was a foundation. There's an old lady in the East now. I don't know. Honorable Penn, you're going to have to forgive me on this one, whether it is Eastern or Long. Look. But there's an old lady, pastor. She, she ain't old. By the name of Mother Pata. And every now and again, she'll call me and she'll say, I just need two minutes. And when we're done, we're on the phone for half an hour. And she said, I can't leave you now. And she gave me another 15 minutes. And these are persons, Mr. Speaker, that continue, continue to keep us holding to the foundation of God. That's a very important aspect, Mr. Speaker, of our constitution, of our advancement, remembering the foundation and building on the foundation. Never losing sight. Of the importance. And then another important thing, Mr. Speaker, is us respecting and having love for one another. We said after Omar and Maria, then we went crazy. COVID come. We said again, Mr. Speaker, you know why it keeps coming back around? You know why it keeps coming? You know why it can show itself? This is because, because that's who we are as a people. We are loving, caring, nurturing people, but we are also prideful people who will not accept any less than the best. That's a Virgin Island, Mr. Speaker. When I listen to persons in my community, and I love being around the seniors, Mr. Speaker, because you, you gain so much historical knowledge and even principles that can be alive, uh, applied to your life now about how they came and overcame difficult situations. And Mr. Speaker, those are the things. Those are the things that the persons in the UK and the powers that be need to be reminded of. I, that document, Mr. Speaker, from 1993, from that committee, remind them because what's easy to say, Mr. Speaker, yeah, we already been over that. Slavery no longer exists. You know, colonialism was a thing of the past. It has transformed into something else. Same thing. I like Jay-Z, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if I like him so much now. I like the old Jay-Z. Jay-Z's song says... And Mr. Speaker, I'll abbreviate for parliamentary purposes. It says, House Negro, feel Negro, still Negro. 
no matter what you do, Mr. Speaker, in certain persons' minds, you can never rise above the bar that they have set for you. But I want to crush that thought, Mr. Speaker, and let all people know that from conventions and the conventional way of doing things. Honorable Fraser talked about when he was in New York wanting to be like the black um, architect. Honorable Van Der Poel. Where are you for shopping in the food bowl? Where are you for shopping in? Fruit and vegetable basket. You thought you would have had no one mat today? And be our servant of Bullhan? And continue to serve people. Honorable Fraser, when you came back, this is only what you told me, so you, you correct me. When you came back, you saw a blank canvas for development of what this country could look like. And I know, sir, that you have designed so many homes and buildings for people here in this territory. Mr. Speaker, that's us. You sitting up there, Mr. Speaker. I don't like the wig you have. I'll tell you that. I don't like the wig. I don't. But you sitting up there, Mr. Speaker, as the Speaker of this Honorable House, The Constitution. <laughs> we have advanced, Mr. Speaker, and we continue to advance against our laws. So every time that there has been a constitutional review, the people of the Virgin Islands rise high. Rise with the tide. Rise with the tide. And our people know that the limits and the boundaries that were set before. We continue to raise the bar, Mr. Speaker. And we continue to blow the minds of those persons that want to keep us confined and constrained. And even when the attacks come, Mr. Speaker, it is the hand of Almighty God that preserves us. Mr. Speaker, I'm coming to the end. I see the Honorable Deputy Speaker watching. I know he's hungry. And I would usually rise around this time and appoint a privilege but I think I got a half an hour or so left. Mr. Speaker, I want to do something that it's been in my mind to do from 2015 when I first got elected. And I believe it is absolutely important to do it now in this debate. Mr. Speaker, in the actual building where the House of Assembly would sit, there are men and women that some deceased and some still living that their pictures are over our heads in that hallowed house. And Mr. Speaker, that young man that I started talking about in my wildest dream, I never would have thought that I would be in the position where I am to be a leader, a servant leader to the people of the second district. And in this honorable house, making decisions for the advancements of this territory and these people. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to take the time to acknowledge and recognize and call into the record, Mr. Speaker, the names of the past members over the last 70 years that paved the way for that little boy from King Adamby who then grew up in Mayors. 
to stand here today. Mr. Speaker John Charles Bruce, Howard Reynold Penn, OBE, Benjamin Rubney, Captain Carlton Leslie De Castro, OBE, Glanville Fonseca, Sir Oliver Georges, OBE, Dr. McWillington Todman, CBE, QC, Theodore Faulkner, Edwin Harris Leonard, Wilfred Wilson Smith, Leslie Malone, Joseph O'Neill, Waldo O'Neill, Hamilton Laverty Stout, Ivan Dawson, CBE, Dr. Q.W. Osborne, OBE, Arnando Scatliff, Terence B. Letsom, H. Robinson O'Neill, Leopold Smith, Willard Whitley, MBE, Ralph T. O'Neill, OBE, Oliver Sills, Conrad Maduro, Real George, Alvin U. Anthony, Austin Henley, Prince Stout, Cyril B. Romney, Omar Wallace Hodge, E. Walwyn Bruley, Earl P. Fraser, C. Lewis Walters, N.B., Alred Fred, Andre Penn, Angel Smith, J. Alvin Christopher, Ethlyn Smith, Eileen L. Parsons, OBE, Dr. D. Orlando Smith, OBE, Dr. Kedrick Pickering, Ronnie W. Skelton, Julian Fraser, Andrew Foy, Lloyd Black, Mark Vanterpool, Paul P. Watley, Elmore Stout, Dolores Christopher, Dancia Penn Sala, OBE QC, Irene Penn O'Neill, Vernon E. Malone, QPM, Keith Flax, Elvis Harrigan, Dr. Vincent Scatliff, Myron Walwyn, Archibald Crystal, Christian, Alvar Maduro Keynes, Marlon Penn, Dr. Hubert O'Neill, and yours truly, Melvin Mitch Turnbull. Mr. Speaker, and let's, I, I said him first. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I stand humbled to these men and women that have given sacrificially, that have paved the way for me to be here, for Honorable Shari De Castro to be here, Neville Smith, Carvin Malone, Kai Rima, Vincent Whitley, Natalia Whitley, Shireen Flax Charles, and Andrew Foy. Because, Mr. Speaker, you would never know the struggles that we all face. But, Mr. Speaker, what I do know, 
and I believe, is that as a people of the Virgin Islands, the names that I've called in this folder pave the way so that I can keep walking the path. And as we move to advance our Constitution, as we move to advance the rights for us to be leaders, not just in the sense of the word, but the powers that belong to us, be returned to us in this constitutional process, Mr. Speaker. May we continue and lean on the strengths of those that came before us, on the wisdom, faith, and tenacity that is given in strength from Almighty God. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, will we put our minds, our hearts, and our souls together to determine where it is we want to go, agree with where we want to go, and ban Mr. Speaker and lock shoulders to take this country to the next step for the next 70 years. That when our names, Mr. Speaker, are edged in history, those that come after us would be proud that we were bold enough, that we were courageous enough to not be intimidated, but to stand erect, to not cower or bow to any master, but determine that we were left to be abandoned. We made it and we will forge ahead because this Virgin Island, Mr. Speaker, is one that is blessed of God. The people that are unapologetic and prideful in what we want to achieve. And Mr. Speaker, I believe and I pronounce it that we will achieve what is in the best interest of this country for not only now, for generations yet to come. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honorable Turnbull for his contribution to the debate. All the members will break now for lunch and will return to the chambers at 5 p.m. This Honorable House is now on recess. <laughs>
This honorable house resume is sitting. We will continue the debate. I call on the Honorable Attorney General. before this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, I cannot match the eloquence of members of this honorable house in dealing with the subject. I think it would have been, I would have been content to sit down and not express any views due to the exhaustive coverage given to the topic by honorable members. However, the lawyer in me does not permit me to sit and not say or express a few words on the Constitution and a constitutional review. Currently, we have a Constitution which is the fundamental law of this country. And it is that Constitution which is the Virgin Island Constitution Order 2007 which is proposed for review. Mr. Speaker, I need to put our Constitution in context so that members would appreciate the task that we have on this motion. First of all, if anyone opens the Virgin Island Constitution order, one would realize that it has been enacted pursuant to the West Indies Act, 1962. Our constitution is a subsidiary legislation made pursuant to an act of parliament, which is the 1962 West Indies Act. And it will be important for me to just read what, what section five of that act says. Mr. Speaker, it is expressed in these terms, Her Majesty may by order in council make such provision as appear to her expedient for the government of any of the colonies to which this section applies, and for that purpose may provide for the establishment for the colony of such authorities as she thinks expedient, and may empower such of them as may be specified in the order to make laws either generally for the peace, order, and good government of the colony or for such limited purposes as may be so specified, subject, however, to the reservation to herself of power to make laws for the colony for such, if any purposes, as may be so specified. So this is the starting point. And for that matter, the Act of Parliament sits at the apex, and then our law fall below that. So even though it is our fundamental constitutional document, in the hierarchy of laws, the English Act 
is the superior document. And more importantly, if one was to look at section 7 of that, of that act, it states in subsection 72, any power conferred by this act to make an order in council shall be construed as including power to vary or revoke the order in council by a subsequent order in council. So that this is the milieu of our constitutional setting. So, Mr. Speaker, if one reads these sections carefully, and having read a number of judicial decisions, which I have been, I've had the privilege of reading, there are two things that are necessary with, with respect to this constitutional uh, revision or uh, 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 Constitutional Review Commission. One, the Virgin Islands must have a clear vision as to what it seeks to do. It's a clear vision. And if you, there is a clear vision as to what the Virgin Islands wants to do, what is the time period that you want to achieve that vision? Is that vision going to be carried out within the current constitutional context? That is, the Parliament of England has the last say or you have to chart a different course. Those are the two options that are available at a practical, legal level. But, Mr. Speaker, I have read from one English judge of notability who says, that the law is not always suitable for the resolution of all human problems. Compromise sometimes is the way to do it because there is flexibility in operating with compromise. If you go through strict legal positions, there are normally winners and there are losers. But if you use the political machinery, sometimes you have better outcomes than if you go strictly legal. So, what is available in our discussion here is an articulation of a clearer vision. Where are we going? Are we all going to operate within the constitutional setting that we have in the manner that it is structured based upon the West Indies Act, which is an act of the English Parliament. I say so because all the independent constitutions from Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, from India, Ghana in 57, Jamaica and Trinidad in 62, Barbados in 66, you would find in their independent constitutions express provisions that the United Kingdom can no longer legislate for them. Again, a statute of antiquity is the Colonial Laws Validity Act of 1865. In those constitutions as well, you will find out that they no longer apply to territories which have independence. But to the extent that this system operates where the English parliament is supreme, you, you have to work within it, if you are within it. If you are not within it, then you are outside it. So that is what I would want to say when we are considering all these things. These are some of the 
things that we should take into consideration and look at what is our vision, where are we going? Are we going to stay with autonomy and ask for more autonomy within the current system or a different path to development? Mr. Speaker, with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable AG, for that very informative contribution. I now call on the Leader of Opposition, the Honorable Marlon Pinn. Thank you. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, please, please be seated. I call on the opposition leader, Honorable Malapin, to speak. Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Education asks to speak, and I, I yield to him, and I'll speak after him, if you don't mind. Honorable Wheatley. Mr. Speaker, um, I have no preference whether I speak now or speak after the opposition leader, so. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and give my contribution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate what the Honorable Attorney General uh, just laid out. And given what he said, I want to make it clear I'm going beyond the West Indies Act. I'm going beyond the powers of the United Kingdom Parliament. I'm certainly going a bit broader. We are all a part of a human family, Mr. Speaker. And there is something that has transpired in human history called colonialism. And slavery, which the United Nations has declared as crimes against humanity. And certainly, Honorable A.G., my learned friend, I know that you can perhaps do a whole dissertation on international law as it pertains to colonialism and slavery. Mr. Speaker, this is a very positive exercise that we are going through right now. And coming near the end, almost at the end, I believe it is just the leader of the opposition to speak and then the premier to wrap up, I would say, well, what will my role be to this debate? I've listened to when the Premier opened up, Mr. Speaker, followed by the senior member of the House, Honorable Julian Fraser. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that they gave a master class as it pertains to our context here in the Virgin Islands as it pertains to uh, constitutional development, as well as specifically some of the practical matters that a constitutional review should address. I am apologetic that I had to leave at some point when the member for the third district was speaking. 
uh, because he was hitting some very heavy points, Mr. Speaker. And um, I would have to say, even though they're now on two different sides of the aisle that the Premier and the Honorable Member for the Third are a good team, they've been here for a long time. And I was very conscious of the fact, Mr. Speaker, that I would not speak before the member of the third. Um, of course, the premier opens up the entire debate. But when you are new to the house, you need to sit and you need to listen and you need to show the appropriate respect to those who have sat in this house. They deserve that type of respect. And others gave their contribution, Mr. Speaker, and really said, really all that really needs to be said. So I'm not going to speak for a very, very long time, Mr. Speaker. Um, through the admonition of the member for the third district, I'm just going to strengthen some areas that have already been mentioned, just add my voice and my strength uh, to those particular areas. And really say really what is in my heart to say about constitutional development. It's something that's very important to me, Mr. Speaker. I've always had a real passion for freedom, for equality, for justice. I went away to school and I joined political parties. I was involved in protests. I held picket signs. I, I held the loudspeakers. I led marches. I wrote my dissertation on race, class, and resistance. It's something that's very close to my heart, Mr. Speaker. I would say it's part of the purpose of why I am here on the art, to fight for freedom and for justice. And we are really having this debate at an appropriate time, I would say, from a historic perspective. Uh, as we've been saying a lot, 70 years ago, in July, I learned that from listening to the Premier's opening. In July in 1950, we got a new constitution. So it's almost 70 years to the day where we're having discussions about a new constitution. And like you, Mr. Speaker, the words of Honorable Fraser, the member for the third district, haunted me when those who passed before us, who fought so hard to get us to where we are today, if we were to have a conversation with them, what is it that would really say that we contributed to the effort? Not just in terms of symbolism, but what real advancement? If I had to speak with my grandfather, Honorable Dr. Willard Wheatley, who became the first Minister of Finance, oh, what an advancement. What progress for our people. What would I say to him? And I take it, yes, this is a privilege. In fact, even more than a privilege, I would say, it's a heavy responsibility that I take very seriously, Mr. Speaker, because these constitutional reviews don't come along often. I mean, the member for the third district spoke about it, and perhaps maybe some persons in the public may not completely have understood when he spoke about 
getting here again to do this again. Because before 2007, the one before that was 1976. Of course, we had some amendments in the middle that allowed for, you know, things like territorial at large members. Of course, we have junior ministers, etc. But to get a new constitution, that is a big deal. That's no small thing, Mr. Speaker. So it's a heavy responsibility. And it comes at a very interesting time. We are about to pend in, of course, a storm, um, celebrate our emancipation from slavery. And there are some persons out there, Mr. Speaker, who are saying, if we're not going to have the jump up, let's cancel. If we're not going to have the wind up, let's just forget the whole thing. I have to say, I am a laid back individual. I'm cool, I'm calm, I'm collected. But I have to say, without a shadow of a doubt, Mr. Speaker, I'm actually offended by those views. I'm offended on behalf of my ancestors. Because our festival celebrations have been reduced to just a jump up, a prance up, a have a good time, a make some money. I don't mind persons make money, Mr. Speaker. I don't mind we have a good time. But if anything we're going to do, while I am the minister, and I have one under my belt, where I was able to see what went wrong at one, and what went right. And I can tell you I'm not going to leave it to chance. As long as I sit at the seat as the minister, you could bet your bottom dollar, Mr. Speaker, we're going to acknowledge the struggles of our ancestors. You, 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 you can count on that. If anything we do, I don't care if we have a Marshall Montano, a Popcorn, a this or that. If anything we're going to do, we're going to acknowledge the struggles of our ancestors. Mr. Speaker, we had a resolution on the order paper that was subsequently taken off. Oh, beautiful Virgin Islands, we're going to replace the UK national anthem at our sporting games, whether it be the Olympics, the Pan Am Games, the World Championships. If our people win a medal, Instead of the UK national anthem being played, we're going to play Oh, Beautiful Virgin Islands. And that's important to what it is we're talking about right now. I just want to read one verse of this. And let me just say, the territorial song that's a good thing. And the words of the territorial song, they're words that we need to meditate on. The member for the ninth district always says he doesn't like when they remove the third verse. Listen to the power of that third verse. May God richly bless this territory. May we ask three things of thee.
courage for our great leaders. And Mr. Speaker, as we go into these constitutional talks, and as we fight some of these battles that we are about to fight and we, and we are currently fighting, we need courage. Courage for our great leaders that they may rule our destiny. Buju Banton has a song, I want to rule my destiny. And when you're thinking about slavery, when you're thinking about colonialism, what it is you're ultimately fighting for. You wasn't fighting just to get off the plantations, you know, Mr. Speaker. Because we can farm the land for ourselves. But who are you farming for? The key, we have to put it in context what we're fighting for. We're not just fighting for fighting's sake. Mr. Speaker, we want to rule our destiny. We ask for wisdom for our people that we may live in harmony, regardless of the political party you're part of, regardless of what area of the BVI you live in, what area Tatola, Vajingara, and you got a Jasper Dyke, regardless of whether you are a woman or a man, regardless of whether you are making a particular amount of money, regardless of whether you're from the private or the public sector, we ask for wisdom for our people that we may live in harmony and understanding for our children. Understanding for our children. And we've been speaking at graduations, Mr. Speaker. And as the children sit there, of course, they just want to get through the graduation exercise. They don't want too many long speeches. You know, they want to receive their diplomas. They want to take their pictures. They want to celebrate. But we have been conscious of the fact that when we speak, we want to give some understanding for our children. Member for the 9th District spoke to them about Ralph T. O'Neill, Honorable Ralph T. O'Neill of blessed memory, who built Brigado Flax Secondary School. And when you listen to the story, member for the 9th District recounts it, that Honorable Ralph T. O'Neill had to trick the British to get the school there. And that's a perfect example of what ruling your destiny does, Mr. Speaker. Because the British would not have built that school. We built it. And there's a difference between when Britain rules and when we rule, Mr. Speaker, understanding for our children so they may cherish this legacy. Mr. Speaker, I want to say before I go any further that I do not dislike the United Kingdom. I do not dislike the British, Mr. Speaker. I tell you like how some of those Caucasian persons respond when somebody tells them they're racist. I have lots of British friends. I have so many British friends, Mr. Speaker. Persons who have been so nice to me. And I'm nice to them, Mr. Speaker. I love humanity. I'm not capable of oppressing a soul, Mr. Speaker. I was in the United Kingdom. I live with a family. Lovely individuals. And let me say this, Mr. Speaker. Let me say this. There were many persons in Britain who were against slavery. Yeah? There were persons who were abolitionists. They were fighting 
against slavery. There are persons right now who are against the actions of the United Kingdom government that they perceive to be harmful to the world. All English persons are not the same. But there's something that the United Kingdom has to come to terms with. I looked at the white paper from 1999. It's called Partnership for Progress. A white paper on the relationship between the United Kingdom and the overseas territories. And when you look at it, Mr. Speaker, it speaks about a shared history between the overseas territories and the United Kingdom. But it makes no mention of slavery. In fact, I want to read to you with your permission, Mr. Speaker, Partnership for Progress. Also, I took a look at the white paper. Came out somewhere around 2010 or so. Um, I believe it's called Security, Security, Sustainability, and let me see if I and Success. Again, Mr. Speaker, no mention of slavery or colonialism. Just a shared history. Let me read it for you. Let's take a quick look here, Mr. Speaker, at this shared history. Let us see, Mr. Speaker, let us see, let us see, let us see. I'm reading from Mr. Speaker, Partnership for Progress. Britain's links with the overseas territories are long-standing and important. The relationship is rooted in a shared history, but it moves forward too in partnership. For Britain, the overseas territories are a significant element in its national and international identity and an important responsibility. Nothing in there speaks about really what the history between the UK and the overseas territories is all about. I'll go to the, the, the other white paper just to make the point more clear, Mr. P Speaker, just in case somebody's not persuaded that there's an effort to not acknowledge the, the relationship between the overseas territories and the United Kingdom. And that shared history being one of slavery. Our relationship is rooted in four centuries this is security, success, uh, success, and sustainability. Our relationship is rooted in four centuries of shared history. Bermuda, off the eastern coast of North America, became one of the first British territories in Americas when it was settled by the survivors from a shipwreck in 1609. Settled, that's a nice word. That settled you speak about often involves rape, murder, pillage. Settled, sounds nice. Bermuda's first capital, St. George's, was founded in 1612. Bermuda is now the most populous territory with a population of 66,000 and enjoys one of the highest per capita incomes in the world. Nice little transition. From being settled, now you have one of the highest per act. Sounds nice. Okay, let's get a little closer to home, Mr. Speaker. This is the white paper again. 
the five Caribbean territories, Anguilla, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Montserrat, and Torques and Caicos Islands became British territories during the 17th and 18th centuries. Now listen to this. When sugar plantations were established on many islands. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if that's a little more convincing and persuasive. No mention of slavery. No mention of kidnapping. No mention of murder, rape, pillage. And I want to be clear, Mr. Speaker, that our history did not begin with slavery, but our relationship with the United Kingdom began with slavery. And when we are talking about a partnership, you have to know where you're coming from so you can know where you're going. And we really have to ask ourselves, Mr. Speaker, if the United Kingdom and the, the Virgin Islands are on the same page about where we are going and where we want to end up. Before you can speak about a partnership, you really have to define, really, where it is you want to go. The AG spoke about it just now. This exercise in itself, Mr. Speaker, I have to tell you, is really a contradiction. This exercise we're going through in itself is a contradiction. And I heard the member for the third speak about it when he said, what are we doing here? Asking for equality? Do you know that other places do not have to go to another nation? and beg them to say, well, we want this or we want that. When other places have constitutional talks, it's a conversation they have with their people, the people who elect them, the people who they are accountable to. So you could, you could tell me the, the United Kingdom says it is okay for you to have some measure of self-determination? Do we even know what the word self-determination means? If somebody has to grant you as much, and when you read it in the document, we'll give you as much self-determination as is possible based on what? based on whose definition? Who, who defines what is possible, Mr. Speaker? And if our former enslaved nation has to determine for us what amount of self-determination is possible, I submit to you Mr. Speaker, that what we are talking about is not a partnership at all. And I have to tell you, I, I caught maybe about a minute and a half of the member for the 4th District. And he was along those lines. And I united with him there. I didn't hear the whole contribution. I maybe heard about 90 seconds of his contribution. He's saying this thing that we're calling a partnership is no partnership at all, Mr. Speaker. Because what the United Kingdom is skilled in doing is changing names. You know like somebody gets in trouble and they change their whole identity? They change their license, their passport, they have a new name. 
So, okay, so colonies, it doesn't sound nice. Let's change it to territories. British Empire, nobody speaks about empire anymore. We'll change it to the Commonwealth. So, we change the name and everything is all right. But fundamentally, the relationship is the same. And I'm saying to you, Mr. Speaker, that we have to move past this fake partnership. It has to be a real partnership. Let's take a look, Mr. Speaker, at the United Nations. The United Nations made a declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples. General Assembly Resolution 1514 of the 14th of December 1960. And I said to you, this time that we are doing this, it's so symbolic. 1960, that's 60 years ago, the General Assembly of the United Nations made a declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and people. And the point I'm getting to, Mr. Speaker, is that the world has already declared that this thing that we are experiencing with the United Kingdom is something of the past. It has no place or presence in the world today. And this is the world who has declared this. Keep in mind, this is at a time when the United Nations had many new members, I'm sure including the Republic of Ghana, where Honorable Attorney General is from. And it is only after the United Nations gained a certain amount of members that de declarations such as these were possible. And remember at this time, persons were actually fighting for their freedom, fighting with guns, Mr. Speaker. And the member for the third district, I, I listened to you, you know, spoke about certain things you have to do in the General Assembly because you have some of those permanent members there who will block you. So certain things have to be done in the General Assembly where you cannot be blocked. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll read this General Assembly resolution. Granted. I think it's powerful for the members of the public to hear, Mr. Speaker. Granted. The General Assembly, mindful of the determination proclaimed by the peoples of the world in the Charter of the United Nations to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights, equal rights of men and women and of nations, large and small, and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. Conscious of the need for the creation of conditions of stability and well-being and peaceful and friendly relations, based on respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination of all peoples and of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, recognizing the passionate yearning for freedom in all dependent peoples and the decisive role of such peoples in the attainment of their independence. Aware of the increasing conflicts resulting from the denial of or impediments in the way of the freedom of such peoples, which constitute a serious threat to world peace. Considering the important role of the United Nations in assisting 
the movement for independence in tr trust and non-self-governing territories, recognizing that the people of the world ardently desire the end of colonialism in all its manifestations. Convinced that the continued existence of colonialism prevents the development of international economic cooperation, impedes the social, cultural, and economic development of de dependent peoples, and militates against the United Nations ideal of universal peace. Affirming that peoples may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources without prejudice to any obligations arising out of international economic cooperation, based upon the principle of mutual benefit and international law. Believing that the process of liberation is, is irresistible and irreversible, and that in order to avoid serious crises, an end must be put to colonialism and all practices of segregation and discrimination associated therewith. Welcoming the emergence in recent years of a large number of dependent territories into freedom and independence, and recognizing the increasingly powerful trends towards freedom in such territories which have not yet attained independence. Convinced that all peoples have an inalienable right to complete freedom, the exercise of their sovereignty, and the integrity of their national territory, solemnly proclaims the necessity of bringing to a speedy and unconditional end colonialism in all its forms and manifestations. And to this end declares that the subjugation of people to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights. Let me stop there. I'm going to finish off, but let me stop there. If you read those white papers, the word is going to keep coming up all the time. Human rights. We need to respect human rights. The subjugation, subjugation, the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights. It is contrary to the Charter of the United Nations and is an impediment to the promotion of world peace and cooperation. All peoples have the right to self-determination by virtue of the right that freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. I'm going to deal with that point in a minute, Mr. Speaker, because the United Kingdom will tell you, you can have independence if you want it. I'm going to deal with it. They're not preventing anybody from going independent. I'm going to deal with it, Mr. Speaker. Inadequacy of political, economic, social, or educational preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. Our people need to hear that one. Inadequacy of political, economic, social, or educational preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. All armed action or repressive measures of all kinds directed against dependent peoples shall cease in order to enable them to exercise peacefully and freely their right to complete independence and the integrity of their national territory shall be respected. Immediate steps shall be taken in trust and non-self-governing territories or all other territories which have not yet attained independence to transfer all powers to the peoples of those territories without any conditions or reservations in accordance with their freely expressed will and desire, without any distinction as to race, creed, or color, in order to enable them to enjoy complete independence and freedom. 
any attempt aimed at partial or total disruption of the national unity and the territorial integrity of a country is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. All states shall observe faithfully and strictly the provisions of the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the present declaration on the basis of equality, non-interference in the internal affairs of all states, and respect for the sovereign rights of all peoples and their territorial integrity. You see, Mr. Speaker, certain nations, they decide that they respect what international obligations they want. They respect what international obligations they want, and then they ignore the ones that they want. Happens all the time. Yeah? One, on one hand, we have international obligations we must respect, but when they're ready, they just ignore whichever ones. We can't get caught up in that, Mr. Speaker. We have to, as the young people say, stay woke. We have to pay attention. We have to see what's going on. The United Kingdom has taken a position as it pertains to the United Nations and the Decolonization Committee. Now is a good time to speak about the Decolonization Committee, Mr. Speaker, which has been spoken about before. There was a certain chapter of the UN char Charter that established that decolonization committee. But let's take a look at Article 73, which has been made reference to before, Mr. Speaker. The United Kingdom has a responsibility to assist the Virgin Islands and all the other dependent territories to move to advance towards one of three options. We have integration, which is, you see, some of the French territories have integration. This means, Mr. Speaker, that Martinique or Guadeloupe and them, they're actually a part of France. And they have representation in the French Parliament. And the budget of France is available to Guadeloupe, Martinique, and all of these other territories. And I'm told, Mr. Speaker, that you can actually see that. You can actually see money being spent in these French territories coming directly from uh, the French budget. That's what we call integration. Now, we may not want something like that for, of course, it may interfere with our financial services and things like that. We may not favor integration. Maybe that's not the one for us, Mr. Speaker. But those are options. The United Kingdom is not acknowledging the options which the United Nations has put on the table in regards to non-self-governing territories at the particular moment. We have freedom of association, Mr. Speaker. I think that's definitely one that we need to think about. Let's take a look at the minister, what you call these group of islands, I mean these group of uh, places with the United Kingdom, crown, de crown dependencies. Crown dependencies have a different relationship to the United Kingdom than we do. Crown dependencies have freedom of association. Let me read for you, Mr. Speaker, what it says about crown dependencies in this same white paper, the success, sustainability, and security, right? What are the crown dependencies, it says? The crown dependencies are the Ballywick of Jersey, the Ballywick of Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. The Ballywick of Guernsey includes the separate jurisdictions of Alderney and Sark, 
and the islands of Horm, Jetho, and Le Leho. The island of Brekwa is part of SAC. Jersey, Guernsey, and Isle of Man are not part of the UK, but are internally self-governing dependencies of the crown. This means they have their own directly elected legislative assemblies as administrative, fiscal, and legal systems and their own courts of law. The Crown dependencies are not represented in the UK Parliament. The Crown dependencies have never, never been colonies of the UK. Neither are they members of the EU. These Crown dependencies have a different relationship from us, Mr. Speaker. And in this very same white paper, the very same white paper, I'll have to look for the exact, the exact words, Mr. Speaker. It says that after they took a look at it, they did not see how us having the type of relationship that the Crown Dependencies had would be of any additional benefit or value. That one is not for you. UK overseas territories. And, you know, I will not, I will not, I will not, uh, what, what's the word? I will not assume. There's another word I'm looking for. I will not speculate. That's the word. I will not speculate as to why these crown dependencies are being treated differently from the overseas territories. I won't speculate about anything to do with our history of slavery and things like that. And the fact that we're black, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't speculate, Mr. Speaker. Yes. So, I think it's interesting to take a look at free association as an option. And we also have, Mr. Speaker, independence. Independence is a third option. And let me say, Mr. Speaker, that I'm not here to push independence down anybody's throat. I'm just telling you what the facts are. The United Nations has determined that we have three options and staying in this status is not one of them. This present situation that we face is not an option. We cannot stay here. We have to be moving towards something. What the UK has said is, well, you're either British or you're independent. That does not go along with what the United Nations is saying. Let me read for you Article 73 that deals with non-self-governing territories. <coughs> Members of the United, with your permission, Mr. Speaker. Members of the United Nations, which have or assume responsibilities for the administration of territories, whose peoples have not yet attained a full measure of self-government, recognize the principle that the interests of the inhabitants of these territories are paramount. Member for the Ninth District read this, but I'm going to go a little further. And accept as a sacred trust the obligation to promote to the utmost within the system of international peace and security established by the present charter the well-being of the inhabitants of these territories. And to this end, A, to ensure with due respect for the culture of the people concerned, their political, economic, social and educational advancement, their just protection and their protection against abuses. Let me stop right there, Mr. Speaker. The United Kingdom, and it's reflected in this white paper, they're, they're concerned with about a few things, none of which is listed here. They're concerned that we must not be a contingent liability on the UK Treasury. 
This is a big deal for them. Make sure that we in no way become what they would consider to be a burden on their treasury. That's one thing that they'll harp on and on about. Um, I wonder if this is a, a, a good place for me to talk about the fact that they have to pay us reparation for slavery. And that we work for centuries for them without pay. And that they chose to pay the planters when slavery came to an end. They paid the planters for their, for their quote-unquote losses on the slavery. But anyway, they don't want us to be a contingent liability on them. They want to make sure that um, we honor our international obligations and, and, and our responsibilities, that we practice good governance, that we're fiscally responsible. They go on and on about these things. But never have they really written clearly and demonstrated with their actions a fundamental commitment to what does it say here under A? The political, economic, social, educational advancement, their just treatment and their protection against abuses. Let's take a look at our history. We have here educational advancement. Let me just deal with that. I already gave the example of Brigada Flax uh, Secondary. Who was it that really ensured that the Virgin Islands got education? Was it the United Kingdom government? Or was it the Methodist Church and the Anglican Church. I, I, I need somebody to answer this because maybe it's true. Has the United Kingdom ever built a school? The ones who are older here may be able to tell me. Have they ever built a school in the BVI? Member for the thought? Somebody tell me. Never built a school. They build prisons. They build police station. They build court house. How is it that the United Kingdom has been concerned with our political advancement? What's taking place now is more of a rolling back of all of the battles we've already fought and all the gains we've already had. What do you think the um, protocols for effective financial management is? And this, um, what's this thing, um, Deputy Premier, that we keep speaking about um, after the hurricanes? High level, high level framework. And then this recovery agency, all of these things are you attempting to roll back gains that we have already made. So we have to be careful with this constitution. Because if the UK is, goes along the, the trend that I see they're going on, instead of us making advancements, they will seek for us to regress. And that's not something that we can tolerate. B, to develop self-government to take due account of the political aspirations of the people. This is in the UN Charter, you know. We have leverage. The United Kingdom would care not to read this part. To develop self-government, to take due account of the political aspirations of the people and to assist them in the progressive development of their free political institutions. It didn't say that you do it for us. It doesn't say that. That you want to be involved in everything. You want to do everything. You want more power. It says to help the people. Help them to advance. Help them to develop their free political institutions. What else does it say here? 
assist them in the progressive development of their free political institutions according to the particular circumstances of each territory and its peoples and their varying stages of advancement. C, to further international peace and security. D, to promote constructive measures of development, to encourage research and to cooperate with one another and when and where appropriate with specialized international bodies with a view to the practical achievement of the social, economic, and scientific purposes set forth in this article, and E, to transmit regularly to the Security General for information purposes. To such limitation as security and constitutional considerations may require statistical and other information of a technical nature relating to economic, social, and educational conditions in the territories for which they are re respectively responsible, other than those territories to which chapters 12 and 13 apply. What was described here in Article 73? This is what the partnership between the United Kingdom and the overseas territories is supposed to be about. What is described here, this is what we're supposed to be walking together on until we reach the stage where we feel confident enough to be able to make a choice between those three options. But no, the United Kingdom, and this, this is documented, the United Kingdom has taken approach to the decolonization committee and the committee of 24, where they're saying, well, that doesn't apply to us. They actually go out and they say, we have a good relationship with our territories. Our territories are British. And imagine, Mr. Speaker, just around the year 2000, 1999-2000, after centuries of being under colonial rule, they choose to give us British citizenship. Imagine that. In the year 1999-2000, somewhere around there, you come with this British citizenship. We've already built up ourselves to this particular point. We've already had to travel to the Dominican Republic and the United States and the United States Virgin Islands and built up ourselves. And here you come in 99, 2000. Now you say, here, have some British citizenship after centuries. I mean, the United Kingdom should be embarrassed by that and saying, well, you're British now. You're British. And if you don't want to be British anymore, you don't have to be British. You can go along your merry way. Is that responsible? You enslave somebody? You have them under your rule, you neglect them for years and years and years, and then you say, well, when you're ready, you could leave? You write reparations. It's not going to happen just like that, Mr. Speaker. Let me speak about a little bit about independence. Mr. Speaker, while I was a lecturer at the H. Laverty Stout Community College, we would have some papers sometimes. I used to poll the students. No one really was a big supporter of independence. And they gave some reasons. And before I go into that, Mr. Speaker, let me say that the world that we live in right now is a global world. I acknowledge that. You even had the different countries within the European Union. They decide they have to get together. As big as they are, they have to get together to be able to survive in this world. You have China, huge. United States, huge. In this world, little small countries can't survive on their own. We need partnerships. We need to be able to make alliances. But we have to be in control of those partnerships and those alliances. 
and the terms of the partnerships and those alliances. So I'm not in any way, Mr. Speaker, advocating for us to go it alone, to be in this thing on our own. We live in an international world, and we have to forge partnerships to our own benefit. But most times when persons did not support independence, most times it's based on misinformation. And I would say to you, Mr. Speaker, that we've had a good, a good education on the role that the United Kingdom plays for us in a number of areas. Most persons said, well, we can't go independent because let's say we have a really bad natural disaster. Who will help us? Who will help us? Well, here comes 2017. And we have discovered, Mr. Speaker, that despite the fact that we are territory of the United Kingdom, that help is really hard to come by. <laughs> In fact, the United Kingdom has given more assistance to independent countries rather than the Virgin Islands. They say, even though that our whole economy was devastated, we had over $2 billion of damage, tourism product in a mess, well, you know what? Your per capita income is too high. So we can't help you. So, well, there goes that reason. Mr. Speaker, some persons say we can't go independent because it will hurt our, our financial services sector. Well, I have another joke for you, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have a joke for you. Let's imagine that the OECD, Financial Action Task Force, all the international bodies that I met, they say the Virgin Islands, you are one of the best regulated jurisdictions in the world. Better regulated than the United Kingdom, the United States, all of these other OECD countries. But hear what? The, the body that is most wants to shut you down, even though you are you know, they talk a lot about international obligations. You're meeting all your international obligations. The body that wants to shut you down more than any other body is the United Kingdom Parliament. Can you imagine that? Do I need to read again the responsibilities of the United Kingdom? They're responsible for our all types of different things they say. They're responsible for our security, our this, our that. But yet, Mr. Speaker, they are the ones who are saying they want to violate privacy. And that's an issue that we have to deal with in this Constitution as well. We have to make sure that we protect the privacy of our individuals. Because, of course, Mr. Speaker, there are some legitimate concerns. There are legitimate concerns to which we would have to exchange tax information. You know, have persons who are suspected of committing crimes, etc. And we put a system in place to be ex able to exchange information, beneficial ownership information, and now with the um, economic substance. Uh, tax information, etc. Okay? With these um, international law enforcement agencies. But the UK Parliament wants this information open to the whole world. Even though it's not required. So, we have to ask ourselves what kind of partnership 
the United Kingdom really wants to have with us. Some persons say we cannot become independent because we won't be able to use a U.S. currency. Another false notion. That's false notion. Several independent countries use United States currency. And we have persons who promote, Mr. Speaker, that we cannot become independent because our leaders are incompetent or corrupt. They go on the TV shows and they talk about corruption. Cut deep. Somebody should cut their backside. Yeah? We, Mr. Speaker, we take a look at the United States. And I don't take it for granted, Mr. Speaker, I don't take it for granted that this is a House of Assembly and we should not use it to be able to take jabs at international governments and things like that. But Mr. Speaker, we have the United States of America. And when we look at the leadership of the United States of America, independent country became independent from, from England from Great Britain. And when you look at their leadership, and even with the COVID-19, the decisions they have made, Mr. Speaker, we can be proud of our leadership here in the Virgin Islands and how we have handled ourselves. Mr. Speaker, there are some persons who criticize me because they say they voted for me and they expected me almost to be a check and a balance against my own government. They elect me because they think that I would be able to keep my party in line or some madness or some craziness like that. Mr. Speaker, I joined the Virgin Islands Party, because I unite with the aims, the objectives. These individuals who I am serving with, persons I respect, I respect their integrity, I respect their abilities, Mr. Speaker. And there's something in cabinet called collective responsibility so we hash things out and even Mr. Speaker some of these persons don't understand government and they need to educate themselves even when we disagree we have to agree there's something called collect we are collectively responsible now I'm not saying we are perfect individuals I'm not saying the premier is perfect I'm not saying the deputy premier is perfect. Any of the ministers or the junior ministers are perfect. But Mr. Speaker, take me around the world and show me which leadership is perfect. When you compare what we have been able to do, and this is just an example with COVID-19. When you look at what we've been able to do, Mr. Speaker, we can be proud of ourselves and our leadership. We don't need persons telling us all the time that we're incompetent and corrupt as leaders. And this doesn't mean that everybody has to support the same political party. But we cannot get into this thing, Mr. Speaker, that we are any less than any, any other person. Look, we fight it out when it has an election campaign, a government, wins, and we move forward. Another election campaign comes around, and we'll fight it out. Some people get caught up, Mr. Speaker, in saying, well, the governor has to be a check and a balance for our government. Can you imagine that, Mr. Speaker? That we need a governor to be here to be a check 
and a balance on us. Who's a check and a balance in the United Kingdom government? Who's a check and a balance on the United States government? Do they need any other country, any other group of people from someplace else to help to keep them in line? And who are we? Honorable Fraser, member for the third, asked the question, are we here asking for equality? Is that what we're asking for? Which other people in the world say, well, you know, Australia, I need United States to come here and to help me because my leadership is immoral or incompetent. If you have any challenges with your leadership, the biggest check and balance we have is the people. And I'm not just talking about elections. Because I know and I understand after an election, after an election, for that four years, a government cannot just run crazy and do whatever it is they want. This is why the Constitution, which is very good, gives you freedom of association. Freedom of speech, even though they want to cuss me, that's fine. They want to cuss me, that's fine. Because that's democracy. I believe in democracy with my whole heart. I was out there on the radio. I cussed who I had to cuss. Yeah? Sometimes it's justified. Sometimes it's not. Let the people decide. Let the government go out there and justify. Let the government defend. Governments sometimes have to change course. They make one decision. They say, well, you know, the people put some pressure on us. Lord, we just get some pressure sometimes. Don't we get pressure? You got to come back and say, well, the people... <laughs> Didn't really like that one, Mr. Speaker. The people didn't like that one. But you have some of these people, they don't want to go through the democratic process. They want to sit down with the governor and have tea. And they feel good, you know, Mr. Speaker. When they sit down there, they cross their legs, they have some tea, they feel like people. Oh, man, I feel like people now are here with the governor. Yeah? Boy, I could tell you, Mr. Speaker, I, I mean, I ain't got a problem with, I ain't got a problem with the governor and them, you know. It's a cool bloke. I, I don't have a problem with the guy. But I could tell you, you know, the, the, the thing that I was most proud of, Mr. Speaker, thing that, I mean, it almost brought me to tears, I sat down with Noah Lloyd. Noah Lloyd, that's, that's the person who should really want to sit down with and talk to. Noah Lloyd used to be there walking the streets. A lot of people didn't even have an appreciation for who he was. They want to sit down with the governor and talk melee. <laughs> and talk about who's competent and incompetent and what's happening was taking place, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, so I, I was in a match and I played the role of Theodore Faulkner. Oh boy, that thing was such an honor for me. One time I had a meeting, I sat down with, with a member for the third district. Those things are the thing that matter to me. I, I developed a relationship with uh, Alvin Christopher, persons like that. Uh, those are the things I value. Oh, how I wish, Mr. Speaker, I could, at, at this stage in my life, have a conversation with my grandfather or, or my great uncle, Leslie Malone. Now, we could sit down and have a chat. But some persons, because of the colonial mindset, they feel a great deal of satisfaction when they sit down with the governor. Nothing against the governor. 
Mr. Speaker, the thing that is preventing us from even considering the subject of independence is all in our mind. I suggest to you, the biggest barrier that we have in even considering independence, when I say independence, somebody make a headline out of it. Watch the block them tomorrow. Just watch them. I mean, it almost cause a public panic. The biggest barrier is in our minds. You know, there's some people, Mr. Speaker, that think that the United Kingdom government gives us money. There are some individuals who believe that the United Kingdom government gives us money. I am here to tell you, Mr. Speaker, that not only does the United Kingdom government not give us money, but we actually pay for many of the services or, or the operations of government house. I wonder if persons know that. This is just education for persons because I want persons to understand and to know that the BVI government, the BVI government, our financial services sector that the United Kingdom is trying to kill, our tourism. You, uh, Mr. Speaker, before I go to this thing about government house, have you ever gone to Barbados? Have you seen the amount of British tourists in Barbados? An independent country? The AG said it. Barbados attained their independence in 1966. Long gone from the UK. You know the amount of people go to, from the UK go to Barbados for a holiday? You know what? If that amount of persons came to the BVI for a holiday, we probably wouldn't even need any tourists from the United States of America. The United Kingdom citizens travel to Barbados in droves. Some of them don't even know that the BVI exists except outside or when they start cussing about financial services. And I'm asking myself, well, what type of partnership is this? Does the United Kingdom even promote their overseas territories as destinations to travel to? I mean, what kind of partnership is this? Anyway, Mr. Speaker, everything that you see happening here in the BVI is finance from what we get from financial services, from tourism, from whatever it is we implement. Mr. Speaker, we do it all for ourselves. I have right here an agreement. This is agreement between the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and North Ireland and the government of the Virgin Islands. And this agreement sets out what the BVI government is going to pay for and what the FCO is going to pay for as it relates to the expenses and operations of the governor's office. So United Kingdom government doesn't even want to cover the expenses fully for the governor. Our government must do so. We must finance a governor being here and some of the stifling actions that the United Kingdom government is taking when we are attempting to realize our full potential, actualization of a full measure of self-determination. The parties agree that the government, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, 
the parties agreed that the government would be responsible for the following expenses. Salary costs for government house and governor's office staff, including overtime. Official mobile telephone for the governor and the cost of official calls. Utilities for government house and gov governor's office. Electricity, propane, landlines, fax, and cable. Governor's entertainment allowance. Special allowance. Office stationery. You telling me the FCO couldn't pay for the stationery? <laughs> Bottled water for BVI government staff only. Official entertainment, including the Queen's birthday parade or Queen's birthday party. You tell me the FCO couldn't pay for the Queen to have a birthday party. Uniforms for government house staff. Cleaning materials for the governor's office and government house. Gifts given by the governor in an official capacity. Pest control for the governor's office and government house. Generator at the governor's office. All costs to maintain, including fuel replenishment. Air conditioning at the governor's office and government house. Kitchenware and appliances for office and government house. Crystal glasses and reception glasses. Maintain, including reactive maintenance, the structure of the governor's office and government house, including electrical appliances, gas, water, sewage, plumbing, swimming pool, garden, and surrounds in good working order. The flag car, including fuel and maintenance. The driver. Official travel within the BVI and USVI as appropriate, inclusive of flights, accommodation, food, and entertainment. Mr. Speaker, the United Kingdom government, and this has been the case throughout history, has not been just to the people of the BVI. The Premier asks for grants. I should say the Cabinet requested grants, if I say it correctly. And I could almost tell him what the answer would have been. I mean, they come up with all kind of this and that, or the BVI government has to do this, they have to do that. They tell you finances devolved, but yet when you want to practice your financial autonomy, they have all kind of obstacles in your way, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hope any, everybody forgets. I, I, I like the United Kingdom. You know, I, I hope nobody forgot about that, you know. I have a lot of British friends, Mr. Speaker. I hope nobody, I just want to remind everybody out there who is listening, I like the United Kingdom. I have nothing against them, Mr. Speaker. But the thesis, the thesis, my thesis for my presentation today is that the United Kingdom, they're not going to like what I said. I can tell you already, I know they don't like what I said. They, they're making phone calls right now. <laughs> right? Yeah, they, they, they don't like what I'm saying at all. But what it is I need for the United Kingdom government to understand, even in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement that's gripped the entire world, that there are some uncomfortable conversations that we're going to have to have. You're going to have to deal with your um, territories better than you've dealt before. Okay? You're going to have to do that. You have to come to grips with the fact, first of all, with slavery. You don't mention it in any of your documents. You haven't apologized. You have to pay reparations. You have to come to grips with your past and the relationship with us and how you have oppressed us over centuries. And you cannot come to us telling us about any fake partnership because we are educated people. We are smart people. You can't tell us any foolishness about our modern partnership, but yet it's one-sided all the time. 
You're going to have to come better than that. And then the United, King, um, the United Nations Charter, it supports what it is we're saying. When you look at Article 73, and all that Article 73 entails, you should be helping us to develop ourselves in these areas as we move towards one of these particular options. And you have abdicated your responsibility in doing that. And as we approach these constitutional talks, Mr. Speaker, you're going to have to approach these talks in a different mind frame. We have to see advancement of this constitution. This whole concept of independence or nothing, it is not supported by the United Nations. You have to help us to develop. We have to have some significant gains, not just symbolic gains, not just changing a name or this or changing a name to that to something. We have to deal with some of these things. I mean, just imagine the premier. Premier should have to fight to choose his own permanent secretary. Should that be a fight in 2020, in this day and age? That the ministers of government, the ministers of government have an agenda that they want to move. And whenever somebody isn't happy with the agenda that a minister wants to move, democratically elected minister, elected by the people they want to move agenda, somebody could feel like they could block your agenda. Sometimes I really wonder, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm part of the, the executive, I'm part of the legislative. Sometimes I wonder who it is above me. What office is higher than, than mine where I can get to do some of these things that people elected me to do? People blocking you and telling you you can't do this and you can't do that. I'm talking to a lawmaker, a policy maker, and they're telling you what you can and cannot do. Constitution, eh, eh, nothing against the Constitution, nothing against the law, but you can't do this, you can't do that. We're going to have to deal with some of these things, Mr. Speaker. I didn't get into some of these things about how you choose leader of opposition. I leave that stuff to my colleagues and, you know, how you resign from the House of Assembly and some of these other things that are in here that come problems from time to time. But what, we, what, what has to be high priority with these constitutional talks, Mr. Speaker, is how we advance our autonomy. How do we exercise a full measure of self-determination? We have to take a significant step from here. And the United Kingdom doesn't have to be scared that well, we're going to get to a, a, a place and then we're going to stop there. Because these young people that we're educating, Mr. Speaker, we got to get them a little further and they're going to do the rest. I was a little by when Honorable Fraser and Honorable Vanterpool got here. They were doing this ground walk. And it's my job since I've gotten here now to take it a little further. So that when, as a member for the third district says, we have this conversation with those in the past, we have these kind of conversations symbolically that we can say, I did my part to take this, to take this forward. You know, Honorable Penn Leader of Opposition, he has a son, I have a daughter, a son, all of us have our, our children. Do we really want to to move forward in a BVI, have them, our children have their children, and say, well, nothing has changed. In fact, things have regressed and receded. I can't have that, Mr. Speaker. 
I'm going to fight tooth and nail. Tooth and nail to ensure we make some significant advancement. And our people, I must say, any question of any change in political status has to be one that people vote on in a referendum. All of this is about the people. Nobody is going to impose anything on the people that the people doesn't want. What we're seeking to do here is educate persons. Have a dialogue and a conversation with persons about what it is we're doing. Mr. Speaker, and I'm grateful for the Deputy Premier for this. Mr. Speaker, I look at a newspaper from 19... 38. I want to bring it up. 1938, the Deputy Premier refer, refer, refers to this all the time. This is from 1938, the Daily News in St. Thomas. It's titled, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll read. Tortola to demand elective principle. All friends of Tortola will learn with pleasure of the inauguration of the first civic organization with a political program that has existed in the British Virgin Islands during the present century. The British Virgin Islands Civic League has been founded for the purpose of obtaining public support for a petition to the Right Honorable the Secretary of State for the Colonies asking that the presidency of the British Virgin Islands which is a dependency of the Leeward Islands colony, be given the same measure of self-government that has been extended to other pres presidencies in the colony. Under the form of government that is now being asked for, there will be a legislature, certain members of which will be elected by the people functioning under a written constitution. Wide enthusiasm has already been aroused throughout the islands comprising the presidency. The officers selected to had this new organization are uh, Mr. David G. Fonseca, a prominent business figure in Tortola, the president, Mr. Charles W. Georges, outstanding young merchant, vice president, Mr. Um, J.R. O'Neill, pharmaceutical chemist, is the secretary, and Mr. Howard Penn, merchant, is the treasurer. The commissioner, Dr. D. T. Whaling, was presented with a copy of the petition, which is being circulated, and before his departure from England on the 15th instant, he informed the organization through the secretary that there was nothing in the petition to which objection could be raised and advised that it would be forwarded through the proper official channels when completed. The work of obtaining signatures from the 6,000 people of the island is going forward rapidly. 6,000 people back in 1938. The petition has received the approval of all classes in the community, including the 73-year-old sage of West End, Mr. J. Romney. The Civic League hopes to have completed the signing of the people by the end of August. Mr. Speaker, what we are continuing here is a work that has been happening for a long time. Yeah? It was continued with Theodore Faulkner and Glani Fonseca and Calton de Castro. It was continued by all of the members of the legislature, our first chief minister, Lav Honorable Laverty Stout and all the other chief ministers who came after. It was, it, was, it was continued by Noah Lloyd. It was continued by all of our people who have been fighting for, for advancements throughout that time. And we cannot afford to drop the ball. And as my colleagues have encouraged, I have always, already Mr. Speaker, ask that the Director of Culture, Dr. Catherine Smith, do a full survey of what is being taught in the education system 
to ensure that our young people learn this, to gain that understanding of what it says in the territorial song. What it says in our territorial song. And understanding for our children so they may cherish this legacy. Mr. Speaker, I, I won't continue any longer. I just want to, again, congratulate the Premier uh, for bringing this resolution. And I want to say that I'm proud of each and every member of this House for the way that they've debated this resolution. I, I certainly think it was thorough. I'm not trying to wrap up, Mr. Speaker. I just, um, that's the role of the Premier. And I know the leader of the opposition still has to go, but I just want to express from my standpoint, Mr. Speaker, how proud I am to be a member of this uh, House of Assembly at this particular time. And I'm looking forward, Mr. Speaker, to uh, a, a real engagement with the people in our community, a real educational process, because, of course, persons cannot meaningfully participate without having a proper amount of information and education. And we can have a meaningful engagement with the people in all corners of the Virgin Islands, Jasper and Dyke and Igada, uh, every, uh, Virgin Gorda, every part of Tortola, everywhere where we have persons, about where it is we're going as a people. Because a people without any direction is, is like a loose kite blowing through the wind. A tree without roots cannot stand, Mr. Speaker. So having said those few words, I'm in full support of this re resolution, Mr. Speaker. And let us march onward. Let us march onward to greater autonomy and self-determination. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank you, Minister of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, and member of the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Nathaniel Wheeler. At this moment, we will call on the Leader of Opposition and member of the 8th District, the Honorable Marlon A. Penn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I gracefully stand to give my contribution to the resolution before this honorable house. Mr. So Speaker, I think um, the member for the seventh and my district colleague made it very clear his love for the United Kingdom and the governor here this evening. <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, I firstly want to Start out by an onset express that this resolution that is before us has been before us the past couple of days fully has my support. I believe that we are at a point right now in our territories or uh, development that we need to start to look at the way forward. Mr. Speaker, today and yesterday. We had some very informative, historic discussions slash debate. Premier did a good job in terms of setting a tone, I believe, in terms of the way forward. I think he reference much historic data. And I believe if, and, and the Deputy Premier didn't disappoint either um, in his role as become now the, the House historian. Um, I believe that, uh, and one of the challenges that I've always had, in, and, and one of the things I think is very important for us, is to ensure that or history, or documented history, is available for all of us in this territory. I worked when I was um, the junior minister for trade and investment to ensure that we build up the electronic space to be able to house these historic information. 
I think as part of the process, um, when the Premier gets back, Deputy Premier, you're here, that we have to ensure that the documentations that we speak about, the advancements in terms of our constitutions from the years before and all the other amendments and, and how we got to these points, the white papers and all those documentations need to be an essential repository as part of the reference documents for this process. I, I think it's very important because if we're going to tell our people about discussing the way forward, we, we have to have a point, a reference point. And those documents serves as a very good reference point for us as a territory so that the, the history and the information surrounding what happened before is very clear. No one um, makes up their own history, so to speak. Um, I, I know a lot of persons have worked to make that happen. I know that's something that we could easily do now. And I hope that that is something that is done as we go going forward in this process. Well, Mr. Speaker, I also want to commend my colleagues who spoke from the heart, many of them, I think all of them, in terms of articulating their view, their perspective. One of the things when this resolution first came to the House is that we asked for informal discussion to ensure that as the 13 elected members, we had a clear approach in terms of moving forward with the process. Um, some amendments were made. Uh, we made um, agreement to ensure that this process that is happening right now forms the basis of the terms of reference that goes forward to the committee. Um, we have to be extremely clear in terms of, of what our intentions are as it relates to moving forward. Speaker, my colleagues, the, and it was important to get the contextual approach from the persons who participated in some of this like, Testing, much better. The contextual approach in terms of moving forward with our constitutional review process. Mr. Speaker, the, my colleague on my left, the member for the third, I think he did as only he could a great job in terms of outlining based on his experience as being one of the persons who were instrumentally involved in the process in terms of what the intent and what of in terms of the content of the constitution, the current constitution, and what that means for us as we move forward. And the reality is, is that the current construct that we have and the challenges that we're facing is that the knowledge of the Constitution is lacking. One of the things that I, I think before we could discuss the point of moving forward and what we or people want, we, they have to first know what we have. We have to put things in the proper context. And I think we have done over the last 13 years since the, last, since the last constitutional review, I think we've done a poor job in terms of ensuring that the populace understands the content of the Constitution. I think as a critical component of this process, it is important for us, every part, every section, and there's, there are one, two, Ten. Ten main sections and 
schedules, that we break it down. And I think we have access now that we didn't have access before to critical tools that could help us to, to disseminate and widely disseminate the information in a way that people could digest, that's digestible, and it could get a sense of where we are currently. So we could then start the discussion in the process on where we intend to move forward. How we intend to move forward. I, I promise not to be as very, very, very long like my um, counterpart in the East. Um, but I intend to take my time to talk about some key areas. I think a lot of the, one hour, about one hour. We talked about some of the, the key, so a lot of the key areas have been going, has been discussed already over the last couple of days and I, I don't want to rehash many of those things to really bore but some of them are important for reinforcement. I think some of those things are need, needed to be reinforced. For me, and I go back to where we are. In my, in my former life, I, I still try to dabble a little bit in the, in the IT field. And, one of the things that we did is, is that we do a, what you call a, a analysis of the business. You do a, what you call the um, business, business requirements before you do any system development. You do what we call as, as is. And the as is is where you document where you are. And everything that's specific to where you are. And then we go do the to be. And I think before we could move forward to where we want to be, I think we have to put the current situation and where we are in context. We got a lot of content in terms of the historic aspect of it, how we got here, the elements, that got us to this point. But we have to look at 13 years ago, Mr. Speaker, when we undertook the total re constitutional review that, was hap that we did in 2007, in terms of where the BVI was at that time. You had a BVI that was having one of the strongest economic years of its, of, its, of its history. We had just, I believe, at that time, Minister, Member for the Fourth, we had just crossed the billion dollar mark as it relates to economic output. So as a country, we were at a, at a point, at a juncture where we were riding high and things were looking up as it relates to economic aspects and prospects for the Virgin Islands. Fast forward 10 years, 2017. Again, we were, were, were at a very strong position economically. We had one of the strongest years ever in tourism. Overnight tourism was up, numbers were on the rise. Then, hap then up and came August 25th, 17, the floods that caused tremendous infrastructural damage, economic damage. And a few weeks later, we had hurricanes, Irma, and then thereafter, Hurricane Maria. We've been ever since struggling, trying to rebuild our infrastructure, trying to rebuild our businesses and our economy. And we were moving in a good direction, in a good trajectory. And then came along COVID-19, 
2020. Not only another setback for us as Virgin Islanders, but a setback in terms of the global economy. We have a situation where not just the BVI, the UK, whom we are to have discussions as it relates to our constitutional advancements in our way moving forward. They themselves are in an economic quandary, coupled with the situations of Brexit, the, U, the UK right now is in the process of negotiating a deal as it relates to Brexit. All these issues, or all these convergent circumstances are where we are right now in the process of discussing and moving forward as it relates to constitutional discussion. And we also have to put any discussion constitutionally in the context of, and, and I think my colleague did a very good job in outlining the member for the seven, outlining the relationships between the, o, the OC, the, um, the, the, the Crown Dependency, the CDs, and the other OTs. And in, and in the OTs, they call it the big, the big tree, Bermuda, Cayman, and the British Virgin Islands. And we have to put it in the context of where we are and, and, and the relationship currently with the United Kingdom. Cayman has been the most recent. They undertook a constitutional review. And I don't know, and I, and I, I had an opportunity to look at some of the proposals that have come forward as it relates to the Cayman Constitutional Review. And it solidifies the position that we have to clearly articulate our vision for moving forward. There seems to be a reluctance of re 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 reducing or, 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 re or giving up any of the controls, as we see with the Cayman Constitutional Review. Most of what they asked for, they didn't get one. And there are more controls that have been imposed in terms of the way, the way they operate in the UK's relationship with Cayman. And right now, currently, I, I, I don't know if the debate is still going on, there's a debate currently in the Cayman Parliament um, to do with what is what it called, civil, what is it, so partnerships. Yeah. Partnerships. A certain level of partnership, not the ones that we're talking about in terms of a mature partnership. So we have to, from the context of where we sit right now, understand that we have to, as a territory, as a people, determine the, and dictate the direction that we intend to go as it relates to our constitutional advancement. And we have a responsibility in that process to ensure We, as a territory, clearly as leaders of this territory, clearly have articulated the position to the, the steering committee who's responsible for ensuring that this is moving forward and put in place. But we have to, as part of the process, ensure that the institutions, institutions that we've established, the institutions that have been put in place, are strengthened as we move forward 
in this issue, this new paradigm. And Mr. Speaker, I want you to permit me to refer to Speaker, we continue to speak about the issue of self-determination and moving forward as a territory in terms of self-determination and what that means. And I think we need to, need to be very clear in terms of the way forward. And I want to, and many members have read their definition, I want to read it quite briefly, a definition that I came up with in terms of self-determination and what it means. So self-determination has two aspects, internal and external. Internal self-determination is the right of the people of a state of governing themselves without outside interference. External self-determination is the right of peoples of the, to determine their own political status and to be free of alien domination, including formation of their own independent state However, independence is not the only possible outcome of an exercise of self-determination. So we have to determine where we are as a territory. And that's, that, that, that particular piece came from the Princeton. Princeton did a review of the colonies and the whole issue of determination and self-determination. So we have to de determine as a people and I think it comes with an education process to educate all people in terms of where we're going in terms of self-determination. Does it mean independence? Does it mean a transition um, to a place where, as it, as it was mentioned in the UN Charter, Article 73, freedom of association? We have to as leaders of this territory, set the pace. The current constitution that we have, have what we call the preamble. And I believe that is the most, that is sort of like the Bill of Rights or the, or the preamble for the US Constitution, where we outline as a people where we intend to go where it is our vision is and where we're trying to achieve. And the way forward for me and, and, and my approach to this is that it has to be about the socioeconomic empowerment of our people. We have to ensure that whatever we do, we empower our people. And I want to read a particular section of the, PM, the preamble. It's it speaks about economic advancement. It says, mindful that the people of the Virgin Islands have expressed a desire for their constitution to reflect who they are as a people and a country and their quest for social justice, economic empowerment, and political advancement. And it goes on to say, recognizing that the people of the Virgin Islands have a free and independent spirit and have developed themselves and their country based on qualities of honesty, integrity, mutual respect, self-reliance, and the ownership of the land in, in gendering a strong sense of belonging to and kinship with those islands. Mr. Speaker, it was, you heard articulated in this house the struggles that we've been experiencing. And I, and I set up the context based on the economic situation that we're in and the current internet global economic situation. The reality is that we have to ensure that whatever 
framework that we develop, it clearly empowers the will of the people. It clearly empowers the economic right to earn a living in this territory. And it goes back to the issue of ownership and a, a, a total direction and kinship with the ownership of the property. He who owns the property and owns the business owns the country, owns the economy. One of the things that our forefathers were very keen on, and it's very fitting that we're currently in the process of celebrating our emancipation. And I hail from a community, well, a few of us here hail from a community where we were the first free people in the territory, in this, in, in this part of the world, in this hemisphere, this part of the hemisphere. And one of the things that the people of Nottingham, and, and I'm sure we have, I remember I see that we're having uh, a culture of praise, which is a good thing to ensure that we continue to keep that legacy and that heritage alive, is that they bought their freedom. And with the freedom came the ownership of the property. And that's been a hallmark for us as Virgin Islanders. And one of the things that our former leaders, one of our former leaders did, and, and the member for the second, I think that was very appropriate, read the names in this honorable house so we could see the soldier, the shoulders of which we stand as representatives of this territory. Honorable Leslie Malone, he's the former representative for, I think it was then the 6th District which is now the 7th and 8th district, which is occupied by uh, myself and the member for the 7th, 7th and 8th, who are, who are coincidentally um, descendants and the nephews of Honorable Leslie Malone and Honorable Calvin Malone as well as his nephew. He at that time did what we call the alien land holders license, which was put in place to ensure that our properties, which was at the time leaving the hands of our landlords very loosely, to ensure that there was a process, a clear process for protecting the lands of this territory. Those are some of the things that our forefathers fought for and did to ensure that we preserved our heritage and who we are as a people. He also, and you're hearing a lot of talk now about the US currency, and the member for the seven brought this up. He was responsible for ensuring that the US dollar, Mr. Speaker, was made legal tender in this territory. So we have to ensure that those Inalienable, inalienable rights that are enshrined in our preamble are maintained, and that the institutions that have been built over the years by our forefathers and generations of leaders and civic-minded persons within this territory, in this country, continue to be maintained. This constitutional review and this process is going to, the economic advancement of our territory and our people is going to weigh heavily in this process. We have to ensure that we protect the sovereignty of our state and our people. We have to ensure that the things that we put in this constitution are very important for the entire territory moving forward. Speaker, one of the areas that has been very, and the member for um, the deputy speaker raised this point, and one of the processes that we, we failed at in the last constitutional review is the involvement of 
a wide cross-section of the territory in that process, specifically our young people. I, at the time, I think, and, and I think the member, the, the territorial, the member for the second, I think he was home as well, and the transportation minister was home as well. Young professionals just coming home from university, and I don't think none of us were engaged in that process, were we? We had a conversation offline that not one of us, and now here we start sit right now, persons staring that direction, was not involved in that process. We have a responsibility to don't let that happen for the next generation going forward. If we are to move forward with the level of advancements that we're speaking about here in this house over the next couple of days, that we spoke about over the next couple of days, we have to insist, we have to ensure that those young people that came to us during the Black Lives Matter discussion, all the other young persons on the blocks in every community around this territory are engaged and are engaged meaningfully. Engage one in terms of what is currently represented in this constitutional construct, and two, ensure that they participate meaningfully in the entire process to ensure that their wishes, their views, their aspirations are articulated and documented. And I think uh, in one of the areas that I'm very happy that we've decided and Premier made a very clear in his initial presentation is that nothing is off limits in this process. We need to have a constitutional construct that represents the will and the wish of the people. We have to get our people to understand when we speak about self-determination, what that means, when we speak about independence, what that means, and how, as a territory, we could advance and maintain the level of strength that we have in terms of economy, and we can build on the economy. The issue of Brexit, I think, is critical because we have had a good relationship in terms of the EU. Many of the infrastructure, I heard the Minister of Education ask if the UK has built any schools. We just had, we had the Culinary Arts um, Institution. That was built through funding through the EU in our relationship by extension of the UK in, with the EU. With Brexit, we don't know what that would leave us. The frameworks that we've developed concerning um, consumer protection, the Virgin Islands Trade Commission, all those things were funded through the COSME program. Another program that was funded by the European Union. So, with the new Brexit and what Brexit will look like, does that mean that we do not have our relationships with the EU and we can't form other relationships or partnerships? And the technical wing at the college as well was built through EU funding. So we have to look at the issue of the mature partnership that my colleagues continue to speak about. I'm not going to go back into all the aspects that has been already raised already, and I think they were very well articulated. But the reality is that the partnership has to be a true partnership, a partnership built on mutual respect, mutual aspiration, a partnership that supports the rights and aspiration of the Virgin Islander moving forward. And we, as we engage this process, we have to ensure that we don't leave anything out. You have several tiers of a relationship with one, what, you, what we call um, overseas, um, one, what you would call a UK the relationship with us. You have several tiers of our relationship. You have this, the cities who has one level of the relationship. You have Bermuda, where you have a constitution where the civil service is being run by a commission under the, the responsibility of the 
the cabinet secretary. You have situations where many of the alignment in their constitution fits ourselves, and there's a, there's, a, there's a common thread as it relates to There's a common thread as it relates to the reserve powers of the UK in all the constitutions. Though the Bermuda Constitution is seeming to be well, more advanced than our constitution, there seems to be a common thread in terms of the UK's reserve powers. And I believe that that is something, and I've heard many members, Mr. Speaker, for the next past couple of days, speak about that reserve power of the, of the, of the, the governor and the governor exercising those powers. We have a process, and as a, if we have a partnership in a, in a respectful partnership, there's a budgetary process. We, as a House of Assembly, bring forward our budget on behalf of the people of this territory. There's budget estimates. There's a process for ensuring that initiatives are met, are done in the budget process. And we, we now have a, a major sap that we're exercising in a, in a couple of minutes, a few minutes, because of COVID-19. <laughs> it's a budget exercise. A few minutes, I, I, I'm not going to be much longer. <laughs> it's a budget exercise. I, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the pain that uh, hard workers have been enduring for the next, last couple of days. So I'm going to be responsible tonight. And I think my colleagues have been, done an excellent job in terms of putting on, 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 on record a lot of the position. So we have to ensure that there's no, set, there's no two sets of rules. If the Premier wants to get additional funding, do additional project, there's a process in the Constitution that speaks to doing a supplementary appropriation in, in the law. So we're tonight doing a supplementary appropriation to appropriate monies for additional spending or reallocating funds for additional spending. You cannot have a process where any, the governor in this case, and, I, and I, when I say the governor, I don't mean the person, I mean the institution of the governor, dips in to our consolidated funds, and that's not our elected, elected members, the people's money, and spend that money where they wish. That has to go through a proper process. And I believe that those type of, those type of elements within our constitution currently, we need to look at in, in depth and how we can make the necessary adjustments to ensure that there's clear accountability across the board as it relates to our financial situation. So because one of the areas, and a lot of areas that were raised by our colleagues in terms of, of vision and some of the elements that person would like to see adjusted. And when we're talking about institution building, we have to look at our biggest institution of them all, the building of our people. We have done I would say we've, we've, we've dropped the ball in many cases in ensuring that our people are placed at the forefront of the institutions in this territory. Mr. Speaker, I saw recently in the news, and it was very, I, I felt a kind of melancholy kind of feeling because there was this excitement that we now have a local AG and a local DPP. I didn't feel the same level of excitement because that should be expected. We should be expected that the people in these positions should be our people. And we should be unapologetic 
to ensuring that our people are placed in these critical roles and these critical positions at this critical juncture of our country's development. We're talking about 70 years of constitutional advancement as relates to this legislature. We're talking about, the member just read a letter from 1938, speaking about the work that our people was doing, were doing from that time, ensuring that our people are placed in critical position. We cannot continue to allow these retrograde steps to happen. And it goes down to all the key positions. You have the Arthur General, we, we have a local there, and we should keep a local there. And succession planning is critical for ensuring, if we're talking about moving to the next level, we have to make sure that we develop our people, that we not send them to school and educate them and ensure that they don't become institutionalized, as one of my friends told me, in terms of the doctrines of the day. We have to make sure that there's a clear line of succession planning for every critical position in this territory. That's how you build institutions. You build it through your people. You build your people who will then build the institutions. Nothing is wrong with bringing persons in to have knowledge transfer. And I, and I like to use the example often of Robert McTavius. And it's fitting that the member for the second read the, the excerpt from Mr. McTavius' speech back in 1998. I say this without fear of contradiction. Though he was never a political leader, Robert McTavius has been one of the greatest leaders this country has ever seen. He's now on the way out in terms of retirement, and you could see the institution that he built in the Financial Services Commission to the point where if he leaves tomorrow, there's about four or five persons capable of taking that position or taking up that top job. You empower your people, and your people build institutions. There was a point when the initial years of the Financial Services Commission, when you had persons that came in, brought expertise, but we, were insu we, we ensured, and Mr. McTavis ensured, that those individuals helped to empower and build our people. And we have a responsibility. And we cannot, as a people, and, and I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm, and I'm sure, we have to be politically mature as well to ensure that we put people in the right spaces. We cannot continue to put square pegs in wrong holes. You have to put persons where they can be successful, where they can ensure that the process and the institution continues to remain strong and viable. And we have to put aside political differences as a small nation to ensure that the right people, the right persons are placed in the right roles to build those institutions. And we cannot continue to change the rules and change based on our personality or how we feel at a particular time. So the, the issue of building up our people and building up or institution through our people is going to be critical in this entire process. And the memo for the third went through the entire constitution, but there's a section that speaks to our human rights, the human rights chapter in this territory. And I believe that is a critical component as well in terms of the elements that we need to ensure are strengthened. 
We have the Human Rights Commission. It's been 13 years, and we've yet to establish a commission. And one of the things that we do very well in this territory is that we build edifices, we, we do a very good job on building, on, on putting in place legislation, putting in place um, these constitutional documents and all the, re the relevant documents. But we're not very well, we don't do a good enough job in terms of implementation. We have to do a better job in ensuring that the implementation happens. We're 13 years old. And we've yet to ensure that the references of executive council still prevalent throughout all our legislation. We need to have an implementation process. So when we move forward with this new constitutional construct, we have to ensure that there's a clear path to ensuring whatever decisions that we make going forward as a people, whatever is the, the, the direction that we determine that we want to go, and I think that is something, a vision that has to be a shared vision from the 13 of us in here. We have to formulate that vision. And we have to ensure that it's executed. And one of the areas that was discussed, and, and the member for the, and, and, and this is something that we discussed at, as the member for the fort, with the member for the fort, the issue of term limits. We have to figure out, and, I, and it's something that is done, I know Cayman Islands in their constitution what, was able to put term limits, and I want us to read a specific section. You permit me, Mr. Speaker. That speaks to and it's, it's section 49.4, Cayman Islands Constitution. It says, notwithstanding subsections two and three, the governor shall not appoint as premier a person who has held office as premier during two consecutive parliamentary terms unless at least one parliamentary term has expired since he or she last held that office. And for the purpose of this subsection, a parliamentary term shall be deemed to be a period commencing when the Legislative Assembly first met after being constituted under this Constitution or after the dissolution at any time and terminating when the Assembly is next dissolved. So this says that the office of premier would have whomever that person is, the whole of that office, but only hold the office for two consecutive terms. Something that we might want to consider is something that I think we should consider. Because you want to be able to have capacity building in your territory. You don't want to have group think and create kingdoms. That person has the ability or the opportunity to come back after one term off as being a premier. But is it something that I think that we need to consider as we go as we go do the review? Something that we need to look at very keenly. Another area for review is to ensure the necessary checks and balance. One of the things that the member for the seven raised this point in terms of seats in parliament, in the, in the, the French parliament. I think there's a, there's a, there was a, a, a discussion on uh, a member for the third when we were supposed to go to the PAC meeting concerning the ability to have a seat at the table. Just similar to how St. Thomas has a seat at the table in the U.S. Congress, even though they don't have a vote, 
but at least they are part of the discourse as we relate to the way forward for the territory. The territory's will and their voice and the will of the people is being debated in the parliament on their behalf. I know there's a, there's a specific approach that this could happen. I think this is something that we need to consider, we need to look at and explore as a possibility for us moving forward. But all in all, the approach has to be an inclusive approach, has to be an approach that creates a respectful relationship going forward. You heard a lot of the, the discourse that was happening here in the House for the last couple of days. And we have to ensure that if we're having a true partnership, it has to be a true partnership. The issue of dipping into the consolidated fund is something that we need to look at. And overall, the overall powers of the governor is something that needs to be discussed in totality. The people of the territory need to understand what those powers are, how they impact our operations, how we impact the way that we run our affairs as a territory. And we have to ensure, as I said earlier, that, that the youth of this territory are, are keenly involved in that process. In the entire review and constitutional review of this territory. One of the good things is that we, we've established timelines the key step now is to ensure that the vision in terms of the legislature, the elected representatives is clear, to ensure that the committee is comprised of a proper cross-section of this entire territory. It represents the true view and, and picture and, and dynamics of the people of this territory. To ensure that we get the best possible relationship. And I, and, I, and I think we should not compromise. We should not make any compromises as it relates to our way forward as a people. I think we have an opportunity. And we have to look at this from the economic context. We have to ensure that we have the ability to have the level of partnerships that we've had over the years with the EU, and we need to have clearly stated how does those relationships will be looked at. So, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the overall conversation and the process. I think that we have had a a good dialogue, as I said to you, I didn't intend to speak too long tonight. A overall dialogue in terms of some key points have come out of this two-day debate in terms of some of the key things that we could look at to ensure that the terms of reference are clear, that they represent the will and aspirations of the people of this territory, we must ensure that we have maximum participation of our people, all our people. And we need to make sure that we're, our vision is clear, that there's no ambiguity in terms of our approach forward. All of us have to be on the same page in terms of what we're aspiring to achieve as a territory. And we have to make sure that our people, and there's one element of this that has been discussed, and, 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 and it's, it's fitting that, again, we're through, going through the emancipation season. And I'm wanna, I want to pull up something, and it, and it speaks to 
the issue, not so much an issue, but a discussion that's happening in terms of, and it's been a, a growing discussion in terms of the indigenous peoples of the Virgin Islands or, or what constitutes an indigenous people. And I want to, again, um, member for the, um, for the seven, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that we're having the cultural appraise still because I think it's important for us during this emancipation season and, and it's fitting that we're doing a constitutional review during our emancipation season. We have started a process during this season. I don't know if that's what designer it just happened. That our ancestors and the work that they've done to get this, to get us to this point, do not go unnoticed. That the work they've done to build a modern economy from a point where in the report, Crowfoot, it, the, the name is, is Crowfoot report that said that we were left as a board sanctuary. And, and that was the case because, and I think we, we, mis, we misunderstand the whole issue of slavery. Slavery wasn't that they, they didn't like us, you know. You know, they didn't like us as a people. It's, slavery was economics. And the fact that they decided to leave because that we didn't seem to be economically viable anymore. And, but all of a sudden there seems to be some attraction. There's something that seems to be very attractive these days about the Virgin Islands. So, you know, so there's a new attraction. And we must, we must never forget our ancestors. And that's why I'm, 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 I'm I have to say this because, not because we want to protect and preserve the people or there's this debate whether what's, what's really indigenous or the Virgin, the Virgin Islander who's been here for generations means that we're against anyone else who've come to call the BBI home. So not because I'm for preserving my ancestors and our heritage means that we are against anyone else. And I want to outline, and I, and I, sh I want to share this, and I believe this heritage is true for at least three of us or four of us in this house in the Eastern Lano community. I know that they, there's someone in the gallery that fits this description too. We were doing a, um, I, I commissioned when I was um, doing the Minister for Trade, a true a, a, a community organization the ancestry study of our community. And I just pulled up the, the, the issue, and, and there was a 25, the 25 free slaves that were manumitted during, it was 17, help me out, remember for the seven, 17, 70, 76, almost a, almost a full 50 years before the rest of the territory was emancipated from slavery. And lo and behold, this study was done, and I looked at the names. And, and these are the 25 first three people in, the, in this hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere. And I looked at a particular name, it was a Margaret Nottingham, and I started to track Margaret Nottingham. And Margaret Nottingham, then had a descendant, which was Dora Nottingham, then a descendant who was member Potter, another descendant who was Eda Thomas, another descendant who was Patricia Elisa Thomas, called Lady Feck, a descendant who was Victoria Elisa Fret. A, de a, a descendant, I started to see some familiar names. I saw a uh, Henry Osmond Valak and a Magda Valak. I think, I think I know who that Magda Valak is. <laughs> and then I saw my name. Nine generations. 
from the persons who fought for their freedom, fought for ensuring that this land wasn't left to be a wasteland. They stayed when everyone else left. They toiled the land. They built an agricultural economy out of practically nothing. They were brought here not on their own volition. Nonetheless, they were here. And they fought to maintain this territory. That heritage has to come for something. That heritage has to be enshrined in some way. That heritage of resilience, the heritage of fortitude, that heritage of making something when the odds seem stacked against you. And it has to be enshrined some way, somehow. We have to figure it out, and the commission has to figure out a way to recognize the sacrifice that those persons have made. We have to respect their legacy, their contribution. I have to continue to tell that story to my son. He has to understand that he is a descendant of people, strong people. You need to, to, we need to be able to uplift our people. And that's what I said earlier when I, I heard the, the issue. I, I come from the school of Robert Mactavius. I come from the school where I believe that I could be anything. We could be anything. No one don't have to give me anything. We have the fortitude, the strength, the desire, the will to fight to be who we are as a people. That's who we are at Virgin Islanders. So we have to find a way to ensure that that story of resilience in the midst of all the things that we've been through, that story of resilience even today as the, at, in the midst of two category five hurricanes, in the midst of COVID-19 and the struggles that we're experiencing, that as Virgin Islanders, we are resilient people. We are people that are going to continue to fight and strive, and no one is going to determine or dictate our destiny. So that resilient fighting spirit has to be a part of our constitution. It has to be a part of protecting that he heritage and that legacy. And that's where, in the preamble, I think they, they tried to capture it in the preamble. It's six to. Whereas the people of the territory of the Virgin Islands have over centuries evolved with a distinct cultural identity, which is the essence of who we are as Virgin Islanders. That accounts for something. And we have to find a way to ensure that that is all enshrined. We, we, it's high time, Premier, that we define what that individual version of means. Give the, give the committee an opportunity to, find, to, to figure out this, the framework, how you, how you frame it. But we have to, to, to put that and define what that means to us as a people. It means something. So we cannot just gloss over who the indigenous Virgin Island is. Nine generations I represent of free people. Same is true, I'm sure, for many other members in this house. But that doesn't diminish the people who have come here and have made the BVI their home. That doesn't diminish the contributions they have made as well, which we respect and honor on a daily basis but we also have to respect and honor the contributions of our ancestors. So we have to figure out a way to ensure that that's enshrined some way in the constitutional construct. We also, as I, I continue to say, and I, and I need to say it like a broken record, that when we leave here and we go to discuss a way forward and the wish and the will of the people that we do it with one voice. A singular approach as it relates to where we're going as a people, as a territory. This is going to boil down to economics. 
The game has changed. The, dynamics, the, dynamics, the global dynamics has changed. We're up against Brexit. We're up against the UK now trying to find new economic partners. Amidst all of the challenges that we're facing, we have to ensure that we, nor our people, are not pawns in that game. We have to ensure that whatever decisions are made in terms of economic future, that we have a fair and equal seat around the table. But we as a people also have to ensure that we do the things that are necessary to empower our people. So we cannot just blame the UK and all the things that are related to the UK and absolve ourselves from our responsibilities. There are certain responsibilities that we also have as leaders, as leaders of in institutions, as leaders who are entrusted with some of the statutory organizations and all the things that we've established to show our maturity as a territory, our maturity as a nation over the last 70 years from our evolved powers. So we have to make sure that we put persons in place, as I continue to say, who have the capacity to do the things necessary to move that, those institutions forward. Speaker, one other particular aspect that I want to raise, and I want to read, I think it's important for me to read the preamble in its entirety because the people of the territory need to understand that this is, and they need to make sure, once this is read, they need to understand if this is the will or their will moving forward. And I'll start it. We as the people, if I may speak, Mr. Speaker, your permission to read the preamble. We as the people of the territory of the Virgin Islands have over centuries evolved with a distinct cultural identity, which is the essence of a Virgin Islander, acknowledging that the society of the Virgin Islands is based upon certain moral, spiritual, and the democratic values, including a belief in God, the dignity of the human person, the freedom of individual and respect for fundamental rights, and freedom and the rule of law. Mindful that the people of the Virgin Islands have expressed a desire for their constitution to reflect who they are as a people and a country and their quest for social justice, economic empowerment, and political advancement. Again, economic empowerment is going to be the crux of the way forward. Recognizing that the people of the Virgin Islands have a free and independent spirit and have developed themselves and their country based on qualities of honesty, integrity, mutual respect, self-reliance, and the ownership of the land engendering a strong sense of belonging to and kinship with those islands. Recalling that because of historical, economic, and other reasons, many of the people of the Virgin Islands reside elsewhere, but have and continue to have an ancestral connection and bond with those islands, accepting that the Virgin Islands should be governed based on adherence to well-established democratic principles and institutions, affirming that the people of the Virgin Islands have generally expressed their desire to become a self-governing people and to, and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of their country at this stage of its development. And, no and noting that the United Kingdom, the administering power, and, and you know we have a challenge with that, for the time being has articulated a desire to enter into a modern partnership with the Virgin Islands based on the principles of mutual respect and self-determination. Now, 
Therefore, the following provision have effect as a constitution of the Virgin Islands. This, in, 20, in 2007, was the will and aspirations of the people of the Virgin Islands. We have to ensure, through this process, that this indeed is still the will and aspiration of the people of the territory. As I said in the beginning, I support this process. I believe it's a process that is necessary. We need to have more self-autonomy, but it has to be rooted in our institutions. We have to ensure that we strengthen our institutions and strengthen the individuals within those institutions to ensure that as a, as a Virgin Islands and as a people, we continue to move forward from strength to strength. As is discussed, Premier, I'm hoping that at the end of this process, we, we said we'll have an informal discussion to, to, to sort of iron out the terms of reference. I know we have the strive has been doing a good job in terms of what has been documented. And I think once that clarity is set, in terms of the terms of reference, we put to ensure that we have, I think it's three members on the opposition side, which we've been, we have been able to negotiate an additional member premier, and eight on the government side, to ensure that we have a, a, a committee that goes out and executes based on the terms of reference, but based on whatever scope the people of this territory deem is important for them. Because at the end of the day, this is their constitution. This is their document and their way forward. Our, at, at the end of the way, we're, we're all members of the same Virgin Islands community. And we look forward to the, our further deliberations. I think this is, a, this is going to be an ongoing process. I think the timeline set premier six months. But I want to make sure that we, before we start the process premier, that we get the the literature or a clear breakdown specific to the current constitution, all the sections, all the parts, and what it means to the people of this territory in user-friendly format. And I also want to encourage us, Premier, you, you want the, the documentation, the historical documentation to build a repository so that all the people of this territory have access to that information so they could understand from whence we came so they can understand the struggles and the challenges that we have moving forward, and some of the conventions which have been clearly articulated in this Honorable House forms part of our direction and our way forward. I think, Mr. Speaker, I, I would rest there. I know we have a couple other issues on, on the docket, so I thank you for your time, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Leader of the Opposition, the member of the 8th District, Honorable Mellon A. Penn. Before I call on the Premier to close, we'll, break, we'll take a recess for five minutes.
Please be seated. This House resumes its sitting. Honourable members, every member sitting in the well of the chambers have had a chance to debate the motion before this Honourable House on the constitutional review and the formation of the commission. I therefore ask the sponsor of the motion, the leader of government business, Premier and Minister of Finance, and member for the first district, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy, to wrap up the debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've had two days of very fruitful debate about the constitutional review, constitutional review exercise that will be on the way. And Mr. Speaker, in having that debate, we saw that that most persons were very clear that they want further political advancement for the people of the Virgin Islands and also constitutional advancement for the people of the Virgin Islands. I'm very proud of this House of Assembly that despite our difference in methodology, when we debate other topics, because there'll always be some for and some against, but for a topic of this magnitude, I'm proud of the House of Assembly, how we were able to debate this, not looking at where we are, but looking at where we want to go, and looking down through time, and recognizing that this will outlast all time in office. And I'm proud to know that the debate went to the magnitude of letting us to know, Mr. Speaker, that we have to not only think out of the box, or throw away the box, and not get involved in kicking the can down the road because we're running out of the road to kick the can. Mr. Speaker, we have been grown to be programmed to such things that when the member for the third district used a word, we actually thought it was an illegal word. But really and truly, it is a legal word, Mr. Speaker, and I know that you pull him up on it when he said we don't need to be pussyfooting around. But let me help you, Mr. Speaker. Pussyfoot is a verb. And it says act in a cautious or non-committal way. Premier, it's in the dictionary. Premier, while I recognize that that word is in the dictionary, uh, if you take away the last part of that word, it creates its own sensation. So I'll prefer that that word not be used. You see, Mr. Speaker, while I have to respect that as your house, that's what I'm talking about when we get programmed. Continue. When we, the member for the third district said that and it created a disturbance, Mr. Speaker, but what I'm trying to say is that when we get programmed, and you know, Mr. Speaker, that is the whole essence of this debate. I remember a story that was partially said in, in psychology, but I got it from an old man in Caribbean one day, and he said, you know, the problem with being free is that you have to force having your mind that you want to be free, and you have to also be disciplined when you get free. And you have to know how to guard yourself accordingly. I call it policing yourself. And he told me about a story about a rat in a glass box, a huge glass box. And the, and the rat was in this box, and you could see through this glass box. And the rat was running around from, from each uh, border of the glass and putting up into the glass. For five years, he stayed in there. They would throw a little food in it. He would be just running and hitting a 
And then after five years, I took up the box. And that's a study also in psychology. But this is a part that wasn't in psychology that he told me. He said when they took up the box, the rat actually was going to the edge and coming back because he was so accustomed to being in a glass case that whenever he go to the edge where he knew the glass was, he would turn back. Till one day he went so hard running to the edge that he actually went over the line where the glass was and he recognized that I'm free. I'm actually free. But the rat realized he was free. He just turned off running wild, 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 wild. And he went straight onto the highway and got run down. And he said that's the problem when people can't handle freedom. Because when it's given to you, if you're not ready for it and you don't position yourself, he said, you will do the wrong things when you become free. But there are some... So, much, so many things to learn from that story. Because we are uh, here speaking, and I listen to us, and one of the things I've learned as the year in change, as the premier of this territory, and I want to say it's going to be very hard, and it's going to be very, very gruesome for some to hear, but I've learned that no matter how much you prance in this house about what rights we should have as a people, those who have their own interpretation of the Constitution don't change. As a matter of fact, while you're in here, they might be writing you about things that they feel going wrong. They don't change. That's why I don't like to say this, but if they don't understand that the people of the Virgin Islands have a passion to, to transform, not only change, and we must be listened to. If you don't believe me, look at when we marched and all of us came out against the public register. They ignored the whole country. That's the mentality of some of who we're dealing with. And they say it's done happen, There's, you could match until you want. Did you see anything change? As a matter of fact, they came after us even harder. And I don't want anyone to get an impression that you're fighting a, anyone. Because they're the masters at spinning things and making you seem like the villain. But the truth of the matter is, and I love what I heard with the debate from everyone is that we're fighting for something. And when you're fighting for something, it has a cost. Anything worth having has a cost. And I agree with all the members that spoke before that we have nothing against the UK. As a matter of fact, I have some very good friends from the UK and they are, they are the, the territory that we are now. We, we have nothing against the UK as a whole because I think it was Stevie Wonder and, um, and Paul McCarthy sang a song, Ebony and Ivory, um, Living Together in Harmony. We all know that people are the same. Wherever you go, they're good and bad. In everyone, we learn to love, we learn to live. We learn to live and love each other. So we know that wherever you go, there are going to be some good and some bad. We're concerned about this fraction that does not have the same mindset as we do in the Virgin Islands, but want to dictate for us and don't want to hear our voice, don't want to hear our cause, don't want to, us to even come to the table to say, this, these are the areas that we want in the constitutional review. Last time we saw that uh, um, in 2000 and before, and a, um, even after that, where the topics for discussion, as I said in my opening, was given. And, and the others were told that they were offline. We can't have that. And I want persons to know that we are in a good position. Because the interpretation of these constitution is what creates problem. For example, the member for the third district gave a very good example when he stated that in section 49, one and two of the constitution, which talks about when the governor is absent um, from the territory or absent from the seat of governor or seat of government, that the premier is the one who chairs cabinet. But we are faced where we have those who have the interpretation that it means that once the governor is absent in terms of the person and they give their responsibility to whoever is acting, 
that they will act, they will chair the cabinet. So a governor could be in Anigada and an acting governor in Tartola. How could you have two governors in the territory at the same time? How could the crafters of the Constitution be so far off that they didn't understand that when they did the 2007 Constitution, it was a prerequisite to start to get the premier to start to chair the cabinet altogether. That's what that move was. We were there together, my mother thought. That is what that was about. That was the spirit behind that. But here we see the, 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 the here we all of a sudden see a, 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 a misinterpretation. Well, I wouldn't call it misinterpretation because they honestly believe that how they interpret it is so. So where do you go as a territory when it says, and I quote it for the people of the Virgin Islands, that's why I said tell people, read the Constitution, understand the complexities of it and what we are fighting for. It says in 49.1, the governor shall so far as practicable attend and preside all meetings of cabinet of the cabinet too in the absence of the governor it didn't say it didn't say in the absence of his powers it said in the absence of the governor it didn't say in the absence of the acting governor it says in the absence of the governor the there shall preside at any meeting of the cabinet the premier or in his or her absence of deputy premier that tells me by putting the deputy premier in that it was to be the premier chairing and the premier is not in, then the deputy premier chairs. And it has shall. It doesn't say me. And that's section 49. But then there are those who read in section 39 of the constitution that states that wherever the governor, A, has occasion to be absent from the seat of government, but not from the Virgin Islands. B, has occasion to be absent from the Virgin Islands for a period which he or she has reason to believe will be of short duration. Or C, suffering from any illness which he or she has reason to believe will be of short duration. I don't know how they know that. The governor may act in his or her discretion by instrument under the public seal, appoint the deputy governor, or if the deputy governor is not available, any other person in the Virgin Islands who is a Virgin Islander lander, as defined in section 65.2, to be his or her deputy during such absence or illness, and that capacity to perform his or her, beh on his or her behalf such of the functions of the office of governor as may be specified in that instrument. The power and authority of the governor shall be affected by the appointment of the deputy of a deputy under the section and the deputy shall comply with such instructions as the governor acting in his or her discretion from time to time address to the deputy but the question whether or not a deputy has in any matter complied with any such instruction shall not be inquired upon inquired into in any court so here you see that the governor has the right to give all of his authority to the person who is either going to be the acting governor, the, the deputy to governor, depending on if they, he's still in the territory. But he did not give away being the governor. He's still the governor. If you meet the governor in Anigara and you meet the deputy to governor, the acting governor in Tartola, how could you have two governors in the territory at the same time? It's not possible. That's not the spirit of what the Constitution was written in. This is why we need a constitutional review to be clear, because there are those who are interpreting it right now to mean that whoever they put and give the authority to that they can chair cabinet. And no one can tell them otherwise. And I have called for a judiciary review on this. Because it cannot be clear. In my village, they said donkeys with wooden glasses could see it. That in the absence of the governor, there shall preside at any meeting of the cabinet, the premier. It's not that you want the power, it's what's written. So our challenge is not only to put what needs to be put in the, in the constitution, it's also to be able to overcome some of the willful ways of misinterpreting what is put in there and have it as so 
and then tell you nothing you can do about it, this is it. That is not right in the 21st century. And it cannot stand. And when you speak on these things, they say that you're being disrespectful or, or you want power. You don't want anything. You want what the Constitution says. You cannot be in the river, in on the bank, at the same time. But I got a step further. When we analyze the post of deputy governor, that's why when I ask why are public officers meeting with the governor and the deputy governor, they tell me, well, what you're talking about, that's how it is, you don't want a public service. Yeah, but there still has to be certain independence because the Public Service Commission deals with all matters. The Premier's office is the lead office. But all of a sudden, we have allowed ourselves to misinterpret the Constitution and through intimidation, allow it to be the other way around. For example, the magistrate cannot go and watch the person, tell them, look, um, this is how you're going to act, watch them commit a crime, and then sit over the case. And they were involved in everything from the onset, and then when it happens, try to divorce themselves till it gets back to them. It doesn't work that way. There's some independence that needs to be had, which reminds me too in the Constitution, it also has a section that, that the, the governor uses, in the post of governor, that uses, says um, when it prejudices Her Majesty's service, he can override certain things or she can override certain things. That also have to be reanalyzed and redefined in the new Constitution. Because I have seen where Public Service Commission rightfully made decisions. Then they came back and were asked to relook it by the governor. And they came back with the same thing, same decision. And the governor overrode it, say, write it saying that this I have to do because it prejudices Her Majesty's service. That is not the spirit in which it was written in the Constitution. Who do you turn to? When you bring up these things, there are some of our people that tell you, leave these things alone. Be careful. The governor is after you. He's after the government. Every governor that comes after every government because that's how we leave it be. But it's not a matter after anybody. It's a matter of fighting for what is right, what is due to you. We fought for it in the Constitution. It's in here. It is written. Those things are used in the prejudice of Majesty's service when there are some extreme cases. But since it's being misinterpreted, we have to get that redefined in the new constitution. Now I do agree that we have to put systems in place to govern ourselves. I 100% agree with that because you don't want someone to get in the office and, and we move towards our own self-determination as we go step by step and there's nothing in place to control a leader that goes rogue. So we have to have those things in place. I don't care who's in the seat, whether it's me or who. Nobody does what's expected, they only do what's inspected. And if you don't have any, any policies or procedures to inspect them by day, we'll do whatever they please. And you can't have that. But that also must hold for a governor in the 21st century. Nobody is above reproach. No one may say that they are have to act on behalf of the queen. Okay, we're gonna come to that. And one may say that the public service of the UK is what they are under, not when they reach here, when they reach here, the governor, that doesn't hold for them anymore. It's a new thing. We've been trained to look at each other. We've been trained to look at each other's faults. You, I went in a school one day before COVID-19, and I asked them to, to um, do a little sum, and they were doing the sum, and I tell them, go and help out this one. The, the first thing the fellow went and tell him, why are you so stupid, the thing wrong? And I listened to the language of some of them. It's always a negative come out of our mouth first. Even when somebody help us to do something, before we tell them, thanks, I appreciate you with that, this little section you're looking at, what stupidness are you doing? We've been trained for a long time to come with a negative force, rather than seeing the positive. Don't talk about this little territory near the BBI. You commit one wrong in your life here that wants you to hold, hold down you from now till thy kingdom come. 
But yet the people who are accusing you commit more sin than you, but they're hiding it. They're hiding the major sin out of the Ten Commandments that are committed. They're hiding that one that they, 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 they violated and, and preaching to you that you need to do better by the other nine. But go through the Ten Commandments and you'll find the sin that they have, no matter what color or creed they are. Because nobody is beyond reproach. You can't measure it. I bring up these things because when I go to section 40, 38, when I was talking about why do we have them meeting with, with the senior officers, I want to explain something about the function of a deputy governor. And it's nothing towards the person in the seat. They're going against it in the Constitution. It's a role to assist the governor. And 38 1 says, subject to subsection 2, the deputy governor shall A, assist the governor in the exercise of his or her functions relating to matters for which the governor is responsible under section 60. B says, assist the governor. Both of them start with assist. In the exercise of such of, of his or her fun, other functions, being functions in the exercise of which the governor is not obliged to act in accordance with the advice of any other person or authority, as the governor acting in his or her discretion may direct. And C, this is section 38C. I, 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 next to my Bible, I live in this constitution. My constitution probably marked up. C says, perform such other functions not of a ministerial nature. Therefore, the Constitution says that at no time the deputy governor is supposed to be given anything that has a ministerial nature. Because the Constitution changed to allow the premier and the premier's office to be the one to control those sections. But you've got to tell that now to 70% of the public service. They ain't got you to study. And based on the intimidation they're on, the underground int intimidation, you can't blame them. But these are things we have to address. And it takes people with courage to do it. And you know something about a partnership? A partnership could never have these issues if both of us are clear what the goals are and have the same mindset going to it. It cannot. So we have to make sure that we put that in our mind. So when we're talking about the, some other areas that I'd like to check on as we go through, to make sure that we understand the magnitude of what we're doing. Another area, Mr. Speaker, because a lot has been said in this debate on the need for a constitutional review in the Virgin Islands. And honorable members spoke from their hearts as they encapsulated in their own unique ways what it means to be a Virgin Islander. But Mr. Speaker, a lot of information was covered a lot of history and many perspectives was covered. When I get, what I get from this constitutional debate is that there is widespread agreement that we need to revisit our constitutional arrangement and the time to do so is now. So when I analyze it, Mr. Speaker, we have to ensure that we remain steadfast in purpose and diligent in actions. But Mr. Speaker, I can't stop there. There's a other area, Mr. Speaker, that we have to make clear in the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker, that area is the area of how does one report to the United Kingdom. I want to explain what I mean by that, Mr. Speaker. In the current arrangements, no matter who's the Premier, this is holds. The post of governor can write to the UK without copying to the governor, without copying to the premier. So they could write anything and send it to the UK dealing with the premier. They could paint the premier black he doesn't know. Till when he goes UK and he hears some of the things being spit out. And at that time now you're, you're fighting from behind. But if the premier writes to the UK, he must copy the, the governor. Those are things we have to get adjusted. 
not even natural justice states clearly that both sides should know and have an opportunity to tell their side. Now, I don't mind at all you know, writing and copying, copying in the governor anytime I'm, I'm writing. Because I, I, if I write something, I feel that I could stand firm to, to what I wrote. I feel that I can, can, can justify anything that I have written and, and, and believe in it once I write it. So, Mr. Speaker, that is another area that we have looked at that we must be able to, to check on. Now, there's a, one of the things that we want to look at is, while I'm it, at it, is members must understand that this constitutional review calls for us to look at Proverbs 4.23. I was looking at that lately, and it says, basically, that keep vigilant. And it said, watch over your hat. That's where life starts. And if in your hat, whether it be the, those in the UK, those in the governor's office, though the governor or premier is for the best for the people of the Virgin Islands based on their aspirations and needs, not what we think, but based on their aspirations and needs, we will get it to them because we are all working on the same agenda. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I heard some talk too that I must address in the closing about Section 103. And many members spoke about it. The Deputy Speaker spoke about it, the concern of that being the Constitution. The, 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 the Deputy Premier, Minister Health, spoke about it, the member for the fourth, and even the third touched on it. And Mr. Speaker, that caused me to do some reflection. Because in the Constitution where there's a warrant issued by the governor, which means the governor can take up and go into the Treasury to get what he sees fit, especially if you're dealing with subjects around him that he thinks need more money. So many members spoke about that, but that in itself is a retrograde step in our constitutional advancement. I remember, Mr. Speaker, and I went to research. I, I love the research. I remember at a press conference in the afternoon of 24th March 2017 on the steps of the Central Administration Building, a historic move was made on the people of the Virgin Islands. On the 24th March 2017, in a press conference, His Excellency the Governor John S. Duncan OBE made a statement to the media on the warrant by the Governor under Section 103 of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007. And I quote, Following discussions at the National Security Council on 16 March, I invoked the governor's powers under Section 103 of the Virgin Islands Constitution to A, address the shortfall and approve funding under the BVI 2017 budget and thus confront the impact on the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force capabilities and the consequent reduction in the force's ability to tackle criminality in the territory. B, to meet the cost of and ensure disbursements of funds required to protect, prosecute two major cases. Mr. Speaker, the issue for the court cases was uh, accurately reported by BBI Platinum in their article of 17 March. Date line time was 7.54. Mr. Speaker, that's the end of the well, it continues. I have today issued the formal warrant to give effect to this decision and instructed the Financial Secretary and the Accountant General to now proceed as instructed by the warrant. The Financial Secretary wrote to the Governor earlier this week, copy to the Premier, setting out his understanding of the existing uh, author authorizations and approvals in relation to the five heads concerned by the decision. The Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, the Attorney General's Chambers, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, the Magistrates and Supreme Courts. In the papers, put to the National Security Council and in the discussion at the meeting, I explained my view that I was not satisfied that the shortfall of the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force annual operating budget had been adequately addressed with, co with, with commitment risk to the internal security of the territory. 
I also made clear my concerns about the delays and disbursements of funds to both the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force and the legal services of the territory. The Financial Secretary's memo serves to underline the lack of clarity over what funds have been authorized, by whom and the current state of disbursement and the funds that remain available. This lack of transparency is not conducive to proper accounting, accountability, and operational effectiveness. In order to address this, I have set out in the second schedule to the warrant a complete overview of the funding authorized and governed by the warrant, as well as the purposes for which these funds are required. The second schedule is independent of and separate from any approvals provided under the 2017 budgetary process or those currently underway in the supplementary additional provision SEP. Disbursements of funds already authorized should be honored and, if cited under this warrant, will now be subject to the reports required under the warrant. The total funding covered by the warrant issued today is $1.88 million. It is the responsibility of the Financial Secretary and the Accountant General to advise the Premier and myself on the exact drawdown required from the Consolidated Fund and to ensure that any existing approvals under the 2017 budgetary process or those currently underway in the supplementary ad additional provisions SAP are reconciled with the Governor's warrant so as to achieve the purpose for which the warrant was issued. End of quote. No one would think that we would be happy that that happened to our government. But that's a retrograde step in our constitutional advancement. And that evening, a territory-wide broadcast, let me go ahead, was made by the then Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. The Honorable D. Orlando Smith OB, on this matter. In fact, we were finishing up the House of Assembly that day. I remember it like yesterday. And at a press conference on the afternoon of the 24th March 2017 on the steps of the Central Administration Building, the then Premier and Minister of Finance, Dr. The Honorable D. Orlando Smith OB, said, and I quote, his Excellency the Governor John S. Duncan indicated that he had instructed or would be instructing the Financial Secretary pursuant to Section 103 of the BBI Constitution to provide $800,000 for the police monies which were repeatedly asked for to augment the police force. I am not sure what the motive of the Governor was in calling this press conference, but the people of this territory will recall that we have just concluded our budgetary process where the Honorable House has allocated $16.1 million to the police force, an increase over 2016 of $770,000, approximately 5%. There is no shortfall in the budget. To the contrary, there is an increase. Moreover, as you will see from the information which I shall provide in detail, there are several initiatives that are currently being processed for the benefit of the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force. In short, the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force has or are about to receive not only their increased budgetary sum, but also uh, other payments at the Treasury that are needed to carry out its duty of safety and security. Let me assure the people of the Virgin Islands that special budgetary attention is always given to the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force. The same is true as well for the other law enforcement organs of the Governor's Group, such as the Magistracy, the Attorney General Chambers, and the Supreme Court. We consider all of these to be important pieces required in the proper function and security of the people of this territory. Additionally, in the case where matters come up from, for which there are no budgetary allocation, especially when items arise after the budget process, the police are always, without exception, given extra consideration and funds made available to meet commitments as they arise." End of quote. Now, normally this is done through a decision made at the National Security Council level. The cabinet or on instructions of, to the Ministry of Finance by, by myself. Now, I've never during my tenure as Minister of Finance, this is now still quoting Dr. S, Dr. D. Orlando Smith, I've never during my tenure as Minister of Finance received anything but the fullest cooperation from the Ministry of Finance on these matters. End of quote. Mr. Speaker, in my presentation yesterday, I said history does not repeat itself. People repeat history. And therefore, we must be alert so that history does not repeat itself where and when it should not. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's important for the people of the Virgin Islands to understand these sections of the Constitution. Because when you're examining Section 103 of the Constitution, Mr. Speaker, permit me, if you will, to just spend a short moment in Section 103 of the Constitution since it was raised in the debate. Section 103.1 is a recipe for conflict. It states, and I quote, 
No money shall be withdrawn from the consolidated fund except on the authority of a warrant under the hand of the minister charged with responsibility for finance. In this chapter referred to as the minister, but where in the opinion of the governor acting in his or her discretion, monies are required to enable the governor to discharge his or her responsibilities under section 60, such monies may be drawn from the consolidated fund either A, on the authority of a warrant under the hand of the minister, or B, on the authority of a warrant under the hand of the governor acting in his or her discretion. End of quote. So, Mr. Speaker, we see that everything else in this country could suffer. But the Constitution, Mr. Speaker, which give us the finance, give finance to us, that if the governor, forget who's in the post, feels that the subjects under him needs more funding, can go into our money and take it out. Don't mind custom in under them. Don't mind immigration in under them, and that's law enforcement. That's not, that's not their concern. Only the subjects was under them as a governor they can go into. And people are going to tell me that we don't have things to fight for in this constitution, the review that's coming up. So on one hand, it would appear that this provision is to prevent the underfunding of the governor in the fulfillment of his functions. Because that's how it seems. No department of government and no arm in the governance apparatus should be deliberately underfunding. And no government does that. I have yet to see a government that has not properly or tried their best based on budgetary uh, constraints fund the police properly. But I've seen in my 20 years, not just now, because I know that those who are just going to talk about five now with the governor, I, I have nothing there with the entity. You change the person, they're going to still have an issue because the issue is the Constitution and its interpretation. You change the premier, it's going to happen still. And I have seen that whenever the police feel, and don't get me wrong, we need them, I love them, that they need more funding and they don't get it quick enough, they go to the governor, no matter who was in charge. And then the pressure comes on. But yet, customs and, and immigration are law enforcement too, but they're not under his group. And you're trying to balance it, all ministers of finance, but the Constitution allows a loophole for any subject under the governor. That needs to be clogged up. It needs to be amended to reflect what it is, the realities on the ground. But it is right and fair to allow anyone to override the management of the territory finances by the minister charged with that responsibility. Is that right? How can two people be in charge of the same checkbook and spending out of the same checkbook at the same time? Nine out of ten times, you have an overdraft. And then when the overdraft comes, it's the responsibility of the minister of finance. We see the paradox in this. And when you question these things, people are saying that, why are you... Why are you doing that? Let me warn the people of this territory. This is nothing fighting against anybody. And I know I, I have to face this. I face this from the time I come from here. a lot I say. Because I realized I started to sing the song a lot right out your storm. Till when I ready and had enough. Because there are some people who think they could intimidate you because they have power in the constitution. They ain't happy with the Irish boy. I'm going to be fair, I'm going to respect anybody in the post of governor, but I'm not going to be sitting on letting them disrespect me because they have a constitution that giving them power that is, is paradoxical to your rights in the 21st century. That has to be reviewed. This section provides the governor with the power to override the local government and reach into the paws of the BVI taxpayers based solely in his discretion. You know what discretion is? That's a, that's a heavy word, you know. I always careful when I tell a man, use your discretion. You don't know. When we were younger, and my sister and me, I was so, so foolish there. Younger, I used to tell them, man, go to the pot, take out what you want first and use your discretion. <laughs> man from Dennis, when I learned, stop using that word. By the time I reached the pot, I only washing it up. And I used to tell them, you only have no discretion. And they tell me, well, you tell me, use your discretion. But I was young, I didn't know the meaning of the word, you know. I just heard it, now we're using it. I hear the old people using it. 
So I tell, I told my sister, go to the pot and take out yours first and use your discretion. <laughs> when I gone, lo and behold, <laughs> the, you ever eat the bun rice on the bottom? That, that was mine. And only because I didn't get a finished scrape, it because I must be said, Lord, I have a little discretion. <laughs> so whenever I hear or see anything a lot telling somebody in his or her discretion, I get concerned. I think, I think about when I was younger, and, 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 and I never used to get nothing out of the pot. One needed a little bowl of rice to leave for me. And to wash up at that. And I, anybody who are young know that I hate to wash up pot. It allows him to write a blank check, you know. The whole 103 is written without any specific limitation for functions under his remit. And by contrast, under section 103 to the minister responsible for finance can only issue warrants for funds according to the approved budget. Hear the contradiction? The minister of finance now could only approve, um, issue warrants for funds according to the approved budget, but not the governor. A supplementary appropriation or for statutory expenditure. So it limits the minister of finance what he could use a warrant for. But it doesn't limit the governor wants to deal with his group. This is nothing against anybody. This is common sense. The smallest a child picked this up reading or ask you, how come? So here you have a situation where the minister, the government, and the House of Assembly have, a set, have set a budget based on what the territory and what taxpayers can afford to spend against the projected revenues. They don't check. They didn't tell them that the governor has to check to see if he could afford it or not, you know. Just go in and take it out. And then how you figure out the rest, that's up to you and the people of the Virgin Islands. But his subject will be okay. So the portfolios under elected government ministers must cut and fit and compromise to make the ends meet. But the governor has a free reign for his area. Not only that, but when monies are spent outside of what is budgeted for, would that not throw off the territory's budget, budget, budgeting and, financing, and finances? Further, you have a situation where two persons can spend from the till, as I said. One person has rigid constraints, the other has no constraints, but only one person who is held ultimately accountable for the state of the finances, and that is a person who is under the rigid constraints. I'll carry it further. Only one person can come to the house to answer for the two. <laughs> because the governor can't come to the house. So when the house asks for the money, the Minister of Finance that didn't have a hand in it have to come to the house to explain to the house how the money went, what he didn't take out. That's the magnitude of the lack of democracy in the 21st century. And because it is the Minister of Finance, the one of whom fingers are going to point, whether from the local population or from Her Majesty's Treasury, when it comes to questioning prudence, especially in the House of Assembly, if the Minister of Finance and the people of the BVI who are Dragged, is the Minister of Finance and the people of BVI who are dragged over the coals over the balance of revenues versus expenditure and the level of our savings and reserves and so forth. Is that fair? Is that right? If the Premier wanted to issue the warrants for these appropriations or expenditures to areas under the Governor's purview, the Premier has to come to the House of Assembly. That's another paradox. To get the same money to the Governor if he wants it for under his, his subjects, the premier have to come to the house to get it passed. But if the governor wants the same money for his subjects, all he do is he say, well, I want it now, sign a warrant, and go into it. Isn't the Constitution read it for yourself? Of course, there will always be those who have a different interpretation. But for the same reason, we realize that for the same expenditure purpose, the governor has to ask no one. This is not about a person. This is in the Constitution. That's why we have to read the Constitution. As former Premier Dr. Smith pointed out in his 2017 media statement, a budget was in place. Adequate budgeted finances were provided for. The government had to weigh its priorities and the needs of the people against the revenues and cash flow. But yet still, a governor could boldly dis disregard all of this and reach into the consolidated fund. One man, 
Bear in mind this occurred in March 2017, and in August and September, the territory was knocked flat down with three back-to-back -back disasters, including two Category 5 hurricanes. Then when the government goes to the UK, of whom the governor is their representative. When I went to the UK, I was hearing here that all the time that the governor is working for us. The Minister of Health went with me and the financial secretary in others. And I, he's always, the governor's coming, they always say that we're working for the people of the Virgin Islands. And the, minister, the representative of the second district said, said it well. But when we went to the UK and we sat on the table, he sat on the side of the UK. So I was wondering if we had a trade. I had another baseball and basketball trading. But he was on the side with the UK, we were over on the other side on our own. I guess it was a seating arrangement, but then it keep happening. So of whom the governor is there representing? To ask for grants to help all people because we, what was in the kitty would not be sufficient. But this happened while the BVI was admonished for its financial management in 2012 with the advent of the protocols for effective financial management which we continue to be put under pressure for up to this day. Now, we sent a petition to the UK. Of course, they say they, they honor it. Well, that's the wrong one. Because we consult with the protocols. But if you read the protocols and you read the high-level framework and all of those documents, you realize from the time the protocols signed, they said they were in breach. How could you be in breach of a document that wasn't signed? These are things we have to get straightened out. And because they have more battleship than us and battle planes and bigger, we must send nothing. A document gets signed, and from the time it's signed, you are in breach. I thought when a document gets signed and it's brand new, you walk your way up to getting into whatever the document says, and it, it, it allows room for, from the time you sign it, you are in breach. And I could never understand how come that document gets signed with what was in it. In the manner that was in it. All this, we have to put where we could secure our rights as Virgin Islanders. And this happened when we, we, we see that um, in prudence and responsible financial practices only for the BVI, not for the UK with our own money, but then how different was this from the former administrator, M.S. Stavely, had done in the 1960s? That's why I went through the history when I introduced this, you know, to show you that we ain't gone nowhere. In the 1960s, with administrator, administrator M.S. Stavely, what he had done, or thereabout, in the 1960s, when he imprudently issued crown leases to a British corporation for nearly two-thirds of Anigada and a large area of the foreshore of Rotong, including the Wickhamski, and then would not reverse the decision because the UK would have had to pay the financial cost of his actions. We say history does not repeat itself. People repeat history. How different is it where they put us at last but are hesitant to help you make up the shortfall? Because when the government goes in to your treasury and takes out, he leaves you with a shortfall. And then when you go to them for help for the shortfall, they give you a loan guarantee to help you to see how to further sink you, to hold you for the governor going with your money. Again, we say God bless Noel Lloyd and his positive action movement for correcting the situation in the 1970s. But for what was done under Governor Duncan in 2017, where he used his Section 103 powers, what was the recourse? And if it happens again, where is the recourse? Because I'm going to tell you, no matter what we say here, they don't change their course. They interpret the Constitution one way, and they keep coming. They keep coming with their interpretation. And even when you write to the UK, they tell you that they're acting within the confines of their responsibility. Although if you hire a beginning lawyer from out of college, fresh lawyer, he'd have a problem. 
And then when you challenge them too much, the first thing that I recognize over the 20 years is they try to find if they could get you to jail for something. To say, well, look, 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 this is the reason. Don't study him. I saw that. At the time that this incident occurred in 2017, the people of the BVI were trying to figure out what we would do because revenues from financial services were under threat due to the decisions taken, implemented, and being enforced by the UK without consulting us in the BVI. The people had needs which they were being asked to be patient about. But the agenda of the UK and its representative knows no patience, knows no compromise. And mind you, this is not everyone from the UK. This is just a certain section that has decided that it's going to be so, and we have no say in it because they're the boss. But we in a modern partnership. I often wonder whether those who make these decisions consider that it makes them look tone deaf, out of touch and indifferent to the people of the BVI whose interests they claim to hold. But it shows you the problem that occurs when you have persons making decisions, whether they are sitting in the territory or thousands of miles away, and they are, not, and they are out of touch with the people here on the ground in the BVI. When honorable members ask whether self-determination and partnership are just mere words, I say you can form your own conclusion. Mr. Speaker, today we are dealing with declines in our financial services revenue. Global tourism, including our tourism industry, shut down due to COVID-19. Our people are out of jobs and in need for food and money for rent to stay sheltered in a hurricane season. The UK says UK money is for UK taxpayers, no problem. I have no problem with that. We have established task forces and committees to help us to reconfigure our spending. And that is clear because today we have a SAP that we have to go through to cut back government spending based on the revenue, to, but, but also make sure we put investment into the capital section so that we can stay ahead of the game by when COVID-19, for when COVID-19 is over. And we are asking government workers to make sacrifices. We are making cutbacks to bring our spending more in line with what our revenues can afford. And this is not just your Premier and the four ministers. It is all technical persons across the board sitting down and crunching numbers and adjusting policies. Mr. Speaker, in the middle of this that we are going through now, and even during the hurricane, can you imagine in the face of all of that, a governor opts to exercise what Section 103 powers? So I've got to be aware of my words, Mr. Speaker. Our history does not repeat itself. People repeat history. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to go and close now in terms of the... I've highlighted some sections for the people of the territory with the Constitution. And, yes, I'm clear that there will be those that says... We do not need to walk towards being self-reliant. That's their democratic right. There will be those who are saying we can't trust no politician, but indirectly they're saying we can trust the governor. And there's no problem. That's your democratic right. But I don't share those kind of views, and I don't let anyone's opinion of me become my reality, because I have learned a long time ago that when the Lord looked down on the earth, he didn't find a man without sin. He didn't say, Governor, you are free, and the people, you are sinful. Not a man. And in that context, he meant woman. I say that, Mr. Speaker, because I want our people to understand that now is the time to press on forward, not in a rude way, not in a dis disrespectful way, but in a direct way saying this is what we are for. This is what we are fighting for, not what we are fighting against. We have to do that, Mr. Speaker. Push forward. Again, I give you the example of when, when Moses you want to understand how to walk towards freedom, Honorable Turnbull? You want to know how to walk towards freedom? 
Read Moses. You know, there are some people in this honorable house that I will follow any day. And when I say so, I mean the experiences. Because they have experiences in certain areas. When it comes to, to, to theology, I could hold my own. But when a man like Brother Mitch preaching, I'll go hear me now. I want to hear real people. I don't want to see nobody who will never fat tell me to lose weight. Because <laughs> you don't know the challenges of fighting the refriger refrigerator at the night time. You don't know about that. So don't come tell me, but this is how you do it. No, I want a man I will fat, but I want I will fatten and show me how to lose weight. Because then I could say, boy, this is how you was. I want a man like Mitch and myself who, who was sinful and we can't talk all and we, we found by say by grace and you have that preaching. I could relate to him. You understand what I tell you? I want a man like Brother Natalia who will tell me how it is in the trenches with certain things. I could relate to him. I don't mind hearing, but I'm alone here with business. I could relate to him. I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be, but still young. But when it comes to our youth, I can't go tell Sherry the Castro and Reverend the Castro how to be a youth. I got to listen. I could relate to her. So if you want to know about how to fight for freedom, you have to read Moses, the story of Moses. And it teaches you a few things which I want to give to the territory as I understand them according to chapter 5. It doesn't come cheap. There's a price. And it always takes a revolution to bring the solution. Because nobody lets you go just so. Remember when Moses went in and he said, let the children go. <laughs> he didn't get them to go just so. And there's 10 of the best plagues it had. And, and I understand from my research that those 10 plagues had reflect the 10 gods that Egypt had. So when they had run out of the gods they had, they didn't have nobody else to fight Moses. They said, all right, you could go. That's my research. But even when he let them go, and he realized after a while, wait, they're gone. Man, get, get, get the horses up together. Let's go for them. And oh, they were so dark that the, when they left us, the people were so glad that Moses helped the freedom that they say, boy, we're glad for that. But when they get out there, walking, going, they realize, man, this thing, this journey had, man, you'd bring us out here to die. Better you leave us there with um, better you leave us there with, with, with Pharaoh. He was giving us three square meals. Yes, he was walking us hard. Yes, he was beating us. But, but we are alright. We had a little shelter. Does this sound familiar today? And, and where we going with Moses? He's so illiterate. He's a stutter. He, he's not well schooled. And we who get some education under the Egyptians, why are we following this illiterate man? Why are you following this fellow freedom? No, we have to have somebody more with a stature to bring us free. It can't be him. But when they realized he would only take it in tongue to get it done, they had no choice. And they move out. But there's something that Colonel Fire, Pastor Fire, has said, I, I, just, I just can't forget that someone he gave. When the Lord realized that he had to help them, he put the glory cloud out there as a light. And he informed them that when the cloud moves, you move. No matter what you're doing, move. So no matter how well you had set up, when the cloud moves, you move. And that's why I teach people, and I pray every day, God help me, that you keep the glory cloud over the BVI and myself. So that when the cloud moves, we move with it. And help us to have the wisdom to follow the crowd and not the crowd. Because the crowd is going to lead you to the prosperity God has for you. I say that because Moses ended up freeing them to go across the river by using what is in his hand. 
And that was a theme of the budget when I came to this honorable house in November. Use what's in your hand to get you to the promised land. A lot of time we want to use all kind of other things. That's why I agree with the member for the ninth and the member for the fourth. And I've been saying this now for the last three weeks. My side could bear me out. I honestly feel that any gather and Joshua Dykes need their own representative. And I want to tell you why. When you study the history of this territory, it was people that came out of those islands that provoked the change. And we owe it to our ancestors. This is just my theory because we will deal with that otherwise. And the people will say, but I feel within my heart that any gather and Joshua Dykes need their own representative. History showed they fought for this territory. In it's time they come in here and fight in this house for their people. People are going to say it's up to 15 where we're going. No, 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 it ain't up to 15. 15 by number. But in terms of representation, we will be fulfilling and completing what our ancestors started. Just check the history. They were the catalysts. And Moses kept moving to the promised land. But even when they crossed the river, this story is so important because in this constitutional review, I ask you whether you're Christian or not. Just read the story. I like reading. I've read the Quran but twice. I like reading. I read. I don't want to read my religion. I keep reading because I want to understand what is in the mindset of other persons so that I can relate with them, not to them, but with them. And when I check and see, and Moses got them over, and he sent out the 12 men, to find out if they could take the city. Can I tell you that 10 came back and tell them no? And two said yes. And Moses let them 10 men get in the boardroom of his, the people's mind and he leading two start to say no, let's take it easy. And the 10 men said they are like giants and we are like grasshoppers. Not recognizing that God is with them. And then once God is with you, you are the giant, and they are the grasshoppers. How do you view yourself in this constitutional review? Do you view yourself as a grasshopper, and the UK as a giant? Or do you view yourself as a giant because God is with us? And don't even mind what the other side looks like. Just deal with it respectfully and go forward with God, because we're not going to disrespect the UK. We're not going to disrespect anybody, but we have to see ourselves better than we've seen ourselves. And had they moved in 40 years before that had been in the promised land, the question is, what is holding us back this constitutional review from moving? Is it because most people you speak with say that every politician is not any good? You go to any country, you hear that. Is it because they're saying we can't trust this one, you can't trust the other one? Well, put things in place so that we can make sure that more people are accountable. Are you going to keep not moving because you feel that there's always a reason not to move? Suppose the Honorable Kai Roima didn't move with the, with the redirection of the traffic with all the noise. Suppose we did not regularize people who were here for years. When they went, when they went by the... By the um, the, the, the auditorium. And there were, were me and the government up on the stage. And, the, and they started. And, and I said, no, it's the right thing to do to do this. Some still don't agree. But I sleep in comfortable. Suppose we didn't listen to people and, and, and come and get the consumer. Protect, we listen to persons saying, well, oh, it's not a time during COVID-19 to hold meetings and get a consumer protection pass. Suppose we had listened to others and didn't put in the health emergency organization center that helped us thus far and take out the word thus far that helping us to contain and, and deal with COVID-19 when we were told that there's an other organization already in place, not led by us, that need to lead, lead the way. And today we are proving that with God we have the strength to move forward to keep our country safe from COVID-19. How do you view yourself? Is a question you have to ask for the constitutional review. Don't view me. Every man has to work out his own soul salvation. How do you see yourself? As a person in the Virgin Islands, as a Virgin Islander, what are you fighting for? We are all finding things to fight against. 
The question is in this constitutional review, what are you fighting for? And if you can't find what you're fighting for, then you're living a purposeless life and there's no such life. So one of the questions asked by honorable members was the rationale behind the, the proposed terms of reference for the Constitutional Review Commission. And we are open to making adjustments based on recommendations from honorable members. However, I just wish to provide some further clarification for honorable members on the framing of the terms of reference. One of the things I want honorable members to bear in mind is that we have to generate a very comprehensive and structured document out of the constitutional review exercise which these terms of reference will give us. And I said we are open to incorporating what honorable members suggest can add value. And that is clear. I've told the honorable members, the whole house, just bring the ideas and we'll incorporate them. And I've done that as far, I've kept in my word because this is not about me. This is not about me. So to explain, let me explain A. The terms of reference A was says to reevaluate the vision of the people of the Virgin Islands as expressed in the preamble to the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007 and to amend accordingly if necessary. Well, a constitution has to reflect the vision of the people to whom it will apply. That's what a constitution is. That's why no one should be giving us the agenda. It is ours. I could understand if they say with certain things we wouldn't be able to accomplish all one time. But this constitution, as the Deputy Speaker Honorable Neville Smith said, has to be the stepping stone towards the next constitution that brings us closer to where we are destined to be from our days of our forefather. So otherwise you may be imposing your decision and your views upon the people, and this can be against their will. It's about the people. So where we are contemplating major steps that will impact the people, we need to seek the consent of the people. We need to be clear what they want and what they want us to do. The vision of the people is a focal point of representation and against which the Constitution needs to be crafted. So it is only fitting that we must go to the people and ask them what their vision is. That's why every home must get a Constitution, whether it's through WhatsApp, email, on your doorstep, get it, read it. We're going to continue the promotions through WhatsApp, through all the medias. Understand it. Because you cannot fight for something if you don't understand what you're fighting for or where your heritage be started from. So if we do not do this, we can end up with a constitution uh, for us as legislators that we may want and which commissioners may want, but it may not be what the people want. The Honorable Attorney General in his brief legal submission this afternoon emphasized the Constitutional Review must focus on a vision and the people must decide what that vision is. Where do they want to be and in, in what time? He also advised us from the legal point of view that we have tough options to choose from because there are responsibilities and consequences with any decision to change the status quo. As much there are consequences and responsibilities with holding on to the status quo. The truth of the matter is no matter what you choose, there are going to be consequences. While we may believe that the preamble to the Constitution, which is a reflection of Article 73 of the chapter, Charter of the United Nations, presents a good framework, the fact is that this may not be so. Honorable Fraser, District 3 has made a valid point that the definition of who is a Virgin Islander needs to be properly clarified. And therefore, if we follow his line of discourse, then the preamble and the vision need to be adjusted accordingly to reflect what the people wanted to say. By framing this first term of resident reference, we will achieve exactly what the member and other members are saying we must do. It is simple. If we don't know who we are, how could we fight to be what we want to be, want to become? We need the consent of the people that they are willing to shoulder the task and, and the adjustments that will come with constitutional changes. There'll be a cost. 
And this is why we are saying that there must be a public education exercise so that the people will understand everything that, we, that they need to be aware of and they will make an informed decision. Hopefully the people will agree with what we are saying and what honorable members are saying, that we must move forward with confidence. So this is the purpose of this first terms of reference. And I must help members with something. You know why all of us here? The, 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 the impetus of our Virgin Islander is to sacrifice all it, they have to make sure that their children go to school. Even if they didn't went to school, they'll sell a piece of land to make sure their child goes to school. That's why I'm here when people there talk, and I don't mind I taking that 7%. From, from the Western Union and build out old people home for some of them, what children turn their back on them. I could say what you want there with that. Because it hurts our old person when they know that they spent all they had to send a child to school and they get back and they speak in the Queen's English and they forget about the people who send them. Picture that as your ancestors who see us here and they fought to give us the BVI way it is now but we don't move forward to, to, to get it better. They just turn in the grave and realize that we have no respect for the blood that they shed in the dungeons as the member of the fort said they were in and, 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 and the, the murders of them fighting coming forward so that we could be free and move to the next level. That shows us we don't respect them if we don't move. And that's what sacrifice is. All people sacrifice so we could be here. I thought my parents were the richest people in the world because when I was younger and going to school, they used to send me, whenever I call, they send me some little thing. I said, what? I mean, daddy rich. So when I come home, I realize I got bills like everybody else. But they wanted you to go to school so that you could have a degree and get some other degrees. But for God's sake, don't forget the common sense. That's the problem with some of the BVI, with some of our people that come back. They've gone up on the ladder. They don't want to see their mother and father. They kick down the ladder. They don't want nobody else to come up. Nobody must, must uh, move with them. Their nose up in the air. And they wonder when they fall, why they fell. And the same will happen with us if we think we can go ahead with what's happening and just hang out with the Joneses and forget how about Jim Bob and them be on the backside? When we fall, we want to know what happened when we were taken over. Never forget the fight and what you're fighting for. I know it have parents still paying loans for their children because they send them to school. And the child come back making major money, leave, still the lead loan to their parents and never take it up yet. What a set of wicked wretch. But in terms of the terms of reference, B, to evaluate the current, there's another terms of reference that says to evaluate the current Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007. And I go back to let also know that to get to the next level, it's going to take some sacrifice. So don't think that we're going to get this done and Boston just going to give it to us. It don't work so. Man, they're going to try to put some of us in a crazy house like what they do with my line. They're going to try to put some of us in the jailhouse and some of us going to be leader with them guilty, you know. They're going to try to put some of us all kind of different places. And if we don't band together, they will get through with it and justify it and have us singing the same song. It ain't changed. I brought the history of this place from the 1400s all the way up so that we could understand that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Just in a different form. It's up to us not to make the change but to transform. So the next level, you're going to have a cost. You're going to have one. But I'm willing to pay. And what we can afford, we're going to put on credit cards. But for all we're going. And B, to evaluate the current Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007 and determine whether it is strategic fit to facilitate the people of the Virgin Islands in achieving the revised vision A above. Well, let me tell you something. I met a fellow since we're doing the Constitution. 
He said, why are we out here hungry and you in there talking about constitution review? I said, we were walking on different things. He said, we're hungry, we want food now. I said, ah, a young virgin of a modern day is like, you're walking to get certain things to them, but you also realize that if you could get them to the promised land that we will be better. So you're doing two things at the same time. But immediate gratification usually throws a lot of people off of their purpose-driven path because they get it, what they need now and don't look that if you long term you could be getting it for yourself and giving it to others. And that's where we're trying to go. So with this terms of reference, where, why we say we must evaluate the current 2007 Constitution order is because this will allow us to determine what we would need to keep and what we need to discard or change. Every house in this territory should be speaking the Constitution. After the Bible, speak the Constitution. Every husband and wife, first thing you need to do is pray the Bible, get to know each other better, and then do the Constitution. And where the Constitution is a vehicle, for the people to achieve their vision, the vehicle must be suited, designed, and equipped for its purpose. If you do not align your constitution with the vision, you will not achieve the people's vision. So all of this goes hand in hand with many of the suggestions from honorable members, but it allows us to document in detail what are some of the problematic areas and also why those issues are a problem. And then we come to the terms of reference that says to identify any gaps in relation to task B above. Well, when we identify where the gaps are in the system, what we need to address, what the concerns are, we can bring these concerns into focus and we can fix these problems that will prevent the people's vision from being, for, from, we can prevent the people's vision from being aborted. Because they have to come true. Their vision has to be a reality. And this is where our youth comes in. The Deputy Speaker, Honorable Neville Smith, I always am amazed that when we're sitting down and we're thinking high level things and he's thinking with us and he comes in with some very basic solutions. He, he has common sense beyond his years. And I always just tell him, well, well that's true, that, that will work it. I remember when we thinking about the unemployment to put on a percentage for unemployment and it's seven and a half percent now for Social Security. And he said, well, just take off a percent, eight and a half, take off a percent, make it seven and a half and put that percent towards the, the, the new unemployment scheme where you won't be paying no more money, it'll be the same, just a percentage will be going somewhere else. That's the kind of fellow he, Honorable Neville Smith is. He don't give no long speech, but effective. And he said now in his, his deliberation, which I, I, I caught, it caught my ear, we can't go without the youth in this review. The youth. Now I remember Sherry De Castro got up and she talked about the aspiration of the young people. So when this committee is formed, they must form a subcommittee to have the young people go out and get the other young people's views independent of politics, independent of political party, independent of personal agenda, and just think country force and where you want to go, and then bring it back to the main committee, which has some youth on it already. So Honorable Smith, I thank you for that. That will form part of this overall area. This is where we will go into the nuts and bolts of what, we, what a new constitution needs to look like. Because let's face it, people 25 and 30 years, they're going to have a couple cracks at more constitutional review than us. So, so you have to involve them now so that when the time comes, like how the 2007 constitution was done, there are three persons, four persons in this house that are still here since the 2007 constitution was done. Honorable Fraser, Honorable Vanderpool, now Honorable Malone, he was one of the commissioners on it and myself. But there's going to come a time when all of them will be gone and I'll still be here. <laughs> now it's going to come a time when all of us, that's just a little joke, Fraser. 
There'll come a time when, when, when all of us will be gone. All of us. But at least when we start, the young people from now when our time come to leave this field. Person I can't ever share with the Castro and but I'm tell you about a guy who still have some youth on them. They can say I was here. That's what it call succession planning. So we're not gonna leave all the youth. They're gonna have a loud voice in this constitutional, this constitutional review. So I thank Honorable Smith. And it'll go into such areas such as the parliamentary model, such as the need for a bicameral system and so forth. I have no holes back. Whatever is good for the territory, let's move forward. So I just let members to note I've been listening to the debate, I've been listening to what you're saying and making notes. So D, the next terms are references to make recommendations for constitutional reform if necessary based on A, B, and C above. So these are the recommendations that will inform the drafting of a new constitution or whatever changes must be undertaken. Do you know the difference of going to the UK and saying, this UK is not from Andrew Foy, it's not from Jude and Fraser, it's, it's not from Alan Penn, it's, it's not from Neville Smith. This is from the bowels of the people of the Virgin Islands and we come on their behalf. That is power. So E is to advise on the path forward for self-determination. So a new constitution can advance our journey towards self-determination. It doesn't mean that the next constitution means we're going to get there and then. It's a stepping block for the other one that's coming. And hopefully not too far after that. But self-determination is not achieved by merely passing constitutional amendments or enacting a new constitution. There are mechanisms, protocols, and procedures that will have to be followed from the point of the constitutional changes. So what we will be asking the Constitutional Review Commission to do is to tell us what are the steps we have to follow in order to move closer to or to achieve self-determination. If we do not do this, then persons may sit back after the Constitution change takes place and feel they have arrived at their destination. So this is to ensure that it is clear on what are the next steps after constitutional change. And Mr. Speaker, as I stated before, the youths are important on this. And one or two members did touch on it, as I said before. And I already placed on record that this present administration has put a lot in place to enable and encourage our young people and to help them to see future in their homeland. Mr. Speaker, I don't want to go political, but suffice to say, our efforts start right here in the House of Assembly in our membership. We have Honorable Sherry De Castro, a vibrant, educated young person, whom we expressed our confidence and put our support behind to ensure that there is representation in the legislature. Mr. Speaker, she's young, coming up, and even sometimes when she makes mistakes, at times when I get a little jumpy with her, we get at it. I just say, oh, Lord, I must see. I forget her, her age. Let me leave. Let me just go ahead and, and leave. And every time she comes around. You see, you have a problem with people when it comes to young people, you know. It have some people think that they're going to be in those positions forever. And anybody that has the potential that look like they want to rise up, they try to tear them down, give them bad record, try to get them out of the way. I have seen in my 20 years of politics a lot of people in this territory that were supposed to be to the top who are not on the top because they were removed and destroyed out of bad-minded persons who held those offices. That's why when I come as premier, I do not play around when it comes to the people's work. Even those in work, my office who get along with me know that when I come to do something, let's get it done. Don't come telling me that we can't. Find a way that can because what is happening now isn't working. And when you have to put up in those who want to use those who are not walking to get in your way, you know you need a constitutional review. Because us not getting into any advanced mode helps their program. The less that we, the more, the more we become financially sound, the less they are able to enslave us. So watch carefully that every initiative that we bring that dealing with funds to help us to become financially sound, always going to get a challenge. And they're going to give good reasons too, you know. 
But the only reason is because when a man has God and the finances and everything comes together as one, he becomes an unstoppable being. But hit him where the economics lies, and usually he will fall. Slavery was never about people, it was always about economics. And the history of this territory shows that it was always about the economics for those who were making decisions for us, not our well-being. Well, we learn now how to make money to the legal way. So now we're going to get it done too. So in our immigration package last year, we included second and third generation Virgin Islanders so that we can encourage our people to come back home and help us build the BVI knowing they have a place and stake and a stake here. We also, as I said, took care of those who were here for years, whose children born here, 20, 30, 35 years, the children, children born here, and the children, children born here. A lot of people talking about that, but they didn't do it. We had to do it. And some people I could hear them down the television groaning. My God, you better change or you don't got a special place for you in hell. We recently waived the stamp duty for Virgin Islanders purchasing land for the first time. This has lowered the overall cost and the upfront cost for, of, of home ownership. We have reopened the scholarship program so our people can get the education and development they need to open up the avenues for them to lead meaningful lives and to make a meaningful contribution to the BVI. We have included training programs to prepare them for having careers, and this includes in areas such as modern technology like solar power, and there's a lot more to come. So yes, we recognize this, and we have begun putting measures in place for our young people, and we continue to do so. But this is why we need to review our constitution, so that we are clear, the, we are clear about the path of, we clear the path of, the, of any obstacles that will frustrate and hamper our young people and the future generations. Too long, our people are frustrated in this territory, and even as the premier just over a year now, there are those who want you to walk miracles to remove most of the obstacles that were in the way for years. I'm glad COVID-19 came for a couple of reasons. Banks start to understand that they can do what they told us they can do. Lands that were high priced understand now we have to bring it down because people don't have money. It tells me that people put the economic structures in place to make sure that only a certain class was making it in this territory. I'm, I'm not glad for COVID-19. I'm glad for the era because it has brought on some things that I know that the Lord needed to bring on, so he allowed it to happen. Consumer protection couldn't get his hair. And as I understand now it's assented to, and we're going to put the commission in place to deal with all price gouging and everything. We're going to be working on that feverishly because there, there are a few places here now ripping off the people out of the Virgin Islands. We're going to deal with you right away. I need a constitutional review for that. I'll be in a place near you soon. So I commend members' contributions on this constitutional review. I'm proud of every one of you in here. Mr. Speaker, I want to commend all the members for the high quality of their respective contributions to this debate on constitutional review. It was my wish to see in-depth research and analysis from all of our respective honorable members, and they delivered this. I'm happy to see that most members have already indicated areas that they would like to receive attention in the constitutional review exercise. This is good. And they have made suggestions on how we can strengthen our governance to provide the checks and balances to deliver effective governance and service while ensuring a high level of accountability over the administrative powers and public funds. This is good. This is good. Because we also have to do some introspection and make sure that we make adjustments. I would like to recommend that a complete hands-out of this debate should be forwarded to the Constitutional Review Commission when it is constituted so that whatever gems are contained in the debate will not be lost, so that they can read it and see what was the impetus of each member of this august body that debated so eloquently with limitless ideas. Infinite wisdom from God was placed in here during this debate, and the commissioners of the Constitutional Review would need that, so that they can also make sure that it also be etched in their minds that will guide them as they do this task. 
I'm sure honorable members would put their ideas on paper and would make oral submissions to the commission when the time comes. And I look forward to that. But sometimes we have so much to say and we can overlook points. But you don't have to wait till the commission starts. Start it, putting on your points now. The People's Constitution Review, that's what this one is. This one is the People's Constitution Review. It's not what we are fighting against, it's what we're fighting for. And I want to add that every school should be speaking constitution now and break it down for the smallest of child. Break it down. Teach them about partnership. Yeah. Constitution on the desk. Break it down to the, in the smallest of language. Teach them that if two of you own a business, one cannot be dictating for the other. That's not a partnership. Teach them what a partnership should be so that they can know what is the foundation of a partnership so that they can know not what to just um, expect when they're going along, but they can inspect whatever is told to them to see if that's a true partnership. And I want to add that I heard members saying that the Premier has to be brave to take on these big ticket items like constitutional review. Mr. Speaker, my function here is to get the ball rolling. The constitutional review will not be FOI's constitutional review. After today, when we don't do the terms of reference together, it is out there and the people could craft it how they see it fit in the best interests of the Virgin Islands. It's theirs. I'm not going to bother the commissioners. I'm not going to be going around it. It's theirs. I'll keep an eye in, out, and I'm also going to, to submit my submissions, but it's the people's, and it's all of ours, con our constitution review. All of us members of this Honorable House and all of our Virgin Islanders, the product of this exercise will not be for its constitution. It will be the constitution of the people of the Virgin Islands. And don't let anyone fool you saying that for I only doing it because there's some problem with the governor. And some, I heard some people already saying that Lucifer is already on the loose. And I bind him in Jesus' name and let him go back to hell. There ain't nothing against anybody. It's what we are for. And it's time that we get what is ours. And the problem that we are having in the Virgin Islands is that a lot of people now have become individualistic. They're only concerned about their own household. And I always tell people when I was teaching, I, 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 I remember that I remember for the second hour I said this too. You could, you could ignore the boys on the street if you have girls home and say that I can raise my two daughters to the best of my ability to the glory of God. And, and those neighbor boys that have there, no good, let them go to hell, no problem. And then before you know it, they become a son-in-law. And you could raise your boy child to the best of your ability and ignore the neighbor and ignore all around you. And before you know it, all the girls that you're ignoring out there saying, look at them. Before you know it, you become a daughter-in-law. We're not living for ourselves. We're living for others. I grew up in my community with a basketball, softball. You go through the community. You do what you have to do. You bring the community together. You fight for what's best for the community. And even although I go on tongue and I want the village as heavy yet, as I want to be, but, but, but I arranged it to be because there's certain things I'm putting in place up here so those who don't like creating the mischief, I'm coming back down there for you soon. But there are things you have to put in place up here that all of us will benefit. So, we have to make sure that we have this narrowed down because it belongs to all of us. Because the approach that we are taking is one that will be informed by the input of the people and will be driven by the vision of, of the BBI people for themselves and for their generation. So, Mr. Speaker, I, say, I want to say I, that I strongly support the sentiments expressed by honorable members that our people are capable of policing ourselves. We have the talent, we have the morals, we have the patriotic spirit deep within ourselves. Therefore, I see no reason for fear or skepticism and whether we can shoulder more responsibility in charting our future. We are in agreement that no one will treasure our interests and priorities as much as we, the BVI people, will. If we are to really move forward, it is clear we, the people of the BVI, 
have to do it ourselves. And I would like to, everyone to know that the eyes of the future are looking back at us, praying that we get it right. And our ancestors, whose ash we walk on every day in this territory, are looking ahead, praying that we do not get it wrong. Let's not disappoint, disappoint any of them. And Mr. Speaker, this constitution is for young people because they're the future, but it's also for ancestors who I pay homage, homage and respect to each of them for all they have done to get us to this point. There's stories about down by the cow and the calf of how the water is always a certain way because a lot of slaves were, were, were killed and thrown off there. They jumped off on their own. I heard them say, I must give that story many times and others. A lot went in to get us where we are. And we need to be respectful for it. We did not get here by accidents. We get here by our four parents praying in those churches, all night prayer meeting, all night prayer meeting, walking from Bruce to where standing all about all night prayer meeting. Now, if you have all night prayer meeting, some people have a joke. The church going on and the praise and worship and the, the glory of it going on, the church packed. Call a prayer meeting a Bible study where the knowledge and the real juice of it is. You got to deacons to get anybody there. All churches. Because we got to don't be getting involved in just the glamour of things. We got to get involved in the substance of things. Because the substance is what allows you to be sustainable. And Mr. Speaker, I know that members may think that this is clear, but I hear it loud and clear. And I ask members in my closing to please rise in a moment of silence as we go through this constitutional review in honor of the legacy of our poor parents, our ancestors. And I ask everyone to stand for a 30 second moment of silence in honor of our ancestors, because this one is for them when we go forward fighting for what we're fighting for, not what we're fighting against. So I ask for a 30 seconds, Mr. Speaker, moment of silence to remember every slave that died, every person that was murdered on the route to us being where we are in the BVI, and we thank them. Amen. And Mr. Speaker, I, I close with one of my famous chorus, without singing it but saying it. And there's a praise and worship song I just like. What shall I render to Jehovah? Because he has done so very much for me. What shall we render to Jehovah during this constitution that has done so much for us? I think it says na nara nara e narekele nara narekele mo nara nara e narekele narekele mo he has done so much for us and i can hear the african chat as we go of our ancestors saying don't miss this one and don't mess this one up thank you mr speaker I thank the Honourable Premier. Uh, I thank the Honourable Premier for his wrap-up of the debate. And um, I also want to join with him in saying that I hope to work with perhaps the clerk and the Minister for Education to get the transcript to libraries and or college and all schools so that the debate today can be an historic document. Honorable members, the question before the House is the constitutional review 
and set up a, a commission. It has been moved and seconded. Those in favor? Those against? The motion is passed. Moving on the, with the item of the day, I call upon the Premier and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to put the House in, in a committee of the House to discuss the appropriation 2020 Act 2019, number 10 of 2019, Mr. Speaker. And before I do that, Mr. Speaker, uh, when we are in the, the committee stage, we will discuss uh, our way forward, given that we had a, have a, another session on Thursday and weather, impending weather, weather, Mr. Speaker, so we have to make some decisions at the House. So please let us do that when we go into the committee stage. Thank you. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. Honorable members, the motion has been moved and seconded that this House resolve itself into a committee of the whole to consider the schedule of additional provision number 10 of 2019, clause by clause. This House is now in committee. Sorry, those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The House is now in committee.